Yes, Dr. Tonabe, you want me to take it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so let us uh, take his presentation later. So, uh, Dr. Jailekha, uh, Ilangon, you will introduce? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, Ms. Uh, A.K. Jayaleka was born in Kerala and completed her early education in Secunderabad. She completed her B.S.C.A.G. and M.S.C.A.G. at the College of Agriculture during 1985 and 1987 at the College of Agriculture. Now it is Anguru. At a time when plant breeding in the private sector was dominated by men, a few women breeders entered the field of crop improvement and made a mark. She is one among them. Ms. Jayaleka has excelled in Paul Millet. And she started as RA at Ikrisat and then moved to Pro Agro Seeds, which later became Bayer Crop Science. After working nearly three decades, she took early retirement in 2019 to devote her time with the Isha Foundation for uplifting of poor girl children. She developed 12 hybrids in Pearl Millet for semi arid regions globally, including India. She received Best Private Sector Award in 2000, Achievement Excellency Award by Bayer in 2006. Madam, the floor is yours. Please deliver your lecture. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Jayaleka, so 20 minutes you have. Namaskaram. Good morning, everyone. First of all, thank you, Dr. Tonapi, for giving me this opportunity. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Clear enough? Yeah, clear. Yeah. Thank you all for accommodating me and uh, organizers of this seminar and Dr. Tonapi particularly. Uh, Today, I'm not here as a breeder. Thank you for the introduction also. Uh, I am here as a small volunteer of Save Soil Movement. Uh, and uh, let me submit in advance that I'm not an expert on uh, soil science. Uh, here, as a volunteer of Save Soil, I am here to present before you what this movement is about. And uh, as individuals or organizations, what we can do as, uh, you know, if you want to participate in this movement, this is what I'm trying to brief in that short time that I have. Can I share the screen? Yeah. Yes, madam. Yeah, before I move ahead with uh, what I speak, uh, let's... Your start. slides are now, we, we can't see. But it comes now. Yeah, uh, no, no, once again, uh, I'll, I'll play the video. Okay. I'm going to play a short video which tells about this moment. Okay. We are talking about climate change, carbon emissions, and global warming and various other aspects. But we are not addressing soil. Soil is the habitat upon which zillions of lives thrive. Once there is no richness in soil, then you have forsaken the planet in many ways. Every responsible scientist in the world and the UN agencies are clearly saying we have only 80 to 100 harvests left. That means approximately 45 to 50 years of agricultural soil left on the planet. By 2045, we will be producing 40% less food than what we are producing right now and our populations will be 9.3 billion people. The food shortages that could manifest in the next 25 years, the consequences of that is unimaginable. Civil wars will unfold across the world once there is food shortage. But what we are facing now is soil extinction. Why is soil becoming extinct? Where is it going away? What is happening to our soil? We must understand if you add organic content to sand, sand will turn into soil. If you remove all organic content from the soil, soil will become sand. In normal agricultural soil, the minimum organic content should be between three to six percent. The most minimum is three percent. At least this minimum to keep the soil alive, to keep the soil as living soil is a must. 
agricultural soils across the world, the depletion is so heavy. In most countries, more than fifty percent of the topsoil is already gone in the last hundred years. The nutrient levels have dropped significantly. The level of micronutrients you would get from your food in early twentieth century to what you are getting from the same food now has dropped ninety percent. If you ate one orange in nineteen twenties, what you got from it, now in twenty twenty, if you have to get the same, you will have to eat eight oranges. This is what we have done to our food. Soil is the biggest ecosystem on the planet, and so few people know anything about it. One teaspoon of healthy soil probably contains more microbes than there are people on Earth. The microbial life in the first twelve to fifteen inches of topsoil is the basis of our existence. It is this magic beneath our feet which has produced the life that we are. This first twelve to fifteen inches of soil is the basis of life for eighty-seven percent of life on this planet, including you and me. We have to begin to recognize that what we call our soil, Mother Earth, is a living organism. Open soils ripped open by plowing, open to sunlight, is the basis of destruction of microbial life. So the focus should be on agriculture, the focus should be on seeing that land is under shade as much as possible. Some kind of shade, grasses, herbs, bushes, trees. Conscious Planet is launching Save Soil Movement to bring about a policy change to regenerate soil as a part of this <laughs> I'm sixty-five and I'm riding thirty thousand kilometers, a lone motorcycle journey, thirty thousand kilometers across twenty-four nations to activate support from the citizenry to assure the governments long-term investments will be appreciated. So it's extremely important that soil regeneration is enshrined in the policy of every government on the planet. We must change the narrative on the planet that soil is a wealth, a legacy we have received from previous generations and we have to pass it on as living soil for future generations. We are in a cusp of time, if you do the right things now, in the next fifteen to twenty-five years, we can significantly turn this situation around and regenerate the soil. But if we allow this to progress like this for another thirty to forty years, after forty years, if we attempt this, then it could take hundred and fifty to two hundred years because that much loss of biodiversity would have happened. From twenty-first of March for one hundred days, the whole world, every human being on the planet should talk soil. We must hear the word soil, save soil everywhere to see that the narrative on the planet changes towards the most vital aspect of our life, the soil. Each one of you should reach as many people as you can to make this happen. Many global leaders and influencers are already participating in the movement. Be a part of this and let us make it happen. From my part, uh, as much as I can contribute. We're going to save the soil. Do your part. And saving the soils. Our future, our children's future, and our planet's future depend on it. Save the soil. We know what we must do, so let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Let's make, let's it, make it happen. happen. Let's, let's make it happen. happen. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. I think we got the message, but we'll uh, make use of a small presentation to see a little bit more in detail what these soil facts are. And also, uh, I would be taking you through how, as organization or individuals, we can be a part of this uh, Safe Soil Movement. Yesterday's uh, eminent speakers were also touching upon this uh, natural resource management, soil health, and so many, so many different speakers were uh, talking about this. I think all of us agree, soil is the wealth of any nation, isn't it?
keeping it healthy is of utmost importance and i think that's the reason this moment is really relevant i'll make use of one presentation to take you through some soil facts um, uh, they may sound little basic many of you may be knowing much more about uh, the soil more than this but uh, this is uh, part of the presentation we take you through let me know if it's visible it's yeah, good Yeah. All of us agree with this statement, I am sure. Taking care of the environment is not an obligation. Our environment is our life. That's why this moment is of importance and uh, connected with all of us. Our soil is ex going extinct. This is something I was uh, surprised to hear. Soil getting extinct. I never thought being in agriculture and connected with so many, uh, sir, with sir. oil for so many years. Sir, there's some there's some disturbance. Should I continue? Ah, okay, sir. Okay, sir. I'll download it. Doctor Tonabi, should I continue? Yeah, yeah please. Fifty-two yeah. percent of the world's agriculture soil is already degraded. These are all uh, based on the scientific studies from UN institutions. The reference is also given below the statement. Uh, this is from UN FAO organization. By 2050, it is said that 90% of the earth's soil could be degraded unless we act now. This is the most latest report, the 2020 report from UNCCD. And we all know that once the soil gets degraded, the soil uh, water retention capacity is going down. And this is leading to flood-like situations. The picture is uh, showing it very clearly. Then another UN prediction says we have only 60 years of soil left. It's really alarming, the data. And another report is saying that 50% uh, of the U.S. topsoil is already lost. What is this meaning? Full food production will fall by 40% by 2045 if soil extinction is not prevented. But we are at a situation where uh, it is the right time for it to take action and this we could prevent all this if we do the right thing. Soil depletion, as I think yesterday, many of the speakers have uh, emphasized this so much about the loss of uh, nutrients in the food that we are uh, consuming. Then, uh, once again, uh, organic content in the soil, which has to, which to, for it to sustain agriculture, it should be 3%. But if you look at the statistics of how it is uh, across the globe, it says 75 to 85 percent of the soil in major European Union is less than 2 percent. And the situation in our soils, Indian soils, is even much graver, graver situation. 62 percent of the Indian soils are having less than 0.5 percent. In fact, some of the soil scientists of uh, uh, Angra, whom I was talking to, I went for a presentation there, he is saying it is less than 0.5 percent also in some of the areas. How to save soil? Answer is bringing land and the vegetation and shade. And what these are all basic facts known to all of us. Once the soil improves, the crop production is going to go by 20 to 40 percent. This is what IUCN report is saying. Of course, when the food production increases, the income levels of those who dependent on agriculture will also improve. The most positive impact of increasing soil carbon is halting of the rise of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This is from the CGIR report. And another important one is eliminating water scarcity. Once the soil organic content improves, we know that water retention is going to increase and they have estimated a measure for this. The water reserves could go by, increase by 37 trillion liters. That means it can eliminate water scarcity of 600 million people. Amazing facts. These are the UN agencies that are supporting Safe Soil Movement right now. UNEP, World Food Program, UNCCD, IUCN. The Conscious Planet Safe Soil Movement, the main objective is to mobilize the public and governments of all nations to establish lasting policies that revitalize soil and ecology. 
and it's launched by Sadhguru. He started a 30,000 kilometers arduous journey covering European Union, Middle East, and then entering India. All the way is meeting heads of nations, media, influencers, and public, and inspiring them towards saving soil. The, what we want at the end of this awareness drive of this phase of the Save Soil Moment is changing the narrative towards saving soil by inspiring at least three and a half billion people, that is half of the human population right now, through rallies, events, and extensive social outreach to support government leadership to drive national policy changes towards raising the organic content of soil. Once people come in such large numbers and ask for something, the governments will definitely bring in long-lasting policies. This is uh, in brief about the journey. This is, uh, once again, the world's biggest ecological moment to save soil. Sadhguru's journey is depicted here. It uh, is, in fact, covering 27 countries. And uh, today is the 56th day of his journey. As a part of uh, his journey, he would be coming to Hyderabad also on June 15th, going to Vijayawada on 16th. Uh, any of you who are, this is an open event, uh, already the registrations are open on the website of savesoil.org. Everybody is welcome. I take this opportunity to invite all of you in this seminar to please uh, come for this event and see what you could do for this moment. Working, eh? Nobody is there. There's some crosstalk, please. Yeah, I'll just take you through uh, some of the projects of HF Foundation. 1998, a project Green Hands was started. 2006, it entered the Guinness World Records for having the largest number of plant, plant, saplings planted on a single day. 8,52,587 trees, uh, saplings were planted on a single day, and that's how it entered the Guinness World Record. It received 2000, uh, UN ECOC, SOC accreditation in 2007. The institution uh, received the India's highest environmental award also. Sadhguru received this on uh, behalf of foundation. 2017, Rally for Rivers was launched with the support of 162 million people. Many of you in the audience may be aware of this uh, moment, Rally for Rivers. This was to bring about the policy for reviving the India rivers and the soil. From then, from there, it has gone to Kaveri Calling Project, a specific project to revive uh, River Kaveri. It's the world's largest farmer-driven eco-restoration project, committed to revive soil and water through tree-based agriculture, covering a massive 83,000 square kilometer. 2.42 billion trees or 242 crore trees are to be planted in 12 years' time, and 5.2 million farmers will be enabled through this project. The update is that already 1,25,000 farmers have taken up this tree-based uh, agriculture, agroforestry, and uh, this will uh, enrich the soils and the uh, water retention capacity. What this uh, agroforestry has proven is to increase the farmer's income, if it is taken up in the recommended way, the farmer's incomes could go from 300 to 800% in five to seven years. Already 62 million trees are planted. This project also has received UNAP accreditation and IUCN membership in 2020. These are some of the interactions Sadhguru is having with the all uh, people of all walks of life. We'll come to what we could do as organizations. Yeah, I'll just talk, take a little time on this slide. Save Soil uh, Moment, it was launched in December, 2020, December 2021 with all these media events. Then the journey kicked off on March 21st in London. He has completed the European part of the journey and now is in Middle East, completed 55 days. Today is the 56th day. It will be culminated uh, at Kaveri. India leg will start from um, May 29th actually. There's a big program happening in Delhi on World Environment Day. Culmination of this journey will happen uh, at Kaveri on June 21st, that is International Yoga Day. This is just a beginning. Let me tell you, this phase of the moment is all about the awareness drive. Each of us could play a part in being, the, being a part of this awareness drive. This is just a beginning of the Safe Soil Moment. These are the countries he is covering during his 
loan uh, bike journey. Yeah, I'll take a little time on this uh, because I see a lot of organizations represented in the participants that are there or the speakers who came for this seminar. Um, how we could participate in this moment is uh, in your organization, sending a campaign through email or SMS or WhatsApp to the complete employee or customer database. You could have this as a signature banner for this campaign period. Make use of the collaterals and display in your uh, organization's spaces uh, physically. You could also facilitate awareness campaign to other organizations whom you know you could refer. Or all this content is all available on this uh, site called savesoil.org. Anybody who wishes to talk about this moment or needs any support, whatever sort of support, you know, it, it has even tutorials about how you can amplify it on social media also. So social media, this uh, the way, you know, uh, the reach, because of the reach that the social media can take us, there's a lot of focus on the social media outreach also with this Safe Soil content. Uh, anybody can participate in this. And one more thing I can mention is you can use your organization's logo in any of these campaigns if you don't want to uh, amplify it uh, further. Yeah, three ways. If you are ready to give 10 minutes a day, anybody, any individual, any organization can be a part of this, be a volunteer. And the volunteer for Save Soil Moment is called as an Earth Buddy. There's a simple registration and uh, we are all Earth Buddies. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, first focus is on amplification of Save Soil content over social media. Reaching out to 10 more people if you can and talk about this. Depending on your time and interest, you could get involved in more uh, uh, activities also. The final objective is through all these volunteers, reach the three and a half billion people and spread the word about safe soil. Yeah, once again, this, yes, another additional way that your corporate, corporates can uh, participate is you can contribute uh, through your corporate CSR grants. You can bring key uh, contributors for high impact uh, deliberations also. There are sponsorship opp opportunities available during any events or safe soil rally or even on online visibility. These are some of the uh, well-known people who are already on board for this safe soil moment. Yeah, some of them and their words are here. Abraham Thaw of UNCCD, Jane Goddell and uh, World Economic Forum are all Fully supporting the Can you mute others, please? Safe Soil Moment is addressing 12 out of the sustainable development goals. Since there is shortage of time, I'm not going in detail. I would be uh, more pleased if anybody wants to know more about this moment, you can uh, reach out to me. I will be sharing my contact number and email ID in the chat box. And also there is a small form which you can fill if you are interested to volunteer or you want to be part of the events that are coming up in Hyderabad or Vijayawada. There is a small form which takes less than a minute. You could fill that. If uh, Dr. Tonapi allows, can I share that form after the presentation, Dr. Uh, Tonapi? I can't hear you. You are muted. No, you can send it to us so that we will send it by email to everyone who have all okay. registered. Yeah. Thank you. So you will raise thousand people, more than thousand people. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jayaleka. So wonderful one, to. One more minute. Yeah. Just one more minute. Just a few milestones I wanted to take you through. Six Caribbean nations have already signed MOU. Fifty-four Commonwealth nations pledge their support to this moment. Uh, the latest is you know Sadhguru was a speaker in this COP15, which ha which is right now happening on May 28th. May sorry May 10th he addressed uh, COP15 and made an appeal to make soil as a focus for that convention. Uh, this less than a minute uh, video, if you allow Dr. Tonapi of that COP15, can I 50 seconds video? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, these are all the media coverage regarding this moment. I'll just quickly pass through. Yes, I think all of us resonate with this uh, quote. No matter how much wealth, education and money we have, our children cannot live well unless we restore the soil and water. Conscious planet, the only way forward. Sister, I'll take you to that 50 second video. 
give me a second is it visible yeah right implementation has to happen on the land and land is not managed by scientists land is managed by farmers so it's extremely important it must be a single point agenda incentive based agenda if inspiration incentives and disincentives after a certain period of time is the way forward this is my appeal to every one of you because i don't want this cop 15 to end as one more convention with more paper and more paper this must end with concrete action and action in such a way that is it's implementable yeah thank you jayalalka jayalalka so i think it was really wonderful joining sadguru in save soil moment and i request everyone to be part of this moment and we will reach many more so thank you so much and thank it's you. a time that we say that every element five basic elements soil earth then the air climate what's all we are talking about panchabhutas i think that is where we need to be purifying everything to rejuvenate so that we all live happily and healthy so thank you very much so Once again, yeah thank you all for thank you. patient listening and thank you dr donapi thank you so now we will go to dr ramarao uh, uh, so you can share your presentation sir yes sir yes sir so you have 25 minutes sir try to wrap up hmm? yes sir i will finish i should finish before that okay thank you yeah is it visible sir yeah, it's visible you can go to slide show full slide view is it okay sir okay go ahead go ahead thank you very much sir maybe perhaps uh, when i heard about the previous speaker i thought maybe poultry should also contribute for the enrichment of organic matter of soil uh, for the information of the house uh, uh, the poultry uh, is producing Uh, in the in the form of poultry litter that is feces is about 8 million metric tons of um, organic manure the from the as in the form of poultry litter that is produced but only the limitation with this is uh, you, you, the you, you, your your slides are moving or no yeah no, no just is the first slide only sir okay you just check whether the slides are going to move in the second i moved to second slide is it okay no no you on share and share again yeah i think with this it is okay yeah yeah i think the i will go with this sir so yeah, organic matter poultry what i mean to say the poultry is also contributing uh, like can contribute organic matter to the as a fertilizer but the only one limitation is sir make uh, it full screen yeah that's not moving sir No, no, it's okay, sir. I think there is a problem, probably. Yeah, there is a problem. It is not moving. Yeah, so go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, the poultry, uh, okay, organic matter that is uh, really contributing almost eight to nine million metric tons within India. That is very much available. But the only limitation is we need to convert that, uh, like nitrogen. Uh, if we make, if we can make the compost, I think even the nitrogen can be converted. Uh, uric acid can be converted into more safer form from the plants. so that uh, not only it they produce uh, it supplies phosphorus nitrogen yeah, of course little bit of potassium and even uh, it, it produces lot of it is having almost 80% organic matter maybe carbon uh, we can also enrich the soil the way uh, whatever we had just now so that is about the like uh, some point which i'd like to add uh, so here uh, the poultry production the commercial poultry production that is an integral part of the uh, entire agriculture sector as a whole because uh, the poultry is uh, primarily depending on the lot of food material that is produced maybe in the form of uh, maize or maybe cereals as a source of energy 
and the oil seed cakes residues as a source of protein. So whatever like soybean meal, sunflower, cotton seed meal, all this we are using as a source of protein and cereals including maize as a source of energy. These are the primary feed ingredients which we use for poultry as a source of energy and poultry. Of course, we use other materials as well. So in the poultry uh, sector, if you see, uh, they are mostly uh, they are, uh, centered around southern part of India, commercial poultry activities. And even we have uh, northern part also where uh, Punjab, Haryana, there is one big belt of poultry production, commercial poultry production. And uh, recently the development is happening in the eastern part and northeastern states also. Uh, if you see the poultry housing, um, uh, they, are, they are mostly uh, one, one terminology we use as open type of poultry houses. Uh, we, this is a typical broiler house in our country. And this is the layer house. Layer house means uh, they produce eggs. Broiler means they produce meat. Because many people they must be knowing. And essentially, uh, we are rearing the birds in our country uh, in the open type of poultry house, which means uh, whenever there is a uh, change in the environment in, in terms of temperature, humidity, or wind velocity, they are directly impact, they impact the birds uh, in the form of change in the physiology as well as the production. Some extreme cases, it may even harm the birds, uh, which ultimately which may lead into the death. So if you're looking at the bird response to uh, change in the environmental temperature, uh, bird will be very much comfortable in the zone of 15 to 27 degrees Celsius, where we will get the best, better uh, be, uh, feed conversion ratio. That means the quantity of feed consumed will be optimum for, to gain one kg body weight gain or to produce one egg. Uh, likewise, but if the temperature is less than 15 degrees centigrade, it will lead to the cold shock. Uh, uh, particularly, this will happen around 2 degrees or even less than 2 degrees centigrade, which is sometimes we find uh, in the northern part of India. If the temperature is crossing the, uh, above 30 degrees Celsius, because there is no sweat glands for poultry, and whatever the heat that is produced within the body has to dissipate in the form of uh, like you know, respiration, increase the respiration. That increase the respiration, uh, one terminology we call that is a panty. Usually the body will have the respiration rate of, for example, 80, uh, 80 cycles, but in the under extreme temperature, like the temperature more than uh, 30 degrees centigrade, it will be three times or four times more. So sometimes it is 300 cycles per minute, which is really, uh, sometimes bird could not able to cope up, that will create a lot of stress. So that is how the ideal temperature, if we need to keep the bird under comfortable zone, like the 17 to 27 degrees Celsius. If there any change in the temperature, where higher temperature particularly, uh, uh, that, uh, so this is going to cause uh, some physiological as well as uh, uh, physical problems. Physical problems means they, 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 there is a reduction in the feed intake, uh, body weight they reduce. In case of egg producing birds, the egg production also drastically reduces from a 90% of like average to sometimes it goes to 70 or 75%, just simply because of the change in the environmental temperature. Likewise, it is having the eggshell quality also will like the more thinner shells you will produce during summer months because of the uh, more heat dissipation, more carbon dioxide loss is there. Uh, shell is nothing but a, a calcium carbonate. Though we are producing calcium in the form of shell grit and stone grit, but the carbon dioxide, uh, the carbonate availability will be uh, limitation during heat stress condition because of more panting and more carbon dioxide is thrown out of the body. So the shell problems are, is a very common thing during summer season. Uh, it will also create a lot of problems, uh, antioxidant resp response and uh, immunity also goes down and increase sometimes uh, mortality also. Uh, when we look at the physiologically increase the respiration, increase the body temperature, they produce corticosteroids. So these are all like no, they, 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 they increase the further, uh, they create a lot of problems in terms of immunity as, well as oxidative stress. They suppress the interleukin, which is again uh, a potent in, uh, anti, uh, like a uh, disease, uh, like reducing agents. Uh, so the interleukin production will be suppressed because of excess heat. So they produce excess or uh, react to oxygen species, uh, which are uh, highly toxic, highly uh, oxidative in nature. They cause uh, damage to the cell uh, organelles and uh, they will create a problem. So this uh, we will discuss a bit later. Uh, 
and they also damage the cell wall uh, micro molecules of the body within the cell also uh, cell is mostly a uh, human cell is mostly made up of phosphorus lipoprotein phospholipid and this lipid membrane is which is having the more like the um, polyunsaturated fatty acids more double bonds they will create problem and they break down the shell uh, uh, they break down the and they create the problem and the cell damage will happen so what are the other losses due to uh, during the heat stress is uh, there is a reduction in the feed intake the bird they can't eat even we people also during summer season because of heat stress condition our feed intake also goes down because basically the maintenance energy will be less so that's why uh, even the similar situation is there in chicken also uh, the feed intake drop will be around uh, 10 to 35% uh, similarly the egg production the drop is around 10 to 15% the growth rate is 10 to uh, even sometimes in extreme cases like may may month coupled with a uh, little more humidity humidity uh, the growth will also go down to more than 10 to 15% as i was telling the panting leads to metabolic alkalosis and shelf quality problems uh, the digestion capacity also because uh, the in the intestinal ecosystem also will also get uh, intestinal ecosystem will also get disturbed so enzyme activity enzyme digestion and enzyme utilization will be uh, suppressed and poor uh, so hyperventilation and poor digestibility are the some of the things physiologically how this is going to uh, describe like uh, any heat stress condition any climatic change higher uh, like variability of temperature humidity even wind velocity they create stress so that stress uh, physiologically we we uh, even the human beings also the same scenario Uh, stage one, stage two, stage three. Uh, it is designated three phases. Like first one is alarming stage. Whenever there is a stress condition uh, of any nature, not only thermal stress, it will be any stress, even psychological stress also uh, in human beings. Also, it will happen that they, they produce adrenaline, they stimulate, and they produce the adrenaline uh, stimulates the production of uh, free radicals and corticosteroid production. and the, when the stress continues they we enter into the stage of stage of adaptation here uh, adrenal medulla they produce glucans and the corticosteroids and they also produce free radicals and the corticosteroids and this when there there is a higher accumulation of free radicals and corticosteroids so then I, when the stress continues we will enter into the stage of exhaustion that means the body could able to cope up the stress condition to some extent Uh, when when the stage is cross above that and there is it enter into this third stage of exhaustion and uh, here what will happen uh, corticosteroid glucan production will further increase it will create uh, damage to the cell as well as uh, other vital organs and uh, finally we will enter into the stage of physi physiological disability and finally we will find a lot of mortality of the birds during uh, heat stress condition Yeah, how the corticosteroids are harmful uh, for any living being they produce adrenaline thyroxine uh, this is uh, metabolic production metabolic uh, control it will happen and they are they are also important immuno suppressants and they regress the bursa bursa is one organ that is present in the chicken uh, which produce antibodies uh, against any invading pathogen so they uh, the, the vital immune lymphoid organ will get suppressed so naturally the immune capacity is going down uh, and even there are some cytotoxic to certain granulocytes like these are a type of white blood cells which uh, again act on uh, invading pathogens related by bacteria or virus so this they create, they they destroy the corticosteroid destroy the glucocytes they will also again Uh, suppress the luteinizing hormone that is one hormone which is required for egg production and uh, they are gluconeogenic that means they produce a lot of ketos keto or uh, ketone bodies these ketone bodies are also toxic when their concentration is going very higher side even many people nowadays talking about keto diet that bring to the extreme uh, catabolism of body protein or even sometimes fat that is also not very good sign and we have to maintain balance excess production of ketones say that bird or in human beings is detrimental so then uh, here the in chicken uh, what is going to happen because of uh, higher temperature the, the body uh, temperature metabolic body that is pro energy that is produced heat is produced that will get 
like eliminated uh, uh, through the panting, uh, increase the respiration rate. So one calculation is uh, uh, even human beings also, if you are having the more, if you are having more uh, like the production of oxygen molecules, uh, one uh, 25 molecules is equal to one free radicals. That means if they are running fast or if your uh, heartbeat is increasing or if you are uh, using a lot of oxygen, uh, so naturally the free radical production is proportionately is going up. So these free radicals, they, they damage the cell membrane. And they also, uh, cell membrane means we are almost all cell bodies, uh, cell organelles, uh, cells are made up of phospholipids and phospholipids, they, they will get destroyed. So that means the aging process will be will go up very fast. So the pure nutrient absorption, because the, the intestinal uh, like you know, lining is damaged, so naturally the absorption of the nutrients will be reduced. So again, immunosuppressive effect and the damage the brain and retina, the sight is even the functioning of the brain will also get suppressed. And even the, in case of males, the, they, they damage the spermatozoa. Uh, particularly uh, the spermatozoa, they will get denatured and they naturally the uh, fertilizing ability of this uh, individual will go down. So then uh, chick embryo, particularly the hatchability will go down in chicken also, not in not only chicken, even human beings also, whenever there is an excess production of free radicals, they will damage uh, the vital organs, particularly brain also, where a lot of polyunsaturated fatty acids are there. Excuse me, sir. Can you just a little speed up your presentation, sir? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah. So then what nutrition we have to provide? So this energy, uh, energy production, we have to increase uh, by 30 calories. The, uh, so we need to provide the excess energy, 10% uh, excess energy. If we are providing during summer season, the stress will go down. Yeah, then some certain trials, whatever we have done, the higher energy levels, they increase the egg production and other production parameters compared to that of uh, uh, low energy diets. Uh, the actual quality also improves. That means their actual defects is reduced means shell quality is improved because of supplying high energy or even enzymes in the diet. The one source is the fat supplementation is one of the things which uh, generally uh, we follow to uh, reduce the stress and uh, again to produce uh, one metabolic heat, uh, that means the cooling effect of the fat is there because during summer season, if you are pro providing the fat, that is quite beneficial. The protein quantity, uh, if you are reducing the protein quantity and again maintaining the essential amino acid like lysine, methionine, threonine, tryptophan, these are certain essential amino acids by supplementing essential amino acids and by reducing the protein level that is beneficial because excess protein is, they produce a lot of metabolic heat that will create a problem. These are all certain enzymes, how they are going to beneficial. Even the calcium supplementation is very much beneficial, particularly in the more, uh, if you are providing the available form of calcium, that is better. Yeah, supplementation of a certain electrolytes, like uh, particularly potassium is one uh, electrolyte which get excreted during stress, season, stress condition. So whose concentration should be uh, like 0.4 to 0.6%. So then we, if you have, we need to increase its by 50% more during stress. That is one thing regarding the electrolytes. Uh, the certain vitamins, uh, anti-stress vitamins, nowadays people are thinking about using of vitamins uh, like whenever the COVID situation, but generally they are very, very essential. We feed regularly to the chicken, uh, like vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin D3 also. They are very much beneficial, they have given. And vitamin C is an important, uh, how it is going to be useful, they are also described. Uh, vitamin degradability will be more during the heat stress condition, but that's why we need to provide a little different of encapsulated vitamins. Uh, we have to maintain cold chain. Uh, certain antioxidants like zinc, uh, uh, copper, manganese, selenium, and iron, uh, and the combination of vitamin E and vitamin C and uh, with other trace minerals, they are very much beneficial. The feeding practice is one thing, like we need to uh, provide uh, feed during the early part of the day because when you early morning means maybe in the four o'clock in the early morning. So the when the body is consumed to feed, uh, the metabolic heat will be produced after three hours. So uh, the heat production is also should happen during the polar part of the day. If you are feeding the noon time, that will create a problem because the further it will increase the further metabolic uh, body weight, body temperature. So that will create a problem 
so bird will be under so much of distress so you should feed during the pollen part of the tag that is one simple thing how that organic trace minerals are beneficial also we conducted trials and chromium selenium are beneficial organic selenium beetan is uh, like beetroot extract we extracted and we fed and this improved the uh, the bird performance during summer uh, situation uh, this is the what we have to feed uh, feeding uh, during the like uh, early part before four uh, early morning is better than feeding feed during the peak period uh, we have to increase the feed intake i was telling because the feed reluctance they, they don't consume feed so the feed intake can be promoted by feeding the wet mash feeding that means mixing up the little bit of water uh, in the feed and spraying the water on the in the form of powders and feed giving the feed in the form of pellets or crumbles and a supplementation of fat or molasses or uh, other ways and means to increase the feed intake the shell quality how to maintain also uh, these are a certain general housing man management practices which i am going to uh, just uh, give some pictures uh supplement uh, providing the fogers within the shed they will reduce the uh, house temperature 3 to 5 degrees celsius that is one of the practical situation and putting the white paint uh, is also being practiced uh, so which will also beneficial uh, painting will also reduce the 2 to 3 degrees centigrade uh, in the in the shed and providing the side curtains with fogers on the, on the on the on top of it will reduce the temperature 3 to 5 degrees centigrade so this ultimately we need to reduce again putting that agricultural waste as a roof like you know insulating material on top of the poultry shed that will also reduce the in house uh, shed temperature providing the uh, mega fans like you know, they they which will has uh, increase their ventil ventilation or maybe particularly these are very much useful whenever in the coastal region of the country where the humidity and temperatures are more if the humidity to reduce this ill effects and uh, the certainly Uh, including like the you know, providing of these fans they are very very beneficial and uh, removing the cobwebs cobwebs will prevent particularly on the side curtains like you know, by removing the cobwebs the air flow uh, will be increased by 20% if the air flow is increased the bird will kept uh, cool during stress and hot stress condition providing sprinklers on top of the uh, poultry shed coupled with the uh, white paint as well as uh, putting the uh, uh, like insulating material on the top of it will also help providing the exhaust fans on the roof is also a common practice in poultry houses yeah this is how uh, providing painting and thatching thatched roofing you will reduce 39 to almost 3 uh, to 4 degrees centigrade this has been practiced and uh, uh, this is the data research data these are the thatched materials coupled with sprinklers that is also beneficial so uh, i should conclude here uh, the dietary changes provide recovery uh, only up to only 25% of the losses it will not completely eliminate uh, like ameliorate the negative effect of the like uh, high environmental temperature so we should minimize the shed temperature the way i just last four couple of slides i described how to minimize the shed temperature is one aspect and that is the most effective way reducing the temperature and also uh, changing the dietary modulations uh both together will certainly help the bird to provide uh like you know, to get the normal production and a normal humidity as well as the bird welfare so provide cool and fresh water actually this is one very uh, very difficult situation during because uh, even the water pipeline will also get uh, uh, hot in like you know, so there so that we have to provide the cool water during the uh, hotter part of the day so i think uh, uh, this slide the at the reduced poultry house temperature nutritional modulations will certainly uh, give the benefit uh, so that means a two dimensional approach we should have that one thing is reducing the house temperature and also uh, like you know, changing the new, uh, like the critical nutrients profile in the diet uh, will uh, definitely help the bird to get the normal production thank you very much hello thank you sir thank you very much for your nice presentation uh, due to the short of time then we will we have the question on the chat box sir i think maybe at the end of the session we will take the question uh, okay. we will move, move on to the next speaker dr murlikrishna sir greetings to all yes sir 
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The, we have our next speaker, uh, Dr. I.V. Murlikrishna, former scientist ISRO. He will be delivering lecture on climate change as an investment opportunity. I request Dr. Srividya to please introduce the speaker. Am I audible, sir? Yes, madam. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, in the, it's a in pleasure the... in having today Dr. Ivy Murli Krishna, who's a former scientist from ISRO, for the session today. Uh, Professor Dr. Murli Krishna has obtained his MTech from IIT Madras and his doctorate from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He's been the recipient of former Dr. Rajaramanna Distinguished Fellow at DRDO and has served as assistant professor in IIT Madras. He's also served as, as a senior scientist and head of the Marine Applications Division, National Remote Sensing Agency, Indian Space Research Organization from 1979 to 1987. And he's also been uh, the professor and founder head of the Center for Spatial Information Technology at Jawaharlal Nehru Technological University and has been the director of JNT University's Research and Development Center and also been the national coordinator for Geospatial Public Health Project. Dr. Professor Murli Krishna has guided and co-guided 26 PhDs and almost 152 postgraduate students in the area of geospatial technology and data analytics and environmental management. He has served as a guest scientist at German Space Research Institute and GKSS Research Center. He has to his credit more than 50 papers in peer-reviewed journals and about 80 conference papers in at the international and international, international level. He has authored two books on climate change and weather modification technologies and environmental management and climate change. We welcome you, sir. Thank you, Sri Vidya. Um, may I request the organizers to share, permit me to share my screen? Yes, sir. Please go ahead, sir. And you have to give me, you have to make me as a host or something. Co-host or something, am I right? No, sir. No need, sir. Go to share screen and we can do it, sir. You are able to see my screen? Yes, slides are coming, sir. Just window has come. Yes, slide is there, sir. Go to slide. Uh, slides of you, sir. Full screen. You got it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Earlier, there is some uh, issue related to somebody wants to be admitted. Can you look into that? It has... I will do that, sir. Okay, okay. So, <clears throat> uh, greetings to all. It is indeed a great pleasure and privilege to be associated with this uh, wonderful event. And uh, I'm excited to see more than 100 participants on, in this uh, particular program. Uh, related to climate change and agriculture and food nutrition, one of the some of the very important uh, topics. While uh, my presentation is being considered slightly in a different manner, because I was listening to some of the people for the last uh, one hour, where uh, it has been uh, said, then uh, by Sadhguru quoted uh, uh, quoting Sadhguru as uh, land is managed by farmers and a concrete action is needed. And this is where exactly my focus lies in terms of uh, eco-friendly business opportunities arising from climate change and design thinking. This is what uh, my plan. And uh, it's not that uh, I focus everything on agriculture, but uh, I address few issues because of our involvement in a programs related to smart village movement all over the uh, some northeastern states with the University of California, Berkeley, where I happen to be one of the fellows. So the emphasis is how we can look into some of the important issues and adopt what is the current situation. As you can see in this slide, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is the most adaptable to change. 
that is what exactly is the issue when you are talking about the climate change because people spend a lot of time lot of research is going on on mitigation but there's not much significant aspect work is being done in the world in commensurate with what is being done on mitigation on aspects related to adaptation so climate change is inevitable so how we can take it as a, a necessary uh, benefit or evil and how we can rise to the occasion and meet the requirements of happy living in through adaptation of principles like open innovation design thinking and go for some sort of eco friendly business opportunities that is the my thinking and let us say we cannot solve the problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them that is what albert einstein says and who is illiterate of the 21st century is is not the person who is not able to learn but the person who is not able to adopt and not able to learn these are the two things the earlier definition of illiteracy has gone so while talking about these things so my issue is i am not going to talk on core agriculture or uh, the food habit uh, the nutrition or uh, any of the issues but how we can apply these principles and meet the needs of the society by applying the principles of creativity thinking out of the box empathy observation and asking the right questions these are the prescriptions i make when i make a, uh, my uh, business model because ultimately the technology is uh, is available the way the technology has growing is very rapidly but the way the technology is being implemented adopted for utilization to meet the pain points of the people is very slow so there are two important issues one is a technology push as well as the technology pull so we need to look into the pain points in the society let us take agriculture what are the pain points of the farmer whether in terms of starting from the seeds to the post harvest management and marketing the product what are all the various pain points and how we can address each pain point using the mod uh, tools of management as well as the technology and how we can fill the gaps in terms of make a more profitable um opportunity create oper profitable opportunities and make the farmer happy while doing these things let us see we all familiar with the moore's law which says the doubling density of semiconductor circuits every 2 years and metcalf's law which says the communication networks by this, which increase by square of the network so we are in a state of exponential technology that is what i was telling we are moving very very fast in terms of the technology but are we moving at the same rate in terms of the utilization of the technology to meet the needs of the society we have the technology to publish the papers to get the patents what patents have been transferred into the a meaningful format form to derive benefit to the farming community agriculture community that is one of the specific issues we are focusing on our smart village movement smart village when we say i am the uh, director of the smart village programs in india from university of california berkeley academic programs so in, in what we focus is not putting roads or anything how we can make the villager far particularly smarter that is the emphasis villager the most important person he happens to be one of the persons is a farmer and how can we make smarter by bringing the technologies to to his uh, doorstep and create business opportunities and while doing these things how they we have got another problem of climate change how what are the eco friendly uh, aspects in terms of the climate change so we have a three dimensional analysis one is the climate change one of the aspects the other one is the technology the third one is the pain points how these three things can be integrated to make a more profitable and useful solution see there we are all familiar with the technology the revolutions innovation open innovations etc so what is needed is we need to observe what is happening around us in terms of the application of adaptation implementation dissemination of the products or processes while doing these things 
we are all familiar i don't have to tell you the importance of the agriculture which is one of the important aspects because i can skip this whole event is on agriculture we could see the importance while doing these specific issues we had what is called as the industrial revolutions about which everyone is familiar with because i'm i am afraid that the, the, the monitor the the master of the ceremony may say please close this so i am moving a bit fast uh, because hardly i have about 20 minutes time so please forgive me but anyone who have more clarity we can always contact me later so while coming back to my talk let me say the industrial revolution 1.0 about 200 years back, it mechanized the production. Industrial the IR 2.0 created mass production, where IR 3.0, which has got automated the production, and IR 4.0 is focuses on the knowledge. So it just started about five, six years back, and now today we are talking some at some sector, IR 5.0 and 6.0, leaving these things set aside. The IR 4.0 focuses on knowledge. That means what knowledge is there in the society? What patents that have been developed, what publications have been developed, can we transfer them in a meaningful form to the industry so that they implement them and get benefit, make useful products, processes, customer satisfaction to the farmer, farming community, to the villager. Can we think in that direction? So I will focus on those issues. While we are doing these specific issues, what is happening is we are addressing various components in the field by talking to the people in northeastern states, whether in a farmer in Meghalaya or farmer in Arunachal Pradesh or farmer in uh, other parts of the northeastern states. How, what are his pain points? How we can apply the empathy? What is the issue of technology pull? See, what is we know is not needed by the farmer or any other community, what is he needs is what we have to deliver. That is one of the prime aspects, prime focus in our program related to the Smart Village movement. While uh, talking these things, you're all familiar when, for example, during uh, 1870 or somewhere, Marconi invented radio, but it took 30 years for adoption of that radio. That means nobody wanted radio at that time. So that is how people are developing the technologies which are not needed by the people but there are a lot of gap to have the technologies needed by the people and that gap need to be filled up and implemented and adopted by adopting technology it's quite possible and that is where the um, eco-friendly business models are able to con plan to concentrate. It's not that we have at all developed eco-friendly business models on every aspect. We are it is a continuous process. We are working on those issues, and I'll share some of those uh, our uh, experiences to the not, I mean, information of all these people and look forward for any comments at any point of the time. So, wh what exactly is the issue informed? Is what is eco-friendly? business what exactly so eco-friendly is a method of come uh, method of community production that is less or not harmful to the environment that is what exactly is, is needed so we are now talking about the we, when we do a business it should not damage the surroundings in any form or it cannot uh, stop the sustainability of the sustainable development i talk sustainability of sustainable development People talk well, people concentrate on sustainable development because that, that is very important by constant support to the uh, renewable resources because it's the ultimately one of the very, very important issues while uh, handling any specific topic. So coming to the core of our problem, what is exactly is the issue when climate change versus the business opportunity? Is there any um, climate change concern and how the business opportunities can be addressed? Because uh, we are talking about climate change many times and it's no longer a novel topic and much has been said about its impacts and strategies for mitigation. Now time is very, very uh, important, uh, ripe, how we can incorporate the new business models and how we can envision with, envision with the climate change adaptation so that sustainable long-term growth. So we, have, we may work on 
climate change mitigation, but equal emphasis, if not more emphasis, has to be made on climate change adaptation. So any plan, any program, any knowledge, either uh, created or dissipated or absorbed, has to focus on climate change adaptation every, in every aspect related to your uh, program and uh, business opportunities are no uh, exception for these things. So considering uh, these specific issues, what is the importance of the adaptation for corporates? See, basically the uh, discussions in any of these things around uh, climate change in, uh, today typically center on mitigation as I already told you. But uh, can we think about the adaptation? Because that, that is what Charles Darwin also said. It is the adaptation what matters, not intelligence or knowledge what matters. Can we think in this direction and what models, what issues could be illustrated? Whatever we are models that are we are illustrating are certainly not uh, uh, exhaustive, but in terms of the programs or the processes, they consider to be illustrative. So you have to be innovative in these things. It could be a product innovation, or it could be a process innovation, or it could be a customer satisfaction or business development. This is just a, a glimpse of it. It's not necessary to look into these issues, except the fact that we have to look into the concerns of the persons who are working in this area. So while talking about this, we apply a principle called as design thinking. Design thinking is nothing but a thinking which builds around the empathy. Empathy, observe the pain points of the people. We observed almost about 30,000 farming community by interviewing them and what are the issues, what are the problems at every sector of the, in every phase of their uh, farming operation and where, what technology is globally available and how we can create a group of the farmers, FPOs and anybody to start some sort of a business propositions and how they can create a value. See, in a business model requires a value proposition. How you create the value and how you capture the value, what business model canvas could be created. So we had a uh, one design, one product, like for example, mango. How you can make the mango the most popular and exactly how you create value to the mango and create more business opportunity for him. Those are some of the examples. We have almost several examples and the time is not sufficient to go any of the examples in detail, except to tell in surface, what are all the issues in application of the design thinking. Let us see for a couple of minutes, what is the focus of the uh, concept of design thinking. As I was telling, we are not thinking in a traditional manner, but we are thinking out of the box. Out of the box, open innovation are the two key components wherein we Think. So we define what is the question the farmer is not able to get right the market for his product. Understand the people, empathize. Idea coming up with the creative solutions and prototype, build a version of the idea and test with the customer base. For example, in Meghalaya, there is a lot of potato is grown and a potato grown there uh, is not adequate for somebody to come from the for rest of the country to come and buy. There is limited quantity, but how they can, there are a lot of waste of the potato. So those are the issues we create, address and created right opportunities in which they can create, they can have a sort of a business opportunity for getting their products utilized by value addition and get the profit. So this is where the design thinking approach has been adopted and as we say it is a process it is a lot of emphasis on understanding the people's farmers problems that is where exactly i will say not more than that one so we have a definition research empathy ideation prototyping and evaluation these are the continuous steps we adopt while we talk to any pain point and how do we convert the pain point into a grand challenge and how do we address the grand challenge in terms of value creation, 
first uh, is the value proposition then value creation and value capture who are the key partners what are the key activities what are the key resources these three are combined as a total canvas business model canvas for agriculture production that is what exactly is our understanding is our um, little effort in meeting the needs and filling the large gaps in the country because the scientific community and the business community are doing in different excellent work in their own domains can we link them can we bring them together onto the same table and create more and more and more opportunities to the benefit of the farmer the in this type of thinking so we use the design thinking methodology to identify the right solutions and lean project management to define the solution scope each one is a topic or in itself and uh, it is enough if we understand the we need to be very positive very active very creative very adaptive to make a product or a process or a customer satisfaction that in meets the requirements of the present society and as a part of climate change adaptation that is what exactly is the emphasis we have made this is open innovation for, for uh, as a uh, means developed by henry chesbro at the university of california berkeley where we focus on this particular issue much more significantly you can say there a lot of ideas come from different things and it's not one market several markets could be assigned so that is what exactly is the basic principle the big picture of the open innovation coming back to the our own issues then what exactly are these issues where we can think of the challenges and what are the specific issues that need could be addressed in terms of the climate change uh, adaptation versus and how the traction can be made so there could be a climate change diagnostic businesses some sort of a um, resilience solutions and uh, climate response businesses these are not exhaustive we are only giving three important things which we found to be more compatible more implementable and there are several other uh, the aspects several aspects related to the climate change in terms of the business categories while uh, doing these specific issues what is a climate change diagnostic business what exactly is the issue so we collect the data as a simple form and uh, provide the data in a different form and analyze the data and utilize the data so while doing these things that is the diagnostics see for any issue first we to, when we talk of convert the pain point into the grand challenges we have to go for the data specific analysis and in terms of application and evaluation of the data actually what happens in these things is it is not invention what matters is innovation as a, an example i can quote thomas alva edison who is known everybody talks that he has invented electric bulb but he has not invented electric bulb before him more than uh, 80 people invented the electric bulb with different types of filaments what thomas alva edison made is he has created used the bulb created a electric network created the power supply and provided the entire infrastructure so that people can get light people doesn't want a bulb people want a light that is why we talk about thomas alva edison as the inventor of the bulb which is not right if you read the history of the electric uh, bulb then thomas alva edison happens to be almost 90th person so why this is one aspect of uh, the thinking and then the second one is the resilient solution businesses so the resilient solution businesses are very important because they mitigate recover and compensate any sort of application and the, the typical government the utilities infrastructure could be the some sort of a customers so these are the two important first is uh, uh, diagnostics then the solution in terms of the customers and what climate response we can think about is essentially we have to build up a business model 
that provides value, that provides significant value, some sort of managing the uh, aftermath of the, what you call as the, the consequence of the gradual climate change in any aspects. So these three happen to be a very, very significant part in a larger perspective. But when we are going to the specific inputs, let us uh, see what happens is, uh, can we uh, think about some sort of a eco-friendly business plans? Some of the, our current proposals is a one sort of a biofuel plant. Because biofuel plant is a very uh, important thing. And with the increasing the oil prices, a lot of emphasis is being given to the biofuel production. It has got its own positive aspect and negative aspects. A lot of uh, thinking has gone uh, done on these issues, and investments are can start from low to very high. So, biofuel plant is one aspect which is being considered under our smart village program as a means of eco-friendly business plan. Then the other one is the solar energy, because we have India ranks as a third as a solar market, uh, and uh, China is leading the whole process. And this is a, a lot of business opportunities in solar energy. And if you work on a solar energy issues, there are excellent opportunities both for as a energy consultant, a solar consultant and a solar panel uh, developer. These are some of the issues. How we can use the solar energy is eco-friendly and profitable business-wise. It is one of the very, very critical, crucial issues. And we can talk about it ourselves because the use of the solar energy happens to be the very specific potential way to reduce, let us say, eco-friendly when I say it reduces the pollution and can be adopted as a part of modern lifestyle sooner or later. That is what exactly is important, but because it doesn't require any sort of higher uh, investment opportunities than the rainwater harvesting. So uh, that is being taken up everywhere, but is it being taken at the manner that deserves to be taken? That is not taken up. So that is one important aspect. Then the third one is the composting the industry because ultimately the kitchen waste, for example, I take the kitchen waste in your house is a gold mine. Can we think in those aspects and adopt composting as one important issue and think about the opportunities? Then the other one is the green architecture because we see the homes we are living increasingly becoming some sort of a breeding grounds for diseases, for not being well lit and uh, not good air, air uh, support is not there. So can we think of a green architecture? A lot of things are happening, platinum buildings and all these things, but are they coming to the, uh, the common man? Why those things are not being adopted at every level, starting from the lowest level to the highest level? So these are the issues where we have to think in one way or other significantly. While uh, talking about these issues, then which companies are eco-friendly? There are so many companies which are eco-friendly. I don't have to tell. Most important is uh, the company. Excuse like, me, sir. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll complete in uh, how much time you give it? Another two minutes, sir. Pause okay, me. I can stop it also right now if you want. Two, two minutes you can, please, sir. Okay, I'll, uh, I just... Uh, skip my slides. Sorry, I am not able to cover my talk. It's okay, sir. It's well covered, sir, actually. You are given different dimension to the business. Yeah, what could be the different? Can I get about three minutes at least? Uh, please, sir, go ahead, sir. Thank you for your kindness. Uh, so what could be the different small scale profitable business ideas is one important issue while uh, talking about these things. See, what we have, this is not, uh, uh, I mean, uh, 
reading a paper, this is what we are adopting in the field, whether an agriculture farm, a vermicompost, organic farm, greenhouse, and a poultry farming. These are some of the issues which we are uh, taking in one way or other. So taking these things, how we can think about the issues uh, of adaptation, of implementation, dissemination, etc. So think globally to create the value, define the right business model to capture the value, uh, to network with larger ecosystems to distribute the value, enhance the value, profit from the value, share the value, protect the value, sustain the value, etc. That is what exactly is the issue. So th thank you very much. I, I certainly uh, we can talk much and if anybody is interested, he can mail me on these issues because we are looking for the experts from the agriculture domain, how they can address the pain points in the society and the various farmers. We got a grand challenges. We got compiled almost about 300 uh, grand challenges you know, for related to under 14 uh, agroclimatic situations at any, uh, all over the country. So I will look forward to the comments by, by the experts in the agriculture and how we can create the business opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Murali Krishna, sir. Uh, I think uh, we we will have a separate session with you to look at the points. Probably that should be the way forward. A lot of ideas. And uh, thanks for your time. And uh, it was very brief today because uh, we are hard pressed for time, sir. So we will uh, talk again today. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, so we will move to the next session. Will be with Dr. Raj Bandari. Uh, a pediatrician and uh, expert in public health and he's the uh, national technical uh, he's on the national technical board of nutrition with niti ayog uh, so I hand it over to ilangon i think let me start i don't need any <laughs> no, no, people people need introduction sir <laughs> in the interest of time yeah, yeah no problem dr request to dr srividya please introduce the speaker a very good morning to all. It's a pleasure in inviting Dr. Raj Bandhari, uh, who has obtained his Doctor of Medicine, uh, MD Pediatric Medicine from Rajasthan Medical University. He is the member National Technical Board of Nutrition, Niti IO, Government of India. Sir has an experience of over four decades as a clinical pediatrician and expertise in project management making. Uh, which made him a formidable choice for advocacy design and implementing the policies and programs. He's been the advisor, consultant, and mentor to various leading and reputing, uh, reputed organizations in India and abroad, and has worked across multiple streams and organizations, both private as well as public. And he's been a thought leader in cross-sectional fields ranging from nutrition, women and child health, agriculture, and sustainability. He's been the member of Technical Board of Nutrition, uh, member of N National Millets Task Force, Government of India, and he's been an advisor to Maharashtra Village Social Transformation Foundation. And he's also the subject matter expert and advisor for CIMAM, Community Management of Acute Malnutrition. He's also a technical expert for health and nutrition, the production, child and adolescent health and child rights. We welcome you, sir. The platform is yours. Thank you. Thank you. And Sapko Namaskar. So uh, I must congratulate uh, ICAR, IIMR, under the leadership of Dr. Tunapi, Kappa, and uh, the other institutes who have joined in this uh, wonderful endeavor there seems to be a wide representation across sectors, a very cross-sectional uh, interdisciplinary team that we have today. And uh, great to hear to some of them. We, since yesterday, I believe we have discussed more about the external ecosystem, the uh, terrestrial, the oceanic, the uh, atmosphere and maybe the entire cosmos. I will try to bring attention to the internal ecosystem that we have within our body. 
and that is where the genesis of most of these diseases come into play so in my talk i would dwell upon the um, the climate change part and the mitigation and the adaptation strategies that the government is pursuing and uh, how we can reach to the goal of uh, sustainable development goals of 2030 that would be the focus so you see humanity is uh, at a crossroads currently and it's a humanitarian crisis uh, along with climate change sadly this tragedy is human made we have not inherited this earth from our forefathers we have borrowed it from our children and therefore it is imperative that we get to put our act together and work towards achieving this goal 26th march 2022 uh, we celebrated the earth hour and showed our solidarity by switching off lights and we took a silent pledge to reduce carbon footprint and the un sdg uh, 2030 uh, that includes 17 goals and i believe most of these goals climate change is cross cutting against all most of these goals uh, whether it be poverty hunger good health well being clean water sanitation clean energy or and uh, and climate change cuts across all of them so in a way climate change is a unifying factor uh, amongst uh, because there are no boundaries to uh, climate change so this unifies because it is it goes uh, above religion caste gender geographies political ideologies and therefore let me tell you where do we stand today uh, there was a a, a very uh, expert group of who and other scientists who gathered in seattle and they observed that one in two persons on the planet is malnourished now you would question and that would mean something like 3.5 billion people are malnourished so what does this whole image of malnutrition go to right from wasting stunting micronutrient deficiencies and the conundrum of non communicable diseases like hypertension hyperlipidemia obesity so this entire if you look at this whole spectrum we find that such a large population is uh, malnourished on this planet uh the we have the war in russia and ukraine which has led to high inflation we have the climate crisis which affects terrestrial and marine life you will be surprised that phytoplankton's uh, which is a micro algae they produce something like 50 to 70% of the oxygen that we require so these are so vital to uh be to to be the ocean and to be generated because they are such a wonderful source of oxygen supply and we find that there is a lot of nutrition in the algae spirulina which is derived from a very controlled environment of uh, temperature and pressure where it grows has has tremendous nutritional properties so everything whether it be the animal the agriculture the ocean uh, you know they all contribute to uh, the nutrition security in a way now what has come about is due to industrial farming our soil has turned into sand and why i say so because soil is living and that is what i meant by the external ecosystem there would be something according to a un report 27000 microbes which are going extinct every year and uh, if we do not 
you know, uh, mend our system, then by 2035, 2040, we will grow 40% less food than what we are growing today. And that we will have to supply to 9 billion mouths. So look at the huge disparity and the challenge that lies ahead if our production goes down and our mouths to feed have to increase. How do we really uh, get along to, uh, to replenish uh, our soil? And the earlier speaker who said about Sadhguru and the earth buddies, uh, certainly uh, that uh, would be the way forward that we can build up the organic content of soil, uh, which is currently below 0.8% to something like 3 to 6% so that the water retention is there. So the evidence that exists today is that there is an epidemiological shift from communicable to non-communicable diseases. And that is a major challenge. Uh, and most of these are climate related also. So that is why the issue of climate uh, uh, you know, changes becomes important. Then the other thing is that of malnutrition. We have one in two children who are anemic, one in three who are stunted, one in four child who has uh, uh, micronutrient deficiencies, and one in five who's wasted, that means small and thin babies. They are you know, just skin and bones. So that is the kind of uh, um, the, on the global hunger index also we rank poorly. While we have the highest production of cereals, uh, the legumes, the milk and fruits, still the, uh, the scourge of malnutrition looms large on us. And of course the socioeconomic variables they get accentuated due to climate change. Uh, now, the buzzword has been immunity lately after post-COVID. And how do we build up on this uh, immunity? That is one of the biggest perplexing questions which uh, is raised in front of many of the scientists. So uh, it, COVID pressed the pause button and we now, chant the mantra of one health, one planet, and one future, and leaving no one behind. Because if anybody, if unless everyone is safe, no one is safe. And that is what COVID proved. So WHO estimates that about 13 million deaths around the world each year due to environmental causes. And it says that the climate crisis is the single biggest health threat facing humanity. It further estimates that about 8.30 lakh people die from diarrheal diseases caused by polluted water and poor sanitation. So we clearly see that there is an imbalance in the ecosystem. And there is a tremendous loss of biodiversity. Uh, human beings are encroaching on the land, the habitat which was occupied by animals and birds. And this encroachment has led to human animal contact. And we find that the zoonotic diseases, that is the diseases which are transmitted from animals to human beings, they are on the rise. And COVID is one example uh, where uh, the transmission from a bat, may we presume, happened to a human being. And deforestation and flooding leading to less carbon sequestration and soil erosion, of course, are met. So it is true that we may not vacate these spaces, but then as prudent, and uh, um, responsible citizens, we need to find solutions as to how these spaces be utilized. So when I do a mapping of the vulnerability of at-risk population, 
I see that the health threats have intensified and also new threats have emerged due to climate change. We, if, if I were to count those risks uh, attributable to climate change, we find respiratory illnesses due to air pollution. There has been an ICMR study which shows uh, that uh, indoor air pollution causes respiratory allergies and um, diseases. Uh, COVID was exacerbated during the time when we had the Farali, Farali uh, burning and uh, high air pollution in Delhi. And uh, it is no secret that uh, this comorbidity along with COVID is a tremendous uh, 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 factor which contributes to increased morbidity and mortality. Then the heat shocks, which are more prevalent in Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, Gujarat, and Rajasthan, we find that deaths due to cardiovascular diseases and respiratory diseases, which are stressors in climate change, they have uh, they show an increase. The vector-borne diseases, especially malaria, dengue fever, uh, and there is a very strong correlation between climate change change in temperature, change in humidity for the proliferation of these vectors. And uh, just the other day, I was listening that Bengaluru uh, witnessed an untimely spell of rain and there is an increase in dengue cases. More than 2,000 cases have been diagnosed. So this is how climate change is affecting the occupational hazards, which could be chemical, biological, physical, uh, they all uh, happen due to uh, due to excessive mining and uh, other issues. Uh, silico, we see a lot of cases of pneumoconiosis, silicosis, bagasosis, which happen uh, due to occupational hazards. Then the waterborne diseases, diarrhea, giardia, and algal blooms, and cryptosporidium, all these. Uh, again, are attributed to to, to climate, to water, uh, uh, unsafe water, and poor sanitation. I bring your attention to cardiovascular diseases. As I said, that ICMR has pointed that there is an increase in these due to uh, climate-related changes, and mental health also uh, finds a important place. Uh, it is not just the deaths, but it is the suffering uh, that happens due to climate change. Malnutrition, yes, that whenever there is a crisis or, the, or an emergency situation, uh, the children, the women, and the vulnerable population will be most affected. So that again becomes important. Um, and we find more than a million premature deaths due to uh, climate related. Now I'll bring you to a deadly dozen. The climate sensitive diseases which will basically unfold and increase due to climate change effects. We have the bird flu, the H5N1 uh, in the farmed poultry. We have babesiosis, which is a malaria-like illness caused by ticks. Cholera, because cholera, due to Vibrio cholera, thrives in warmer waters. So as you find that the waters become warm, global warming, the cholera could uh, come up again. Ebola, which is lethal to primates and humans, and we have no cure for Ebola. Parasites uh, which spread between humans and livestock and wildlife due to higher temperature and more rainfall. They will find an increased uh, period of uh, transmission. Plague, especially affected by rodents, uh, which are the carriers, uh, they would be uh, infect. Uh, they, they will carry the infected flea. Uh, to places and uh, have 
epidemics red tides red tides uh, which is a poisonous algal bloom in coastal waters due to warming rift valley fever sleeping sickness uh, distributed due to the seed sea fly usually this is in africa that you have uh, and tuberculosis both human and bovine you have bovine in animals also tuberculosis that could find a recrudescence and yellow fever so in other words what i the reason i drew attention that all these 12 that is a dozen the, i call them the dirty dozen diseases they uh, will become uh, more uh, they will proliferate and our population will be at risk the uh, it affects both the climate change both vectors and hosts and disturbs the balance so humidity plus heat we have the wet bulb and if the temperature goes above 35 degrees celsius then the outdoor activity will be debilitated and there could be risk of death also so this is a dangerous combination of humidity plus heat now let me come to the you know while we are grappling with the uh, climate change and the resilience of the health system uh, modeling and health risk and climate variability become important we have to have the data metrics not only for deaths due to climate change but also the mental stress the delay in uh, treatment the disruption of supply chain of medicine of food which is adversely affected and the fecal oral transmission uh, of diseases uh, all these should be included in the data matrix and while we can map the vulnerability of at risk and poor and marginalized people uh, because women children they are disproportionately affected and also uh, the old people and livelihoods are lost due to uh, floods and cyclones and any of these tragedies which occur so i have a six uh, point prescription for healthy green recovery the first being preserve the preserve and safeguard nature second is access to safe water and sanitation third would be healthy energy transition so that transition whether we call the hydrogen or the renewable energy that has to be uh, seamless and smooth uh, we have to promote healthy sustainable food system there there was a eat lancet report a commission which was set up 69 countries came together and the uh, the crux of the uh, matter was that healthy diets nutrition climate resilience and sustainable agriculture these are the four pillars on which our humanity will have to survive and not only survive but thrive so we have to uh, so that is uh, the fourth one the uh, healthy uh, sustainable food system and healthy livable cities and then we have to stop further pollution now Uh, there has to be an executive order passed for climate change uh, priority and equity and the whole of the government and the whole of the communities they have to work in tandem not it is not the business of government alone and it should not be the business of government alone we as a society uh, have to come together on a multi stake platform multi stakeholder platform rather and uh, uh, build up partnerships and collaborations uh, where we can gauge and assess and evaluate our strategy for a high social return on investment social return on investment would be how each stakeholder is benefited in this whole uh, you know in this whole process so it is not just one person but the entire all the stakeholder that means the farmer the consumer and all the people in the value chain and the supply chain so so government of uh, and these partnerships we have you know there is a program which is uchai 
which is understanding climate change and health associations in india uchai and that is running and we have uh, terry phfi aims nihs iit uh, iipa and uh, geo health toxicology all these come together and that is why i said it was a cross cutting issue now there are what the government has done is uh, first of all they have acknowledged this pro problem uh, we have created 16 centers of excellence each sector uh, uh, has a particular theme like vector borne allergen water borne occupational health iec surveillance and these centers of excellence are supposed to deliver state level action plans surveillance build up on capacity do research and development and documentation so these are the centers of excellence which have been created under the ministry of health uh, unfortunately when i look at the cop 26 and the other health doesn't get that kind of a center stage and that is why uh, we find that uh, these uh, uh, you know even in india in 2019 there were eight missions on climate change uh, uh, in india uh, but but then they added a ninth mission which was the health mission to bring focus of course the 10th was on coastal but these it is important to design these programs national and states and uh, they could be area specific programs and need specific uh, so in orissa like we have the problem of mining in north india it would be a different problem so it has to be a state specific action plan and fortunately government of india has created those structures and we need to put those structures uh to the in the implementation mode uh, uh yesterday dr dalwai was speaking about biotech bioenzymes biofuel bio compound uh bio processing bio everything you know and i was reminded of a meeting that i attended in johns hopkins in baltimore usa uh where they have a department for bioterrorism and uh uh if you have a box of anthrax and you throw it open uh, the whole population could be at risk and we do not know the genesis of covid but even if it was like lab made and it uh, the whole world so that in that i hope that form of bioterrorism never happens so the government of india has a mitigation and adaptation planning and uh, there is a integrated health information platform which has been created with support from who where digital technology iot big data analytics all are put together to find the uh, vulnerability index and uh, 28 states have developed their own action plan you would be happy to know and there is an environmental cell there is a multi level task force under the health secretary and adaptation planning for disaster management is there so the uh, the the five major buckets i'll just conclude uh, to reaching at the granular level at the ground level so that we reach each person and the last mile connectivity there we have to increase uh, public awareness now climate change as people perceive is not just increase in temperature even the temperature fluctuation has a very uh, adverse effect in terms of micro hydrology and uh, food insecurity so those temperature fluctuations have also to be recorded and uh, uh, we need to see what can grow where because most of the crops are shifting northwards so that becomes an important thing a uh, use of uh, social media ic campaigns that is what the government is doing bringing a knowledge synthesis and uh, at the and and developing community level modules uh, which go right down to the district level they are being um, uh, uh, developed where medical council of india the nursing council the homeopathy and uh, uh, indian medicine so all these 
you know, as an integrative response. So these partnerships are important. I cannot conclude without acknowledging that millets in my, you know, all these years that I have had a deep dive into millets, I find them as a near perfect solution. You have, these are, even if you don't, I never like to call anything like a super grain, but I would certainly recommend millets as smart, good for you, good for the planet and good for the farmer. Millets are in health terms, the variety of colors, look at the plethora of colors that millets offers. I call them all colors of health and natural colors. No other grain can offer such a plethora of beautiful colors. So to my mind, millet is not an option. It is an imperative whether we look at these diseases. We have ample of evidence to show statistical improvement in growth parameters, anemia, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, diabetes, you say that. And more so our internal ecosystem where you have 100 trillion bacteria, 10 times more than the cells of the body, which have fiber as their food. If you do not feed them with fiber, they get angry. And these bacteria, uh, the lactobacillus, acidophilus, bifido, Rhamnosus GG, these, uh, the, the, the gut microbiota, if they get angry, they go and impinge on the, on the cell wall of the intestine, causing an inflammatory bowel reaction. So this is where I wanted to connect the external ecosystem with the internal ecosystem, which has tremendous uh, role in the way these diseases come and the way the progress and the prognosis, how you will come out of it, because millet has the prebiotic property, the fiber and the resistant starch, which goes undigested in the large intestine, acts as a substrate for these bacteria to, live, uh, to act as prebiotic. And that is amply shown in the postbiotics, the butyric acid and the propionic acid. So I conclude with this, that if you, when biology meets with nature's wisdom, that is where the magic begins. So thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think hearing from Dr. Smoth uh, doubly assures how we need to manage our health in relation to climate change and the food adjustments. So thank you, sir. We will look forward for further deliberations at later point of time. So thank you. Thanks for your time. And uh, we, we, I'm sure we will have your guidance throughout. So thank you of so course, much. Of course. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, friends, uh, now we will be going with uh, the next presentations uh, by Dr. Vara Prasad, Biodiversity, Carbon and Land Management in Relation to Climate Change. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Elangavan. Yes, uh, sir. I requested Dr. Malati to please introduce uh, the speaker, Dr. Vara Prasad. Thank you, sir. We Delighted to welcome Dr. K. S. Varaprasad, former director, ICR Indian Institute of Oil Seeds Research. He is currently engaged as senior consultant, Indo German Global Academy for Agroecology Research and Learning, Ritu Sadhikar Samastha Government of Andhra Pradesh, and Asia Pacific Association of Agricultural Research Institutes, Bangkok. He is also the honorable chair, working group on seed systems of revitalizing rain-fed areas network and the Odisha Millet Mission. He did his MSc and PhD at the Indian Agricultural Research Institute in Delhi and taught postgraduate students for about six years. He worked as head National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources at Hyderabad Regional Station for over two and a half decades, facilitating plant quarantine and plant genetic resource services to over 50 public, private, and international institutions in Southeast Coastal India. He has over 126 research and review publications to his credit and received several awards for his leadership and contributions that include the UNDP India Biodiversity Award 2016 and 
Dr. G.I. D'Souza Memorial Award 2017 for his contributions to the science of nematology. He contributed to the conservation, exchange, and mainstreaming of land races through innovative seed systems promoting sustainable ecosystems. With that, we are looking forward to listen to you, sir. Dr. Varaprasad, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just sharing my this thing. Uh, is it visible? Yes, yes sir. sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tonopi, for giving me this opportunity of not only giving lecture, but listening to very learned people uh, from very, very diverse fields. And uh, right, yeah, this, uh, I'm also thankful to Kappa, who has always been kind to me right from the beginning of the formation of the society. I have been part of the society meetings several times. Thank you very much for uh, this opportunity. So today I will be very briefly dealing and coming up with a single point around which my presentation will be there. I hope uh, that point will be acceptable and uh, Kappa and I will take forward that uh, single point recommendation. So if I go to the climate change, very elaborately, eloquently discussed by several speakers since yesterday, but I'm just giving few points, particularly related to crops, agriculture, what we are concerned about this climate change. One is of course, general temperature increase and then life is affected, it's a different issue. But for agriculture, at the critical stages, if this temperature raise, flowering and seed set is very important. Similarly, cyclones with a very high speed winds coupled with the rain set harvest is a common phenomenon now. Few days back it happened in uh, Andhra Pradesh and also the uh, neighboring states. So this is a very common phenomenon now that is happening because of the climate change. Untimely heavy rains, erratic distribution, a downpour of the rain, uh, rainfall, uh, several centimeters within a day or within a few hours, losing the soil, soil erosion, and uh, the clogging occurs. Then uh, the floods and cloud bursts, which were uh, uh, not a regular phenomena earlier, for the last 10 years now, they have become a very common phenomena, affecting the agriculture in a big way. Hailstorms, particularly for horticultural crops at harvest and also at the early stage, complete crop loss. This is also a, a, has become an order of the day. The drought spells, uh, which are short and during critical stages, but long in mid-season, also very adversely affecting the uh, agriculture. And in addition to that, even for biotic stresses, many times a cloudy, favorable temperature and a cold breeze for uh, sucking pests, fungi and bacteria to develop and then destroy the entire crop is also these are the consequences of the climate change the agriculture is facing today. But uh, uh, to acknowledge what we have done uh, in the Green Revolution is a, always a good thing because that was the requirement in those days that a six-fold increase in the food grains, four-fold increase in the population. So that means we crossed that. People expected that India will become, a famine will come and all that but we have crossed that, buffer stocks are there, exports more than 20 million tons we are doing today, horticulture from 95 to 320 in a just matter of 91 to 21, milk from 17 metric tons to million tons to 198 million tons, fish a significant change, particularly in this part of uh, 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 Andhra particularly, 0.75 uh, million tons to 13.4 million tons, so from an importing country to exporting up to more than $50 billion worth of exports, including commodities like rice, alone 40,000 crores annually we are exporting. The situation is very happy to see the first rank, we are first rank in the world in pulses and milk, second rank in wheat, rice, vegetables and melons, third rank in the rapeseed mustard, sixth rank in the meat, but all this is innovation and technology approach, top-down approach. But what is the current reality? Do we, are we paying some price for this green revolution and how our biodiversity, carbon, and land management is affected 
because of this green revolution success that we are attributing to and now the time has come that we have to look back and change uh, the situation uh, so this if you see the global climate crisis and habitat loss is leading to almost 1 million species uh, extinction risk is there and if you see the entire public and private seed systems in india revolve around 12 field crops and 11 vegetable crops uh, the very very meager number of crops there are 50 crops cover 80 percent of the area whereas 500 crops are cultivated in india there are 7000 edible species that can be cultivated and only five crops give more than 60 percent energy the big three crops which uh, the krisa dg was telling is also uh, they contribute uh, to significant energy needs so that means we are actually our food basket has shrunken and then we have lost the lot of diversity on the field in a big way so all put together public and private systems are approximately about 40 percent of the requirement is met whereas uh, rain fed areas and dryland seed needs more than 60 percent are still met from the farm saved seed that means there is a significant part of our agriculture is still left out uh, out of this greenhouse, I mean, green revolution uh, success uh, did not reach uh, a large area of India in the dryland cities. Uh, however, dryland is contributing in a big way, which I will also share with you. And what is the diversity we have? 4.5 lakh accessions are there in our national gene bank, belonging to 1500 plant species. So, which means that a huge diversity has been collected and then it is available. Almost more than 15,000 released uh, crop varieties are available for us. And uh, if you see with reference to farmer varieties or land races, at one time, just in the uh, 1930s and 40s, more than 30,000 land races or farmer varieties are cultivated. In paddy alone, I'm not talking of the 500 crops. Only one crop for 30,000 varieties were cultivated in India. Now, uh, about uh, three to uh, 10 varieties cover about 70% paddy varieties. 10 varieties cover about 70% of the area. Large number of agroecologies are filled by a very short number of varieties. So do we have any farmer variety promotion policy? Yes, we have PPVFRA. Farmer varieties are recognized, but uh, farmer variety Coming into the seed chain is not happening. We need a policy for this particular area. Then what is the current reality in the land management? 75% of that land is degraded. 36 billion tons of soil is lost annually. We are trading our soil and future for short-term gains. The fertilizer consumption from 12 kg to 133 kg jumped from 1969 to 2020. And a staggering figure of 1,27,000 crores is spent by the government on fertilizers, a very huge amount. Though the next year, that is 21-22, it has brought down to 80,000 crores. 80,000 crores is also not a small amount for the fertilizer subsidy. 6,000 crores worth of pesticides are consumed annually. And India is one of the big, biggest pesticide industry in Asia. And we are fourth in the world for supply of agrochemicals. Then we have the emergencies right now. And uh, mostly the way that we have used uh, our uh, natural resources had led to these uh, emergencies. Soil health, very well uh, covered by previous uh, speakers also. The soil emergency is there now, which we need to take care. Water emergency is there. Air pollution has reached high levels. And the nutrition, both the human and animal nutrition, is also an emergency now that we have to deal with. The crop yields are stagnated. The earlier uh, 13.47 kg of grain used to come per 1 kg of NPK. Now the, uh, it has just uh, come down to around 3 kg. So which means the response to the fertilizers has come down tremendously. The climate-induced yield loss is estimated around 4.5 to 9%. Uh, though some of the crops may increase the yields, but most of the crops, uh, the uh, climate-induced uh, yield loss is there. Then what is uh, the, our position in the carbon emissions? We are, there are three ways to look at it. If you see that uh, the country-wise, we are not big contributors. You can see China, US, uh, EU, and Russia are ahead of us. It's only about two gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent is our contribution. 
then if, even if you see uh, the uh, over a period of time, still we have not really uh, reached much. And then if you see the also per person also, it is just about two tons per person in the population wise also. So it's not very much, but uh, if we continue to do what we are doing now, the staggering figures will come and there will be very, very serious consequences. And if you see the uh, carbon dioxide, yes, it's uh, 1955 to now, it's only creeping upwards. And uh, uh, I think uh, most of you might be aware, one ppm increase in the atmosphere carbon dioxide is because uh, two billion tons of carbon dioxide from the terrestrial releases to the air. That's how that uh, we are losing uh, the environment and the carbon uh, emissions contributing to GHGs and a very serious situation that we are uh, ending up uh, with these uh, the activities that are going on. And even though uh, the our uh, India is not in such a big uh, contributor to these emissions, but very soon we will reach if we continue to do what we are doing now. And uh, then, as I told you earlier, the we have not reached fully the dryland areas and the rainfed areas. But in spite of not reaching these uh, green generation technologies fully in these uh, rainfed areas, you can see the contribution of these rainfed areas is very big. Food grains, 40%. Two thirds of our livestock population is case in this area. 44% of the rice is produced from here. 90% of the minor millets, 87% of the coarse cereals, 85% of the food legumes, and the oil seeds, 72%, cotton, 65%. Very significant production still comes from the rain-fed regions, and which if we give proper uh, uh, shift on investments to the dryland regions, rainfed areas, a significant change both in the climate and in the production can be brought. See, if you see how we dropped our agricultural contribution uh, uh, to 20.2 percent from 67 percent, which was there in 1950s. So, in spite of uh, this drop, uh, 50 percent of our 1.39 billion population still depend on the agriculture. So then the most important point that we need to look at it is that 85% of the smallholders with less than two hectares farm holding dominate the agriculture scene. And this is the area where we need to really focus. If we have to transform the agricultural system, this is the one which we need to take. So we are actually, uh, the science is extremely important. I never undermine the importance of the science, but the science directed towards these regions and in transforming agricultural food system is more important than continuing our high productive zones uh, focus should be brought down. If you see, we have the GM crops, we have bioinformatics, ICT and big data. The gene editing policy has come from India, very favorable policy. Biofortification is there, iron and zinc, and precision agriculture, use of drones, robotics, artificial intelligence, farm mechanization. But, uh, our land races are naturally rich with iron, zinc, and many other nutrition. Yield may be less. And also we have very high yielding, high quality farmer varieties are available in our natural resources in India. We need to spend more time to find out the existing land races and then bring them, which will bring the also uh, proper uh, uh, climate and uh, uh, the biotic uh, resilience can be brought with the help of the land races. So all these new technologies, how to make it more relevant to the rain-fed smallholder farmers? That's what we need to think. Is it possible that these new technologies can serve the rain-fed smallholders? So while we want to transform the Indian agri-food research and innovation system, it should be based on agroecology, but not high input intensive agriculture. We have done already, transformed our varieties, through genetics uh, as high put in intensive, it's now the time our farmer varieties and land races should be given due credit. Then uh, there are several options available. There's, whether you call it as nature inclusion agriculture, permaculture, biodynamics, or organic farming, or natural farming. In the natural farming also, there is, has been a shift from Subhash Pahalekar to zero budget to the AP community natural farming. They are more open to science-based evidence 
they are more open to not that the traditional technology alone should be revealed. Science-based evidence is given increasingly importance uh, for the AP community natural form. We actually, the conservation agriculture, regenerative agriculture are practiced very well, well-defined uh, technologies are available, which are part of natural form. And climate resilient agriculture, or you call it as a Korean or QZ natural farming, all these are based on 10 elements of agroecology, which is actually documented by FOIO. And it doesn't matter the name, what you call, it should be location specific and whatever agroecological principles are required to deal with the climate change. This is the best way, in my opinion, to move ahead. And if you see the natural farming, uh, we are much ahead of the rest of the world, I can say, the, particularly the Andhra Pradesh, 4.4 lakh farmers are practicing out of 6.2 lakhs registered for natural farming in an area of 4.5 lakh hectares covered in 3,000 gram panchayat. So this is a very big number, significant number, almost reaching about 10% by next year uh, of the total farm area as well as the number of farmers. And also the Andhra Pradesh government is leading to establish Indo-German Global Academy for Agroecology Research and Learning in Kadapa district. So this will develop the scientific evidence and whatever refinement of technology, science-based technology is required for the uh, natural farming, this institute will help. It will be a lighthouse project for the whole world. And it's not that Andhra Pradesh alone is doing, Himachal Pradesh, Gujarat, Haryana, Karnataka, and Kerala are also promoting natural farming. In Karnataka, I can say that 2,000 hectares uh, in different ecosystems, uh, natural farming is being uh, practiced uh, this year. The results will come. And we have the BPKP under the PKVY, uh, Bharati uh, Prakritik Krishi Padati, uh, is uh, uh, with around 4,000 crores covering uh, uh, 1.2 million hectares is the proposal that will be implemented. And then technology and innovation approach is different from the uh, modern agriculture to this natural farming, it is bottom up. It's actually practicing, reaping the benefit by the farmers, learning from the uh, ground level farm situation, and then developing science, science evidence, then scaling up. This is the way that uh, it is expected to go. There are, uh, if we follow the regenerative practices, 100% anthropogenic emissions of CO2 can be uh, really sequestered. So that is possible. And uh, this is the uh, global estimates. As you know, that uh, uh, there are uh, huge awards are also uh, uh, announced uh, for the uh, carbon dioxide fixation. And this approach is very good. There are two major principles in the natural farming that are being followed in Andhra Pradesh. One is pre-monsoon dry sowing, which is done in April, much before the rains will come. And then uh, if I remember, the university used to promote a technology Unless your 20 mm rainfall comes, please do not sow because repeated sowings were required. Now, with this technology of PMDS, this will take care of that. So, it will germinate because if these seeds are pelleted and they will be able to remain dormant and will only germinate when appropriate rainfall comes. There are not one crop, monocropping is shifted to polycropping. Several crops are sown, seeds are pelletized, and then uh, with three inches of mulch, which is well known, mulch to conserve the moisture and doing very well. This is the PMDS concept. And there is a 365 day green cover uh, that is uh, uh, also being practiced by a large number of farmers, particularly in Anantapur district. And uh, year long, even without uh, rains, we are able to clean the green cover and uh, hold the soil moisture that is received in the rainy season and able to maintain the green cover. And the relay cropping is also done. And 400 kg of uh, the uh, farmer uh, uh, prepared uh, input, that is Dhanajivamrutam, made with the dung. And here also, we are researching whether it is cow dung is required or any other dung also will really help. We are not fixed. Science-based evidence will be brought. And with these practices, you can see that it enhances the crop yield, microbial diversity is increased, nutritional security and livelihood automatically comes because the, uh, the energy is not from a single crop, but from several crops it is coming. You can see that uh, our biodiversity, carbon and land management 
to address these challenges, as already told by uh, the previous speakers and uh, Dr. Vilas also, our Bhumi, Niru, Vayu, Akasham and Agni. Agni is, uh, I interpret it as the sunlight and temperature. With all these things, uh, we are actually polluting, misusing, and to address these challenges, in my opinion, it is the, uh, uh, we can address the, all the three important SDGs, uh, hunger, poverty, and health, and also responsible consumption and production. All these principles are embedded if we follow the location-specific agroecological approach. We don't want uh, one month for the entire country. We want uh, the soils are different, rainfall is different, the environment is different, the crop diversity is different for that particular region. So we should come up with the location-specific agroecological technologies. That is the best uh, alternative. And uh, many people have apprehension that uh, if we promote this, uh, our food security may be at risk. So what I'm saying is, let us go from low input rain-fed agricultural areas, which uh, are uh, where we can increase the actually productivity of those lands, then we are not actually putting at risk the food security, but we are enhancing the food security. That's the kind of thing that is possible. And uh, can you believe this is Ananthapur? Ananthapur 360, 365D uh, green cover and uh, where Ananthapur is known to be the most drought prone area. And then we, this kind of productivity is possible there by following the natural farming technologies and uh, seeing is believing. So my request is uh, that the a small uh, team of Kappa can really visit Ananthapur, which is highly relevant to the Karnataka also. The policy recommendation already, India is actually highly favorable for the natural farming policy. And in the Karnataka, which is a just neighboring state for the Anantapur, it's just possible that uh, look at the results and see yourself and, uh, and help in developing the scientific evidence and spread it so that we address a practical problem instead of a theoretical uh, and then high productive zone oriented research may be shifted to bottom-up approach. And uh, th that's why I say that the farmers don't have the luxury of working from home. If you want to see what they are doing, you have to visit them and look at the uh, in the field what is happening, validate it and use it. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Konopi and the Kappa for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity. And uh, if you develop uh, too many recommendations, uh, it will not be viable and implementable. Please uh, make it very focused uh, best is not more than five. And uh, this uh, is one of the recommendations which is now conducive from the national level as well as at the state level. This could be one of them. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity. I Thank, you, sir. Thank you very much. I think we will have a better action plans rather than the suggestions we would like to give. So as uh, Ashok Dalwai's presentation said last time in the previous day, that uh, the action plans and the components need to be defined very clearly. That's how implementations for suggestions could be possible. So we will take into account, sir. Then when we develop the document, uh, definitely we will share with all and we will have the input ever to it with you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, Namaste, Varupasad Garo. Ah, namaste, Namaste. Thank you. Okay. Ah, fine, fine. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, now we will go to the next presentation by Dr. A.R. Sadananda. So plant breeding research needs to address the climate change. So uh, Dr. Yellan. I request Dr. Malati to please uh, introduce the speaker, Dr. Sadananda, sir. Thank you, sir. We are privileged to introduce Dr. A.R. Sadananda. Dr. Sadananda has over 43 years of experience in the seed industry. His responsibilities included technology and research management, plant breeding, product development, and seed systems management. He has worked both in public and private organizations and has managed R&D business units for several multinational and Indian seed companies. Till recently, Dr. Sadananda was associated with the International Center for Maize and Wheat Improvement at Kathmandu and Hyderabad as main seed system specialist for Asia. Following superannuation, he is presently pursuing consultancy activities. 
Dr. Sadananda obtained BSc and MSc in genetics and plant breeding from UAS Bangalore and PhD in genetics from the Indian Agricultural Research Institute. He was a postdoctoral scientist, Rockefeller Fellow at the University of Georgia. He also completed a diploma in business management from Cornell University and IGNO. Dr. Sadananda has published about 49 research papers and four technical bulletins and contributed for the development of about 47 crop cultivars and was recognized for the development of high yielding basmati cultivars by the government of India in 2009. With that, we are delighted to welcome you, sir. Thank you all. <clears throat> Thank you all. Can I share the presentation, please? Yes, sir. Go to the full slide, view, sir. Yeah. Yeah. It's fine, sir. You can go ahead. Okay. okay. You can see that, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Vilas and uh, uh, Kappa for uh, giving me this opportunity. And uh, friends, we have heard uh, many distinguished speakers since yesterday elucidating the impact of climate change concerns in general and uh, agriculture, and, and I mean general and in agriculture in particular, and policy issues, et cetera. You have also heard Dr. Venkatram on the impact of CC on seed industry yesterday. Uh, today from uh, my co-panelists, you have also heard about impact of climate change on, uh, on uh, food and nutritional security. Today, after my talk also, you will also know from other eminent scientists some of the key adaptation and uh, mitigation strategies. One such strategy is breeding for climate resilient uh, cultivars. That's what I'm going to cover. Uh, to capture some of the key issues of CC, I mean, related agriculture, you know, um, you have uh, heard a lot of people talking about it from yesterday. Climate change is a threat. It's known. I mean, it's uh, undeniable a global security due to reduction in crop productivity. And uh, many regions throughout the world experience uh, heat, um, drought, flooding, frost, etc. Climate change elevates uh, global temperature, which is one of the main uh, uh, worries for us. And though, uh, you know, the impact of climate changes have crop production has been studied extensively. Uh, has been uh, talked to you, I mean, has been elucidated yesterday very vehemently by Dr. Gouda and others. Although some of the research and modeling studies indicate rising levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide at least partially upset harmful effects of uh, heat and drought, data is far from consistent. So there is, you know, a bit of an anti-synergistic effect and, you know, some of these things we have to look into. And this is what I'm going to uh, and highlight further. Furthermore, the many models neglect harmful effects of rising night temperature, heat shocks, unstable rainfall pattern, and nutritional factors for which there is no evidence of amelioration by elevated carbon dioxide. And uh, there are, I mean, as you all know, C3 plants are much more uh, prone to this type of uh, impact than others. So CO2, hence complex and, and you know, uh, so climate uh, you know, crop model project projections of loss do vary. However, all of them indicate definite and substantial loss in productivity with increased temperature, especially impact in high post flowering phase. Wheat, you know, there's a, I mean, as been told from yesterday, maize, wheat and rice and sorghum. I mean, I've indicated some of the uh, losses per increase in per, per uh, degree centigrade increase. And these are very depending on what uh, the model you take it. Coming to wheat, uh, you know, as you yesterday also heard, this is a practical experience. We have, this year we have experienced in India where due to high temperature in March, uh, April, not only grains were shriveled, but uh, you know, generally yields were reduced substantially. Yesterday, Dr. Krishna Kumar also informed us that Horticultural crops, especially fruits and vegetables, are highly sensitive to 
you know, climate change. Now, what are these core stress? As illustrated by preceding speakers, heat is the key crop stress. You know, the principal climatic factor affecting crop as is right extreme heat and which also drives water stress. The temperature sensitive crops is dependent on what crops growth stage, time of the day and time of the year. This is not, you know, you can't take it as you know, one parameter. Water deficit and temperature extremes influence reproductive phase of plant growth, especially anthesis and early grain filling is become a very critical thing. In cereals, water stress badly affects flower initiation and also inflorescence in, uh, you know, and then stress also affects seed production and seed quality. This is what we, yesterday we, uh, Dr. Bupen Dube was talking about. You know, seed production, which is mainly concentrated in drabi season, we are going to have a high impact here because high temperature during flowering and seed filling stage not only affects the, you know, influences the yield, but also the processing quality. You know, you get the good seed quality becomes lesser. And uh, I think uh, Vilas and others who are uh, experts in seed uh, uh, science, they know that the high temperature affect the seed quality, which is a very critical component for seed industry because it affects seed germination, viability, vigor, seed health, and appearance, even size, safe weight, and other things. So decrease in seed size problem during seed processing is a bigger issue. So hence, um, you know, climate change will have a greater impact on seed production and hence also on seed supply in the future. And um, there are many factors affect crop growth. It says, uh, unfortunately, stress factor does not occur independently, adding a new complexity on the impact of uh, climate change. Natural vegetation, even highly managed crops often encounter multiple stresses as it I mean, in the right side of the slide, you can see there are a lot of uh, uh, biotic, climatic, anthropogenic, and soil factors which affect the overall plant growth. And for, unfortunately, the opposing pathways get triggered in plants during stress combinations. So this is a very critical thing, what we need to really have to see. As an example, I'm giving it here, stromatal regulation. Stromatal regulation, which is a key physiological phenomena for uh, you know, climate resilience, while heat stress causes stomata to open so that plant can cool themselves by transpiration, drought stress induces stomata to closer. I mean, this is, this, is, this is a reality thing what is happening. So drought pathways overcome heat pathways. You know, suddenly the, the thing, things keep changing. A recent study found that although stomata on leaves close during combination of drought and heat stress, stomata and flowers remain open and flowers can maintain transpiration, cooling reproductive phase, and acclim acclimatization strategy termed as differential transpiration. And these are certain, you know, very, very new things which are coming up. So which, which, which may make us to think what are those, you know, uh, factors which we have to consider. So from simple combination uh, to multiple stress is the one which you need to focus and um, uh, I mean, this is what is important rather than focusing on a particular combination or a particular, uh, say, a, a, a factor which in uh, you know, basically drought or water stress or anything, we really have to look in the combination effects uh, because, you know, uh, and then multiple stresses have a differential responses too, as I was indicating to you, the effect of one stress may be dominant to the others. In such cases, what happens? You know, we can't take anything in isolation, you know, especially when you look at agriculture, when you look at crop growth, crop growth, crop growth cannot be taken in isolated, uh, trait-based, uh, you know, characterization. Different stresses can have a synergistic as well as antagonistic effects on each other. This is something which we need to really look at it. Many studies have revealed a synergistic effect, the example, a combination of drought and heat on plant growth, whereas it was also found that two different stresses may have an antagonistic effect on each other. During drought combined with ozone or pathogen infection, drought causing stomatogosa that prevents ozone and pathogen from entering the plant. So there are the other things which can happen. During high order stress combinations involving three or more stresses, 
many unique genes are deregulated or upregulated, while some classical pathway genes are suppressed. So some of these new findings gives you a real, in a way, I call it as a nightmare to, you know, to conclude or you know, to, uh, for a researcher to simply make a conclusions on his uh, you know, uh, parameters. It was also found that there was synergistic interaction between multiple low level stresses. You know, this is also an equally important one. While each of the different stress applied individually to plants had a negligible effect on plant growth and survival, but with the increase in the number and complexity of stresses combined together, plant growth and survival has declined. So while one or, one or even two low level stresses may have no significant impact on crops, Adding a low level of one or two additional stresses could cause the unexpected and dramatic decline and yield our ecosystem health. So, you know, I, I, why I'm putting that is, you know, we have to really have to look at holistically the impact of climate change rather than taking each of the components and then do upstream. I mean, a lot of research is going, I mean, that's a good thing about it. So basically look at this particular thing which I've borrowed from a recent publications on impact of multi, factorial stress combinations. You see, I mean, basically you can see many factors not only have a direct effect, but also have an indirect effect. Some are, we, uh, I know, it's energistic, but some are the antigenistic uh, effect. In this, uh, you know, red is a negative impact and blue is a positive. You can see a couple of them have negative impact. I mean, high, most of them have negative impact, but few of them have positive impact. The bigger circle have more pronounced effect as the smaller ones have less pronounced effect. This is just an example on how a different, you know, combinations can affect the crop growth, I mean, crop growth. And what we have really have to look at, you see, as in, in agriculture or as related to crops, we look at crop, not look at traits of a crop. We look at a particular crop. So the, we have to really have to look at many of these in, in in, in a holistic way. See, some of the stress combinations are also found to have a synergistic effect on one plant species and antagonistic effect on different plant species. I'm, I'm bringing it here because, you know, we can't just have a conclusion based on certain studies on across the crops. A combination of heat and salinity has a synergistic effect on Arabidopsis, while the same stress combination had an antagonistic effect on tomato. Similarly, multiple diabetic stresses applied simultaneously in elicit distinct responses in two different rice cultivars. This is another dimension to that. You can't even, rice cannot be considered as in, in total. Rice species, because they, they have taken here one drought tolerant uh, rice and one other Nippon Baro, which is one of the famous rice varieties, and they found the responses are entirely different. So translation responses to combined biotic stresses could differ qualitatively from the responses of the individual stresses. So multiple stresses elicit an independent translated response, which is more than the sum, simple sum of responses to individual stresses. So basically dimension, you know, what we are looking at is multidimensional factors influenced by CC has put enormous challenge on plant breeders as pressure to develop climate resilient crop cultivars, which were, it can withstand multi-dimensional stresses by adaptive strategies, including next generation breeding approaches. You know, this is where the, I mean, there is a lot of challenge to the plant breeder in developing crop cultivars. See, as you have heard yesterday also, though, the, though breeding cultivars is the most potent option as uh, elucidated, you know, based on the meta-analysis, you know, it was concluded that the cultivar improvement was the most effective method of adaptation. However, genetic gain must increase substantially to match the many challenges because the present genetic gains will not be sufficient to meet the challenges of the, the climate change. Incorporating technological advancements into plant breeding options, you know, has to be done through high investment, heavy investment and strategic implementation to get these type of gains. Breeders are faced with the problem, uh, you know, of ensuring their varieties meet the local needs of the grower while also providing sufficiently broad adaptation. This is what Dr. Murli Krishna was talking about in the morning. We need to, you know, farmer-oriented products rather than, you know, research-oriented uh, outputs. 
So breed the but to develop germplasm that incorporates numerous other tries to meet multiple needs of growers, such as you know we have to have disease resistance, quality, and everything. In addition to that, we need to bring in this type of additional tries to to make that acceptable to the farmer. Have a balance between consumer acceptance, adaptation, yield stability. This becomes a real challenge. Though breeding. You know, which is a critical for adoption at the farm level, as uh, Dr. Jack Hughes yesterday said, farmers are super conservative. So farmers are, hence, since the farmers are super conservative, it is not that easy to take any technology. I mean, any product. I'm talking about product here, not technology per se. The product, which is the product, which, which is the result of the technology, to be to get adopted from him, unless he adopts it, it has no me. I mean, basically, no meaning. So the one of the most difficult challenges is to select under restricted range of breeding environments, you know, outstanding new cultivar that will be adapted to much wider generic environments. As most of you know, we have a phenomenon called genotype into environmental interaction. This is something which every plant breeder, sub, I mean, faces in every trials or any new germplasm he brings in, because in the GE. And now we also have an another company oh, called. Uh, oh, the last one. You know, there is another component which has been now called as G, G into E into M, the management, which is the in the hands of the farmer. So basically, you know, these are the ones where we can't control climate and soil. But most of the things, pest and diseases, you know, uh, we have been able to control it because of our present technologies. Climate and soil cannot be controlled. So this is where uh, we have a problem. You know, we have we don't know what is actually happening. So the as elucidated in my earlier uh, talk, I mean, just multiple factoral stress is a big contributor and a challenge. And upstream regions has to take into consideration if any di discovery has to be adopted by the plant breeders. So, because you know, precision phenotyping is a cornerstone, as we have been, I mean, I'm stressing it further. So, elucidation of a different stress profiles that a crop must adapt to in terms of its phen phenological development, because this is where the crop the impact happens. It not happen for the whole crop period, but in a different crop growing period, like probably, po I mean, anthesis and uh, post anthesis period. So, we really have to find out what are those things, what are the Key, key uh, you know factors and what are how how do we handle that? So bottleneck there is exists a bottleneck between upstream discovery research and crop improvement breeding per se is widespread. And um, this is with the bottom of my heart in selling many of the technologies, many of the publications. You see plenty of publications coming up, but you know adoption. This what uh, Dr. Murli Krishna was talking about in the morning. The product, I mean, the science has to be converted. I mean, here the thought, has, the knowledge has to be converted into a product, or the science has to be converted into a technology. I mean, there is a big gap between these. And of course, we have been able to yeah, bridge the gap, but uh, the gap is still wide, very much wider. So, as it uh, appears, you know, as was mentioned. There, uh, it is apparent from scientific literature that many promising climate resilient discoveries are not translated into breeding technologies because, because many of them doesn't have proof of concept. See, they would have uh, done it for publication or a particular thing. They have not been, uh, you know, done it at the ground level to really see what what the conclusion is really correct or not. Is need to combine recent climate resilience research activities with the tested breeding methods to see whether, I mean, this can be translated into a products. Very few scientists are involved in applied research space in which pro proofs of concept of climate resilient technologies are rigorously tested in the breeding context. See, we are basically, unfortunately, working in silos and then this really needs, but fortunately, many of these uh, things are now narrowing down the CGR system has developed, I mean, doing uh, a, a good work in bringing all these, uh, you know, uh, upstream and, uh, researchers into a downstream, I mean, together with the plant breeders to really get into a product range. So 
the main critical factor here is uh, adequate proof of concept. See, Professor, I mean, yesterday also, Mr. Venkatram of Seedworks also talked about connect to the disconnects. I mean, this is what is one of the important things what you really have to do it. The bridging the gap and working in coordinated way is the very key for the success of translating some of these promising uh, uh, knowledge into products. So basically I'm getting into what happens with the climate uh, change and the plant breeding, what are the, some of the key objectives as, this is not mine, this is elucidated by a top weed breeding team of CIMET. Uh, you know, CIMET team gave up, uh, the, I mean, indicated uh, this particular thing, uh, these are the objectives they have. Improving the improving definition of target environments using deep learning of big data sets to better design and deploy cultivars encompassing the appropriate adaptive traits, adopting phenomic and genomic technologies to multiple uses from accessing untapped genetic resources through parental and progeny screening to genetic discovery, accelerating genetic gains under a harsher climate through refinement adoption of new breeding techniques. The requirements, very clear characterization of what is required both from product and market needs and cost-effective breeding accessible selection tools. And this is where most of these studies have not been helpful because you know um, too expensive or not uh, easily available to a wider uh, you know, breeding uh, uh, people. The selection tools can phenotypic and genotypic technologies are now getting developed, but it also has to be accompanied by statistical method to predict phenotyping performance. Phenotyping is a, as, a, as indicated earlier, is a cornerstone for plant breeding. So multi environment testing of advanced progeny of confirming that germplasm carries a package of desired age is the key element in success. So we need the development of advanced bioinformatics and utilization for predicting the breeding values of uh, whatever uh, uh, you know, improvements we make. So then what is, what is about the defining target? Defining the target environment and critical, and critical factors at key phenological stages is important for designing breeding program. Unless we know this, we, breeders cannot design what, what, how they want to do and how they want to tackle the problem they have in face. Here, hence we need uh, the active support of uh, modeling, precision phenotyping tools, and you know, the way, I mean, all these things has to come together uh, to you know to work together to uh, you know define the target and start working on this. So defining traits. Similarly, crop growth development and grain yields are resulted cumulative influence of complex interactions between environment factors and crop traits. So this is what I was talking about: multiple uh, multifactorial thing. Crop simulation to agronomic, phenological, and physiological data plus metadata can be used to predict optimum phenology and growth pattern of a crop under different heat and drought stress profiles. Determine which traits are more sensitive to GE and interaction and which environmental factors are driving the interactions. This will help us to design our breeding strategy and then work for a successful breeding program, to have a successful breeding program. So, the genetic resources and basically, you know, Dr. Varaprasa just now, uh, you know, elucidated the uh, the problems, you know, of the genetic resources. And yesterday, also, Dr. Krishna Kumar talked about the importance of genetic resources to meet uh, climatic change. We definitely, I mean, basically, as a plant breeder or as a plant breeding community, plant breeders are involved in crossing good by good a strategy that you know, results in continuing loss of genetic diversity, which was uh, talked about by others. Breeding targets focused on yield and quality have often left behind many traits, which, uh, which has been highlighted. But what happens is characterization, so therefore the characterizations unadapted while germplasm of traits important to modern agriculture has its own challenges. Because we have been told that, you know, there are so many number of cultivars, so many things are available. What happens in the actual uh, field level is that phenology of wild germplasm may be out of sync with the locally adopted checks, making the timing of stress treatments and direct comparison with adopted germplasm a problematic issue. 
There are also a possibility that constitutive stress adapted could be negatively impact the yield, which has been uh, very commonly said. Uh, you know, most of these are uh, uh, trades are good enough, but you know, when they are they are actually neutral to yield. So this is a problem which we have. So there's a you know, all you of uh, all of you who are uh, familiar with that have been known linkage drag is one of the most common problem which we face because the breeders have struggled enough to bring it to a yield level to a certain level. And if you are bringing in something new, it will pull down that. But of course, the uh, linkage drag from less domestic reduces the efficient integration of novel genomic regions. A combination of genotypic and phenotyping profiling of genetic resources is, a, is an important thing at, at this moment for utilization, though uh, we have been told that so much is available. Yes, it is available, but how do we use it? For designing classes more, more emphatically or more clearly, make use of untested genetic resources. Genetics and physiological understanding must be underpinned by rigorous phenotyping. We can't just take it, uh, you know, for a few uh, trials here and there and say that this is drought tolerant, this is that, this. But you really have to have a sound data to show that they are really good sources for us to take up. There's a going into exploring new approaches for deploying genetic diversity. I think uh, this is what uh, probably Dr. Vaishnai will be touching upon in his uh, talk. How do we utilize uh, some of these new modern technologies for utilizing this? Coming to this, uh, novel genes are paramount as it's as it been uh, in indicated, but breeders are, and as uh, are very quite conservative and about utilizing pre-bred material as sources of resistance. As I told you, we have a problem because uh, linkage, see we have, uh, most of the breeders have developed varieties which have developed, which have come up with some genetic advance with, with, their exp with a lot of effort. And you know, they don't want to break up the useful linkage block present in the present one. So bringing in another string and breaking that will be a big task. And I think it's, it will be resisted by most of the breeders. Therefore, the success depends on even, not only for the genetic stock per se, even the methods, you know, many of the methods have been talked about uh, for incorporation of genetic, uh, you know, uh, genes and those things. But what happens if selection of heat and drought adaptive traits is not confounded by simultaneous selection for good agronomic traits? You know, we you see agronomic traits ha has to be the, there is no compromise on that. You know, it has to be the base. Then when we, when we are doing our, most of these studies, sometimes we do find so agronomic base goes for a toss. The same thing, you know, there are a lot of talk about uh, rapid generation advancement. There are a lot of questions being asked about what happens with the, with the already having, I mean, good agronomic base in this thing. You know, when you select for a trite or anything in these RGAs, what happens to the agronomic base? So it needs some clarity on possible impacts of all the both only the resource, genetic resources, but also the, the gene tools which are going to, or the, the new tools which are going to come up. So basically, as, as, as I've been emphasizing, to be successful in incorporating trials for climate resilience, phenotyping, what is known as precision phenotyping is a primary requirement. So we really don't have enough of, uh, you know, uh, this this technology, I mean, this uh, skill, especially for the what you call as abiotic stresses, for the success for uh, the good for the good year, I mean, effort of uh, last twenty, I mean, last uh, almost uh, 50, 60 years of uh, the green revolution era, we have some control over the biotic stresses, especially insect and pests. We have a good screening methodology, but as far as uh, abiotic stressors, then there is no, I mean, good phenotyping technologies exist. So though there are now new explosion in field phenotyping technologies have come up, but <coughs> we really need to intensify the methodology using remote sensing, crop sensor-based approaches. And there are a lot of things which are coming up. You know, this is a good development, but this need to be tested and then to be used by that. However, for a functional pipeline to be implemented, Clear protocols must be established. This is where most of the uh, you know things we find it difficult because you know large scale when you get into the screening breeding populations or 
for elite lines we do find difficulty in adopting most of the protocols which have been i know uh, published including precise phenotype protocol that consider you know at, at different crop growth stages so unfortunately most breeding programs are handicapped by this you know i mean the this particular tool and many of us starts using the business as usual we do screen uh, wherever possible but you know we don't uh, conclude or we take i mean conclusions or selections based on what we observed this is what uh, yesterday as venkatram was talking about these are all you know there is a guess guesswork going on so but then finally we dependent on the nature to select for us this has to go i mean this is one of our problem this has to be reduced but a lot of effort is going on to reduce this because the complexity of uh, triads and complexity of problems we are handling is much more and we don't understand those complexities we understand individual components fine but we don't understand the as a group as a thing what happens at the ground level so two other factors which have become critical in multifactorial stresses uh, as well as objective of sustainable agriculture is one of the thing is rhizosphere has been discussed uh, earlier i mean by mentioned by many of the uh, you know scientists especially in the morning we have talked about uh, soil as a you know as an important thing so plant both plant genotype and not have a strong effects on composition of soil microbiome microbiome and this is what yesterday also was talked about and you know uh, there is a talk about uh, screening for uh, root vigor and depth which is you know which we can utilize it for uh, the soil uh, impacts but that there are not many good uh, technologies existing even plant growth promoting uh, technology means i am talking about technology here is protocols to screen you know there are uh, technologies there but you know usable protocols are very very few plant growth promoting rhizobacteria has been shown to enhance plant resilience to stress uh, which we also got some uh, uh, information you know some talked about in the morning and there's a considerable in interest in unraveling the role of rhizosphere microbi microbiota in crop performance but basically genotype traits such as root architecture turnover exudate composition which has a very widely within with, these very widely within species and also directly affect the population size and composition of rhizosphere microbia these are certain complexities which we have so how do we find tech, i mean the methodology or methods to screen for this recent findings suggest that drought stress plants are alter their composition of root exudates to increase microbial activity so there is some other mitigation inbuilt mitigation mechanism exists in the plant so also we need to take into consideration in this so there is one more thing another opportunity is capturing enhanced carbon dioxide due to you know due to climate change there are all plant species variation existing in that there is as you all know c3 c4 exists and then even within the see so, you know there are a lot of work going on to show that within the species also there is a variability existing and whether we can encash it on this so i mean there is an example which is coming up uh, a plate is the selection for weedy biotypes in rice and oat you know a lot of uh, work i mean some reports are coming from uh, japan and other places where they show that the the weeds have developed you know their competency of en enhancing carbon dioxide capturing and they have become a big problem to crop growth so when weeds can uh, you know capture and develop their genotype i mean their own plant type uh, to overcome en enhance carbon dioxide there is a possibility for other crop plants also to do that this is an opportunity which exists so breeding for carbon credit has been taken up by some programs yesterday Uh, bupen was talking about carbon credit and then this is some many of the seed companies and you know the breeding programs have started how how do we encash on the carbon credit uh, opportunity which is business opportunity which exists and which we can utilize it 
See, basically, as a breeder, we are more important uh, how to sustain genetic gain in the primary goal of the breeder. I mean, this is our ma major concern. To accelerate variety development and population improvement in the currently changing climate scenario, there are some approaches which have been suggested. Basically, population improvement using uh, some of the modern technologies, which I, I, I am sure that Dr. Raju uh, will be provide more insight into this exciting area of research and also using up for RGA. Uh, though I told you there are some li limitations, but these are certain new things which are coming up and there are a lot of work going on to, to reduce those limitations going on. And genomic assisted breeding, you know, basically uh, uh, is, an, is a new area where a lot of uh, uh, discoveries and a lot of knowledge has been enhanced, including uh, market selection, market assisted backcrossing, genomic selection, and uh, in the morning, we're talking about some uh, of genome editing. There are, uh, I mean, good silver lining coming up in this particular thing. And as you all know, uh, Government of India has said uh, certain uh, uh, techn techniques in GM, uh, gene editing is non-GMO. So this has opened up a big new opportunity for the plant breeders to utilize this. Now, uh, to conclude, Crop model projects uh, shall show that without adoption to climate change yields will reduce substantially. The principal climatic factor affecting crop production uh, is extreme heat, which in terms drives water stress. Natural vegetation and evenly highly managed crops often encounter multiple stress simultaneously and cause a state of multifactorial state combinations. Different stresses we have a synergistic and antagonistic effects on, for each other. So they are not as simple as we think of. Some stress combinations were found to have synergistic effect on one plant species and antagonistic on another. And even within the same, uh, you know, within, between the two varieties are different, different genotypes in the same crop. Cultivar improvement was the most effective method of adapt, adaptation strategy. Breeders are faced with the problem of ensuring their varieties meet the local needs of growers while also providing sufficiently broad adaptation uh, for climatic uh, change. This is a big challenge which we have. Phenotyping is a cornerstone for plant breeding. There has been explosion in phenotyping, but many of those uh, protocols are yet to be easily handled or available for breeders to easily handle. And then elucidation of different state profiles is still is not clear, not completed. And uh, there are problems with the using uh, unadapted wild germplasm in the breeding program. And this is a big challenge, which uh, uh, there are solutions, but you know, they, these solutions are taking, uh, uh, I mean, these are the ones which make breeders to be little hesitant to taking up uh, the wild germplasm or, uh, or uh, you know, un unused germplasm or what you call as a pre-breeding germplasm uh, into in the real, gen in their breeding programs. So, Lack of adequate proof of concepts of both knowledge as well as techniques is one of the major concern for uh, you know uh, for the plant breeder because they have not been tested against the breeding context. And in uh, multifactorial impact gap is discovery and translation of breeding plans and coordinated approach by all concerned is a key to translate discovery into impact at field level. Yesterday, Dr. Jack Hughes said emphasize the importance of genuine multidisciplinary approach. Because you know, we really have to come back to the Green Revolution coordinated project era, but here the coordinated project has to be more focused on, on the climatic uh, change factors, basically in abiotic stresses and building all those necessary uh, infrastructure to screen. And then also, you know, basically what happens is we need to, a coordinated approach, emphasis on precision phenotyping for abiotic stresses, like uh, you know what happened during Green Revolution era of pest for pest and diseases. Recommend practices combining both adaptive and, uh, and uh, mitigation practices. I would say that when you don't need to resolve everything through varieties, but you know we have uh, the, a lot of good mitigation practices. As earlier it should have the POP, the package of practices. Same way we should combine both adaptive as well as mitigation practices uh, for uh, handling the crops. 
this is what I want to say, and I finally I thank Kappa and IMR for giving me this opportunity, and all of you for patient listening. Thank you all, and I'm happy to take any questions, and you can also write to me for my for any clarifications. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, so I think uh, uh, we we don't have try time for question and answer sessions. Probably people uh, can really uh, connect to Dr. Sadananda. Uh, and also because you have listed whole set of issues uh, to be which are researchable and also uh, in the light of climate change, what we need to address, sir. And I think we can connect back uh, uh, on these particular issues on a separate platform, looking at what research needs to be prioritized and taken up further. So thank you very much, sir. And uh, now we will move quickly. So today's... Entire sessions will be running back to back. There is no lunch break because people are attending from home. You can grab your lunch on your table and still you can listen to everyone. So Raju, welcome from Perth. So thank you very much for thank joining. You, so Good afternoon, sir. How are you, sir? Yeah, very fine. Thank you so much. So have you adjusted there now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Doing fine. Thank you, sir. Right, right. Wonderful to have you. So the lecture will be on genomic tools to address climate change scenario to ensure food and nutrition security. So before uh, we give the floor for addressing us to Rajiv, I request Jinu Jacob to kindly introduce uh, Rajiv Varshne. Yes, sir. It's our honor and privilege to welcome Professor Rajiv Varshne, International Chair in Agriculture and Food Security, Murdoch University, Australia. Dr. Vashni has an admirable and stellar CV, and I will be reading out some of the major highlights. <laughs> you don't need to read it. Professor Vashni is an agricultural research scientist specializing in genomics and molecular breeding with over 20 years of service in developing countries in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. He has just started new roles as Director, State Agricultural Biotechnology Center, and Director, Center for Crop and Food Innovations with Murdoch University. Prior to joining this university, Professor Vashni served ICRISAC as a research program director of Accelerated Crop Improvement Program and director of Center of Excellence in Genomics and Systems Biology. Professor Vashni is a globally recognized leader for his work on genome sequencing, genomics assisted breeding, and translational genomics and capacity building in developing countries. He has made centrally important contributions towards improving food and nutritional security in India and Africa by developing key genomic resources in major orphan tropical crops such as PGNP, chickpea, groundnut, and permillet. His programs have delivered 11 superior crop varieties to some of the world's poorest farmers. Professor Vashni is a highly prolific author and a highly cited researcher. He's the youngest agricultural scientist and fourth Indian to achieve an H index of more than 100. He is the recipient of several noted awards including the most coveted science award, Shanti Suru Bhatnagar Award, and the most prestigious agriculture science award, Rafi Ahmed Kidwai Award. Recently, ICRISAT won the 2021 Africa Food Prize for the outputs and impact of tropical legume projects led by Professor Vashni as principal investigator for seven years. So we find ourselves extremely privileged to hear from you on the topic of genomic tools to address climatic change scenario to ensure food and nutrition security. Yeah, Raju, so the floor is yours, sir. So Thank maybe, you very much. Yeah, uh, so 45 minutes would be good enough for you, sir? Yes, sir, yes, sir. So even half oh. minute, yeah, so that would Thank be good. You. Thank you very much. So hopefully that you can see my slides. Let me do it just a minute. Yes, sir. So you can see my slides? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, sir. Okay, good. So before that, let me thank uh, Dr. Vilas Tonapi, Director IIMR, mm -hmm. for his kind uh, invitation. And I'm thankful to IIMR and Kappa for inviting me for this talk. I saw many senior people, friends, collaborators in this meeting. So greetings to all of them from Perth. In India, you are having hot weather. In Perth, we are having very cold weather. So right now, 12 degrees Celsius temperature. So you can see I'm wearing that jacket. <laughs> so this is because we are in the Southern Hemisphere. Anyway, and also greetings to everyone. And I was very happy to see Dr. C.L.L. Gauda also in this meeting. And I think many other senior 
colleagues and well wishers. So thanks and greetings to everyone. So as I have moved to, to Perth and here I am um, uh, working for the two centers, Center for Crop and Food Innovation and the State Agriculture Biotechnology Center. So I would like to highlight briefly about uh, uh, our work, what we are doing, but uh, let me see, sorry, yeah. So here in the Food Futures Institute, we have three centers, Center for Crop and Food Innovation, Center for Animal Production and Health. This is related to the animal and livestock thing. And the other one is Center for Sustainable Farming System. And out of these three centers, which are the part of the Food Futures Institute, I'm leading the Center for Crop and Food Innovation. Very briefly, what, what the center is about. So basically through this center or this center capitalizes and new technology and investment in crop agriculture provides both strength and depth to undertake research on major broad acre and horticultural crops to improve yield quality and enhance tolerance and protection from biological and environmental stresses. And this covers all various cutting edge R&D technology in agri-biotechnology, agri-technology and food technology. And what we do in this center, we work to keep farmers competitive in the world marketplace and undertakes research in crop genomics, bioinformatics, genetics, transgenics, gene editing, molecular biology and physiology, soil and water management, new agriculture technology, including remote sensing and robotics and the developing areas of food technology. So we are having several leading research groups affiliated to the center. And if you would like to see the major themes of our center, so we are having basically six major themes and our lead researchers, they are part of the different themes. They are delivering on the different aspects. And one of the key theme is crop production. So we enhance the crop productivity by using the modern genomics, biotechnology and crop breeding tools. The other important area is crop quality because not only the productivity for us here in Australia, quality is also very, very important. And the other area is crop protection and biosecurity. And here we are talking about this biotic stresses and also about this pathogen invasion in the country. So the biosecurity aspect. Fourth theme is related to food technology, which is more related to the horticultural crops that how we can enhance the quality of the food through these crops. And also the another important area is innovative products and systems. And lastly, about the pathways to impact, which is more dealing with this gene editing technology and also the policy issues, etc. So these are the different areas in our center. And the other center which I'm leading, and this is about the Western Australian State Agricultural Biotechnology Center. And this center is a collaborative university center for all different universities in Western Australia. So agricultural and veterinary biotechnology universities in Western Australia and also the State Department of Agriculture. It provides platform technologies and the world-class equipment and facilities for R&D in agricultural biotechnology to researchers from all different universities, state governments, and industry department. And our vision is being eminent internationally recognized center for research and development. And as I said, so we are having basically more technological platform. So that's what we are doing. And through my chair, I keep on working with international organizations so that how we can contribute in towards agriculture and food security. So now coming to the topic, and uh, I was hearing some talks from time to time, and I think this, this uh, conference or webinar is very timely and very topical subject. And now when we talk about this climate change and agriculture food security, I think before that we can see that, and we all are aware that at present, there are five global challenges in the world at interest level. And one of them is that feed the increasing world population. And you can see that, well, this number keeps on increasing. So we need to provide the calories as well as other nutrition, including the proteins, micronutrients, etc. We need to provide, we need to meet projected energy demands. We need to manage the greenhouse gases, because when we talk about agriculture, they're also important contributor to the climate change. So we need to see that how we can manage and we need to adapt to the climate change and variability. And we also need to preserve the natural ecosystem and biodiversity. We were having very good talks a few minutes back from Dr. Vara Prasad that he presented very nicely and maintain global security and agriculture plays a very important role. 
now we have heard from the different uh, researchers and uh, policy makers even yesterday we had really good talks many talks good talks and when we talk about the impact of the climate change and then there are already documented stories and research studies etc and they say that by 2030 nine out of the 10 major crops will enhance will experience reduced stagnant growth rates and this includes those important crop maize rice wheat etc so price will also be increased when this will be the impact now not only at international level even in india there are several groups who have provided that uh, documentation that what kind of impact we will have on the indian agriculture from the climate change and then this based on these different studies and this is one of some of one of few studies or so one of several of those studies which show that wheat yield will be reduced, rain fed rice yield will be going down and not only that one on the different commodity crops also we will have that impact. So this is that issue of the climate change and now when we are talking about the food security if you see the hunger map coming from the world food program of the 2021 this clearly shows that still at present around 811 million people around the world they are not getting sufficient food and one into 10 people do not get enough to eat the worst part is that 25000 people including more than 10000 children die from hunger and related causes every day kind of thing and hunger is also on the rise in the western asia so and climate and also there are lots of conflict right now we know russia and ukraine war so this is also making the impact so i think there are a lot of issues related to the food security and we also need to make the color of india towards the green color because if you see these different scale that these are the countries where we are having 15 to 24 percent 25 percent population undernourished we need to change this color we also heard from dr bhandari also very nice talk in a few minutes back so i think we need to bring this color also changed color in the context of india but also in many other countries around the world so now and so the, we were talking about food security but now when you talk about the nutrition security and worst part is that even the countries like india even the urban population we are having the issues of the protein deficiency and not only that many times we do not know that we are having the protein deficiency so i think this is also a big problem for getting the protein we all know that protein we can get from the animal protein through the meat or so or we can get the plant protein so and we need to have the protein sufficiency in our body i don't care that from which source this is coming but now if you would like to see from the environmental sustainability perspective when you are talking from the greenhouse perspective water footprints in the on this planet then we need to see that probably we need to think more to get these proteins from the plants and this is about that and not only that that recently we also have published one uh, analysis together with several colleagues who are involved in the human health including dr r Hemlata from the national institute of nutrition and here we have summarized that even not talk that even at the issue about the micronutrients like iron or so that what kind of issues in the country we are having from this anemia and then this is really that area that government is working a lot but still we need to do more so we are we need to struggle we need to overcome the problem of this burden of anemia so there are a lot of issues now all of us different disciplines either this is agriculture or medical science or different areas they are trying to tackle all these issues but being agricultural scientist what we need to do we need to think two three different areas one how we can breed for our crops which will be the climate change ready crops or climate or they can adapt to the climate change second is that how we can start or we can enhance the crop productivity uh, in terms of those anticipated climate change third is that well how we can enhance the nutrition nutrition content either enhancing the protein content or iron and zinc content so that we can address these issues so i think these are the key areas where we as a agricultural scientist from the plant breeding perspective we can play important role in this regard a few years back we wrote this article and opinion article in the current opinion plant biology 
where we discussed that how the genomics can deliver climate change ready crops. And we had some discussions that, well, when we have the germplasm, we need to use the genomics and phenotyping technology. We used to the modern breeding technology. Dr. Sadanand also mentioned very nicely. He gave a very nice overview. In my presentation, I will be giving some examples. And I think that by integrating all these things, we can develop the climate resilient crops. Furthermore, we also had another article where we have provided that approach. And I think this was last year or so, the 5 Gs approach. And I say that this is a 5 Gs approach for the crop genetics and breeding. The first G, this 5G is not that mobile technology, but we compared or we gave that when telecommunications is going in the 5Gs, I think the crop breeding should also go towards the 5Gs and 1G is the genome that we need to have well characterized genomes for any crop species. And nowadays, a lot of advances have happened. Germplan needs to be characterized at the genomic and agronomic level. We need to have the genes identified and their functional uh, characterization. And then we need to use them through the breeding. I call this approach genomic breeding. And nowadays, the another approach called gene editing. And this is called that India is moving in the positive direction that we are where we will have these uh, technology, especially coming from the SDN1 and SDN2, not regulated at GM, which is really very good thing for the country. So I think that we are having several approaches. And this is the research framework. And what I'm going to do that will highlight some of the examples and these many of these examples they are coming from our research, what we have been doing at ECRISAT together with partners, several ICR institute, including IIPR, Director of Groundnut Research, Indian Institute of Millets Research, also All India Coordinate Research Project on Pearl Millet and many other state agricultural universities in the country and international collaborators. So in this perspective, if you see from the protein perspective, then the three legume crops, they play a very important role, chickpea, pigeon pea, and groundnut. And these are grown by the smallholder farmers, rain-fed crops, so, and they are a very important source of the proteins. And the other group of the crops, and this is about the sorghum and millets, where IAMR is working, Ikrisat is working, and many other colleagues are working. And I think that this dryland area we are having in India, 68% of the dryland areas, and in those areas, I think that these millets, broadly millets, which include sorghum and millets, so they are important, gifted, nutrition rich and climate resilient crops. And they address two major challenges about which we are also having this webinar about the food and nutritional security. And uh, so these are very important crops. And I think that because of the hard work and uh, of Dr. Vlas Tonapi and other colleagues from IAMR, ECRISAT, and the leadership of Director General of ICR, Dr. Mohopatra, and Ministry. I think this is really good that India is taking lead to have this uh, 2023 as an international year of the millet. So I think that this will be enhancing further. We are all aware that if you compare these different cereal crops, then sorghum and pearl millet, they really lead other cereal crops in terms of those different uh, micronutrients. So these are so important. So what we need to do that we need to work or we need to enhance these different contents further in these crops. What we have done, we need to do, we need to integrate the genomics and breeding and other elite disciplines together. And we need to think from the perspective that how we can enhance the disease resistance, how we can enhance the crop productivity, pest resistance, we need to develop the crops which are, are tolerant to the different environmental stresses in context of the climate change. We talked about nutrition. We need to think about the environmental sustainability. And in this context, I will share some of our experience related to the genomics. And I think that not only recently, and I'm taking you maybe that uh, several years back, more than 17 years back in 2005, when I used to work in Germany, at that time point, people used to talk about the marker-assisted selection, marker-assisted breeding, because they used to identify the markers using the breeding. But at that time point, genomics was relatively new. There were only the genome sequence available for rice at that time point in 2005, and before that, Arabidopsis. But so at that time point, together with Professor Andreas Graner and Professor Mark Sorens, we gave a concept that how genomics can be used in the breeding program and we gave this concept of the genomics assisted breeding that was published in the 10th anniversary issue of trends in plant science and the title was feeding the world plant biotechnology milestone and after 
completing about and then during this last 15 years a lot of genomes came a lot of genomics assisted breeding approaches were used and 15 years later or so then the journal asked and they were having another special issue 25th anniversary issue feeding the world the future of the plant breeding and then in that one they asked that can we summarize that what happened during last 15 years in the genomics assisted breeding point number one point number two where we need to go further what kind of new approaches now we are having and in this article we dis we described those results and we also gave a concept we called it gab genomics assisted breeding 0.2 so basically that we are going in the next version or so. And here I will touch some of these points at later stage that in the current scenario, how we can moving further. Furthermore, and just before this talk, there were the discussion and Dr. Sadanand also mentioned and Dr. Varaprasad mentioned that when we are talking about the crop improvement, we need to bring the diversity from the wild species from the land races. And recently we have given this concept and then this was published as a cover article also in the trends in biotechnology that how we can bring those important alleles which were lost during the domestication in the plant breeding process and we can bring those alleles back to the elite lines. We can enhance the genetic base. We can reduce or we can, we can address the issue of this uh, narrow genetic diversity in many crops, including the pulses or so. So this is also important that how we can reap the crop wild relatives for breeding the future crops. So I think these are the premises and now what we need to do, how we can do it. And for doing these things, as I mentioned earlier, I think nowadays there are lots of advances in the genomics technology, sequencing technology. And not only that, even the phenotyping technology, they have been advanced a lot. And right now with that new technological advances, including these free season phenotyping technology like X-ray CT imaging and uh, different kind of uh, methods, you can do very high precise phenotyping for the large scale crops or so. The other thing is that in the area of sequencing and genotyping, lots of advances have already have happened. You can develop the reference genome. Now we can sequence hundreds to the thousands of the line and we can develop the pan genomes. I will talk about it later. And when you are having this sequencing genotyping technology and phenotyping technology, you can map those any traits. And then not only that you identify the genes, you identify the better version of those genes, we can call them haplotypes. So basically we identify the superior haplotypes and these can be integrated in the crop improvement program. So this is the way that breeding needs to go. In this context, from the perspective of genomes for our crops, when I was working at Decreaset, what we did that we led the genome sequencing consortium for many crops and in several other crops, we co-led with other international partners. As a result, we delivered the genomes of pigeon pea, chickpea, palm millet, also in the case of groundnut or peanut, two different ancestral species, A genome, B genome species, then also cultivated species of uh, two different kind of subspecies, Festigiata and Hypogea of peanuts. So we have published all these things. Everything is in public domain. And not only that, we also worked with many other organizations and delivered the genome sequences of sesame, moongwein, ajukivin, jatropa, and just now this P genome paper has also been accepted in Nature Genetics two days back. So we also have accomplished this important job and then many other things. So what I'm trying to say, so now this is possible to decode the genomes in very fast manner and very precise manner in the less cost. And we had this privilege to decode or to deliver the genome sequence for more than 10 different crop species. Now, once you have this genome of one individual or accessions available, many people think that job is completed. And I say, no, job is not completed. Rather, your job is started now because what happens when you sequence one individual, you can identify the genes of only that particular cultivar. And nowadays, there are the uh, studies that if you sequence the other cultivar, cultivar two, cultivar three, then you realize that many genes which are specific to cultivar two, they are not cataloged when you sequence just cultivar one or you don't find those genes for the cultivar three in the cultivar one and cultivar two. So nowadays what is happening that we are sequencing large number of individuals and based on the sequencing of these different individuals for a given species, then you can catalog the genes for all of all genes for that particular 
species. So for instance, in the case of chickpea, we are sequencing one individual, we may not have all the genes. So we need to sequence larger number of individuals. This is called pan genome. So when you are having all genes of one species together, cataloging of those things we call pan genome. We also extended this approach called super pan genome. And what we say, like even in the case of chickpea, for instance, and we are having eight different species in Sizer genus, like so Sizer ret aritinum is the cultivated one, Sizer reticulatum, echinospermum, yamashiti, there are many other subspecies or so. So what we are saying that not only for one, we are developing the pen genomes for each of those subspecies. And when you develop those pen genomes for all these different species, then at the larger scale at the genus level, you can develop a pen genome and we call it super pen genome. And when I was at said we have already worked in some of these directions. I would like to highlight a few areas of research in context of the climate change and nutrition security, that how the germplasm sequencing efforts have been helpful. In the case of pigeon pea, few years back, we sequenced 300 pigeon pea lines coming from the 23 different countries. And this study provided a lot of important thing, including the center of origin of pigeon pea here in Madhya Pradesh. But most important from the plant breeding perspective, provided the genes associated plant breeding related traits in the crop species where we did not have anything. Similarly, in the case of chickpea, where we sequenced 430 chickpea lines, and we had the phenotyping data for yield under drought and heat stress conditions coming from Ikriset colleagues and from bearing partners. And we identify several of those genes in that aspect. And not only that one, that when we have done the phenotyping of this reference set of 300 lines for many nutritional traits, because in this talk, I'm talking about the nutritional security as well. And you can see generally the pulses, they are having 20% protein content, but now some of these lines, we got about even up to 24% protein content. So if you can identify those genes or so, and then we can ask a question, can we introgress these things in the elite cultivar so we can enhance the protein content without that sacrificing the yield because yield is the paramount. And not only that one, you can see many iron, folate, and many other micronutrients, large number of variation for this germplasm. And we have done some GWAS analysis for the nutritional traits. And for instance, for the protein content, we found several genes of the chromosome 8, chromosome 2, and chromosome 3, etc. So I think that this is really important to identify those genes. Similarly, we are also identifying the genes for different micronutrients. Some of my colleagues at a reset, like Rakesh Srivastava, he has been working with different collaborators and colleagues, and he has also mapped some of those traits like iron and zinc for in the case of palmillate in the different chromosomes or so. So I think that you can map those related traits or so. And this is coming from the smaller set. But now we have moved a larger set of the germplasm and then many of you may have seen this paper last year in Nature. And what we did that we have sequenced 3,366 chickpea lines. And this was a big one of those biggest plant genome sequencing study in any crop species where we have sequenced at the whole genome level more than 20 to 30 X coverage kind of thing. And this was covered in the New York Times, in the Economist, in many other important newspapers and general articles. And this was showing that highlighting that how important this study is and related to the crop improvement or so. And I will not go in the details, but would like to mention that out of these 3,366 genomes, we had cultivated wild and many other things and we have developed the pen genome, so as I was saying earlier, so for instance, earlier from our chickpea genome sequence paper, which was in 2013, we identified about 29,000 genes. But when we have done the sequencing of large number of individuals, we found about 1,600 new genes, which were not present in earlier genome. And many of these genes, they were found enriched in the different metabolic pathways, which are really important associated with the adaptation for the climate change related trait, or in some cases, maybe with related to the disease resistance or so. And once you've got those genomic information, and we would like to see that how we can use them in the plant breeding application and plant breeder would like to see their genotyping cost minimal so that they can screen any line with the minimum cost. And many of you may be aware about the high throughput genotyping project, which I was leading at ICRISAT together with several other organizations. And through that project, we have brought the cost down 
for a, these 10 SNP panels and where we can screen any line for about 1.5 to $2 per sample. But for each of our species, we have developed a range of marker genotyping platform starting with SSR, CASPER, genotyping by sequencing, high density genotyping array or so. Our purpose was to provide a range of marker genotyping platform for genetics and plant breeding communities and depending on their objective, they can use any of these platforms. So for instance, recently we accomplished this 2000 SNPs array and they are being used now for the G selection purpose or so, and I will talk about it. So we can do a lot of work in the genomics area, but second important thing is the phenotyping technology. And at international level, there are different advances in those phenotyping technology where you can do the aerial phenotyping by using the drones, aero, these helicopters, different kind of aerial vehicle, etc. And also you can do the lot of ground phenotyping platform even the, under the roots, etc. So you can do a lot of work. At ICRI when I was there, so together with our crop physiologist and pathologist and our breeding colleagues, we have developed different platforms related to drought, including Legiscan, Yana Kolova is leading these efforts, Lysimeter, and also for the field together through our plant breeders in different areas, they are really having the good platform. So what we did that for different germ plants, we have done the phenotyping by using these platforms. We use these approaches called linkage and association mapping approaches, and we have identified combining all these approaches. During last uh, many years, we have done mapping for 20 to 50 traits in chickpea, groundnut, pigeon pea, and this is the result of my several colleagues from Center of Excellence in Genomics and Systems Biology, and also our collaborators from ICR centers, State Agriculture University, and others. And similarly, in the uh, cases of the cereal crops, pearl millet, sorghum, finger millet, including like Rakesh Srivastava, that and other colleagues, they have done a lot of good work and map those traits, 10 to 20 traits in the different, in the different crops. And now the next important thing is, so okay, you would develop the genomic resources, you understood the genes. Now the next thing is how you are able to deliver these things in the form of the superior varieties, because in morning also there were discussions all, and also in that, uh, when we were listening uh, about this talk from that ISRO that uh, now the design thinking. So we need to think that how we should be able to deploy these things. Sometimes we are having ideas some proof of concept, but they are not going in the deployment technology, which is very, very important. So what we have done that in the case of genomic breeding, I would like to classify these approaches in genomic assisted breeding marker assisted selection, marker assisted black crossing, marker assisted recurrent selection. Many times these approaches have been used. Now genomics assisted breeding 2.0 and here we are having the new approaches like haplotype based breeding, genomic selection. Also the gene editing and gene editing we are telling in two different flavors. Sometimes you would like to improve those genes. You would like to have the good allele. Then we are calling this promotion of the allele through gene editing, we call it page. And sometimes you want to remove that bad alleles, we call it removal of alleles through the gene editing. So I think these are the new approaches we need to do. I'm very happy to mention that through collaborative efforts of our breeders from my former institute, ICRISAT, and also our collaborators in India, in Ethiopia, in Kenya, and many other countries, we have been able to deliver several improved varieties coming through genomics assisted breeding. So those information, genomes, this is not just restricted to those nature paper or high impact or in, uh, high impact factor papers. They have come to the plant breeding label. They have come to the, they have these, these fruits of genomics assisted breeding have been delivered to the smallholder farmers in several countries, including one of these interesting example. And this was the first example where Ethiopian Institute of Agriculture Research and together with us, we have delivered this variety called Jelly 2 and this was the variety which is having 19% higher yield under the rain-fed condition. In India, our colleagues like Dr. Bhardwaj from Indian Institute of Agriculture Research, also Dr. Shelly Stirpati from IRI and many other colleagues from Indian Institute of Pulses Research, also Dr. Mannur and others from State Agriculture University from Karnataka. So we have delivered the varieties for drought tolerance, for the fusion wilt resistance and they are coming from the genomics assisted breeding and also in the 2021 there are another three varieties came and they were coming from that iri from dr celestial party and from dr k r soren 
and also from Dr. Aditya Garg. So all these people, they have been working all together with Equisat and all of us and through the genomics assisted building, these varieties have been delivered. And not only this one, and just last week I heard from Dr. Bhardwaj that one of those lines coming from the genomics assisted breeding has also been released in Uttar Pradesh now through the state variety release committee. So I think a lot of varieties they're moving now from all this work, what we did a few years back. And I have been told that several of these lines, they're already under the pipeline under this ACRIP trials or so. And similar is the case in the case of Pigeon P, where with the P, US Raichur, PJT SAU in Hyderabad, we have been able to deliver several of those lines. And in the case of Peanut, where we started these efforts long back about this foliar disease resistance, though there were different issues during the last few years, but this year, some of those lines have been identified for release. And I hope that in the next ACRIP meeting, this release thing will also be completed in the case of Peanut for the foliar disease resistance. And some of these lines, they have showed really good expression of the resistance in Ghana and Nigeria, et cetera, which we delivered, which we developed in India or so. And not only that one for foliar DG resistance and through some of our collaborative efforts from Dr. Ramesh Watt, and he has delivered two lines and coming for from the genome assisted breeding and for the foliar DG resistance. And you can see Dr. Dalwai also when he was visiting this field a few years back when I was there. And at that time, the then agriculture minister of Karnataka was also there. So what I'm trying to say, so you can deliver these varieties through genomics assisted breeding. And not only for that diseases or abiotic stresses, but even for nutrition related traits. So for instance, if you see the normal peanut varieties you are having, if you see the oil composition, then you are having linoleic acid and also that linoleic acid, palmic acid, palmitic acid and oleic acid. Linoleic, uh, so basically so that there are the different kind of these things. And linoleic acid is not good for the health. So what we need to do, we need to change this kind of composition and what we have done through genomics assisted breeding, we have developed the lines which are having more than 80% oleic acid and through directed of groundnut research or so, the first set of the groundnut varieties, Grenar 4 and Grenar 5 were released, which were also included in the package when Honorable Prime Minister Modi, when he delivered this uh, in the 75th anniversary of FAO, when he dedicated several of these varieties. So I think this is really good. Now, what we were doing for that, that we were combining those foliar disease resistance and high oleic acid traits together. And some of these lines, I hope that they will be coming in that uh, ACRI pipeline, etc. So I am very hopeful about that. one. Now, what we need to do further. So these were some stories from genomics assisted breeding from the first concept. Now we are moving to the GAV 2.0, what we need to do, as I said, so now there is the approach is haplotype based breeding because based on the sequencing of large number of individuals, we can identify the haplotypes. Now we need to bring those superior haplotypes in the varieties. Genomic prediction is another area that now we do not need to screen the line for one or two traits. We can understand, we can screen the line at the whole genome level. We can predict the phenotype of the line at the whole genome level. Third area is optimal contribution selection because sometimes when you bring the germplasm material in the breeding, many times we have the issue of the linkage drag. But now by, through this approach, we can do the selection of parent lines in such a manner which will deliver the higher genetic gain and minimum linkage drag or so. Genome editing is another approach. And now we believe that by combining a new approach or like called speed breeding where you can generate or where you can advance several generations in one year or so, then you can reduce this time also. So if you combine all these things together, you can develop the elite varieties, improved varieties in the context of the climate change or so. Now, very quickly, because I'm a big fan of this haplotype based breeding, what is this haplotype based breeding is that when you are sequencing larger number of individuals. So for instance, here you sequence individual one, two, three, et cetera. And then you are having based on the sequencing data for each gene, you can identify, for instance, in gene one, which haplotype is present in genome, genotype one, H1. On the other hand, haplotype three is present for gene one in the genotype two, haplotype four is present like this one. Similarly, you can do this haplotype mining for different genes across the whole entire germ plot. And then after that, you basically what we do that we do the phenotyping of these lines and based on the haplophenoanalysis, 
we try to identify that which haplotype is the good haplotype for the given gene. So for instance, in the gene one, for leaf area haplotype has three is better. For gene two, for the root depth haplotype H1 is better. For gene three haplotype H2 is better for the flowering time, etc. So you identify those superior haplotypes. Then you ask a question that your elite varieties or varieties which farmers are grown, growing, what kind of haplotypes you have? And we identify sometimes, oh, for gene one, this variety is having H2 haplotype. On the other hand, the best haplotype is H3. Same thing for gene three, haplotype H4 is this variety, but we need to have the H2 haplotype. So now we need to change those haplotypes and we can do this thing through haplotype-based breeding. And I think this is a really interesting approach. We have demonstrated the power of this approach in the case of our 3000 chickpea genome sequencing project where these 3000 chickpea lines were, dig, were phenotyped with our collaborative partners from at Sihor and also in Ikrisat, in Junagadh Agriculture University, in IAPR Kanpur at six different locations for two different years. And then we combined all these things, data together. And then we have identified that basically haplotypes and we targeted in the first instance about 67 genes. And we identified about 350 haplotypes and we did a lot of analysis. I will not go in the details because of shortage of time. And we validated our approach. When the released 129 chickpea varieties, and we identified that some of those varieties, which are good varieties, they're containing good haplotypes. And when you go further, then you are basically accumulating the superior haplotype, etc. And eventually, we identified 56 promising lines that are having the superior haplotypes and which are still not present in the elite varieties, and these can be integrated in those West varieties. And here, I was also very excited to see that, and many of you may be aware, when Honorable Prime Minister was visiting Ikrisat on 75th anniversary, and then we had a pleasure that he visited the chickpea field where we had several of these lines, and it is so pleasing that when a Prime Minister is basically uh, visiting the field where we are having these things and testing some of those things. So I think that this is a really interesting thing that haplotype based breeding and this is the area that where we need to go further in different crop. Same thing for micronutrient analysis we have done across the 3000 chickpeas we have done also the and then you can see the larger number of variation and we can identify the haplotypes from the nutritional perspective. When you do the protein content analysis we have found at least 25 lines which are having more than 30 percent protein content and now this can be also integrated together lastly i would also like to mention about this genomic prediction approach a genomic selection approach and when i was at ikri said they have taken these studies and we have demonstrated that even the legume crops and earlier basically cereal crops are always advanced but in these cases we have shown that we have can we can do the genomic prediction in chickpea, groundnut, and pigeon pea, and in the case of pigeon pea, we also provided the parental combinations for delivering the higher yield, which uh, and they can give much more better hybrids also. So I think that this is that all these approaches are very very powerful approaches. And very quickly, I will also like to mention in the sorghum and millets, which are a very important crop from the nutrition perspective. We know that one, and I think that India has done great work in both of these crops from the perspective of that uh, cultivars. More than 150 cultivars released. May, figures may be wrong. Probably IIMR is having much more updated data. But I think that if you will combine with the seed industry, number goes is 300. But what I want to tell that seed industry also has played a very important role to promote this sorghum and millet cultivation in the country. And nowadays, that not only that one, but important thing is that about the biofortification, both pulp millet and sorghum is moving further. And I know some of these efforts in the case of pulp millet, even this again picture where we had the, some finger millet and little millet varieties, they were also released or dedicated to the nation by our level prime minister. And I think pulp millet is also the crop uh, where ECRIP has already has put a bar that when any variety or hybrid which is released, then we should have minimum number of iron and zinc. And I'm getting this information from Dr. Tara Satyavati, where they have demonstrated that during the last four or five years, they have delivered several varieties or hybrids, or several hybrids basically, that, uh, and then all of these things, they are having really high level of iron and zinc, and there are a larger number of these things. So I think that this is really good. Now, Next thing is either you develop hybrids or varieties through genomics assisted breeding 
और कन्वेंशनल ब्रीडिंग और बायो बायो फर्टिफिकेशन मेथड और बाई जीन एडिटिंग टेक्नोलॉजी द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग इज दैट वी नीड टू हैव high yielding climate change ready cross with the better nutrition and with better profitability to the farmers but now the next thing is we need to ensure that they are reaching to the farmers in the real time and in india things have been much more better situation and i think again thanks to the icr state agriculture universities and the policy makers that we have done a great work in terms of the replacement of the old varieties by the new varieties or the hybrids but there are still several countries in the world where we still have the issue so what we need to do and we have provided this uh, approach or we did some analysis and we said that even when you are having these yield varieties from any method we need to ensure we need to have the rapid delivery system and if in some countries these are already available then we need to strengthen if not then we need to establish and the, what does it mean that when we are having these elite varieties we need to strengthen the seed system either through formal or informal way and dr tonak we knows much more better than anyone else we know about the seed system and then what we need to do that when they are reaching to the farmers then farmers also need to provide it the better agronomic packages because you can enhance or you can realize the full potential of genetics or genomics of breeding only if you are having the good agronomy packages if not then you will not be able to harness the full potential and then for that we need to have the digital decision support tools and we can call this area digital agriculture etc so farmers need to be given all those information the next thing is that we also lose a lot of yield during the post harvest losses and there are a lot of issues i think even yesterday when i was listening dr dalwai also that they were talking that even we talk about the cold storage we see in the country and more higher percentage this goes only for the potato so now we need to see from all these perspective that how these things can be addressed so that we should have the reduction in the post harvest losses and the next thing is that the farmer community needs to be connected to the markets and so that we can have the minimal uh, middleman or so and we can farmers can ensure higher profitability and also the value addition is very important that how we can do this thing value addition so not only the farmers even the consumers can be the beneficiary so we don't need to think now for just for enhancing the crop productivity we need to think from the crop profitability and i can tell you that though i have been here in australia for last 3 4 months here we are always talking that how the growers the different thing is here in india and australia is which is thing that here that farmers they are the they call themselves growers and large scale land this is not a small holder so the first thing always comes that how this crop even enhance the crop productivity will be enhancing the profitability to the growers or not and all of our research are dictated by those needs so i think this is really very very important for us here i would like to highlight an example of the tropical legumes project which was initially led and conceptualized by dr c l goda and then at later stage for about 7 6 years or so i was leading this project and this project is a successful example of integrating this plant breeding genetic seed system capacity building all these things together and this was a big initiative for about 12 13 years from the bill and melinda gates foundation which has having the partners ikri said cad iita and 13 different countries in africa two countries in asia india and bangladesh and we were having six different crops chickpea cowpea groundnut common wheat sorghum pigeon pea etc massive efforts for large number of colleagues or so this project delivered facilitated development and raise of 266 improved varieties facilitated production of 500000 ton seeds which worth about 6.1 uh, well so this could produce about 6.1 million ton grains and all these success stories they have been documented in the different formats either in the special issue of the journals books etc and i think that this is the way that we need to do the things and i think that based on all these efforts or so this project or ikri said was awarded that africa food prize for the efforts or the outputs of these projects so i think we are very happy and this project has given or the outcome this thing is given several effort outputs or so one is we need to have the long term studies we need to bring all these different disciplines together and i think we always need to see from the pragmatic manner or so anyway friends now i think i would like to summarize my talk and we have talked about this agricultural role of agriculture for food and nutrition security in this direction 
We believe that in general all crops, but millets and pulses, they play a very important role for nutrition. And because they possess the climate resilience, and if you are talking other crops, we need to integrate those traits there. And genomics and breeding innovations, they're key for accelerating crop, crop improvement for both agronomy and nutritional traits. Nowadays, the fast forward breeding, including genomic prediction approaches, haplotype based breeding approaches, they can expeditiously create and incorporate superior genes and haplotypes and crop improvement. I did not discuss this area, but I think this is the upcoming area about the systems biology, machine learning, artificial intelligence. And I think that and nowadays we are working even at Murdoch University, we are moving in this direction that how we can integrate these approaches for enhancing the precision and efficiency in the crop improvement. Lastly, there is a continuous need for R&D investment from international, national and local government agencies in both upstream science as well as translational research because many times we need to show the impact and we leave the focus on the upstream science which is also not good we should not do this thing on the cost of one of the other but we need to have really good balance in research and development so i think that's what i would like to say and with these words thank you very much for your patience and i would like to thank all my previous collaborators and partners around the world. And thank you very much. I will be very happy to take up any question if you have time. Thank you. Back. Uh, thank you very much. Back to you, sir. Yeah, thank you, uh, Rajiv. It was wonderful hearing from you. Uh, what it has brought out is uh, systems biology, networking, and cutting edge technologies, basically combined with conventional breeding. I think this that is where uh, we can really align our work for climate resilience. And uh, I'm sure uh, though you are in Australia, I think the collaboration uh, with uh, the institutes in India yes. to continue, maybe new avenues you can find and our scientists also would like to liaise with your uh, efforts in this direction. And uh, sure. maybe, yeah, maybe questions probably uh, we can have on some other point, uh, some other time yes. probably sure, because we, we can have a, a uh, separate session on this and uh, <laughs> we'll be happy to interact with you at that time. Sir. Thank you very much, sir. So nice of you and for your kind words. And as you said, I'm always there. I'm always very heavily interacting with all of our Indian partners. So as they say, Fribi Dilhe Hindustani. So this is always the case and will remain. So no problem at all. <laughs> thank you very much for in your thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, you, sir. God, sir. thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Namaskar, sir. Yeah, so I think now we have back-to-back -back sessions. Uh, so uh, now we are going to the next session, uh, basically to address climate vulnerability and risk, risk assessment. These are very, very important aspects. Uh, this uh, particular session is coordinated by Dr. Srinath Dikshit. He is the cluster, cluster leader at ICRISAT. Development Center, IDC. And uh, this particular uh, session, we have very esteemed uh, uh, scientists. One is Dr. Shalender Kumar and Dr. BMK Raju uh, from Ikrisat and uh, also uh, Krida Hyderabad. Uh, we will be focusing in this panel discussion on climate vulnerability index, then climate vulnerability assessment and economic modeling and how these climate smart policies can enable investments. Then climate adaptation strategies uh, by Dr. Srinath Dikshit. So uh, this is the panel discussion in discussing on important aspects because uh, the prediction, the modeling, the assessment, the indices, they're all very, very important aspects. So uh, before we go to this panel discussion, uh, I would like to request Jinu Jacob to kindly introduce the speakers. And later, Srinath Dikshit will be coordinating with both Dr. B.M. Raju and uh, Shalender. And uh, so the session uh, will need to conclude by uh, 2.45 before we take the uh, next speaker. So by 2.40, uh, Srinath, if you can conclude, I think we will be having the greater time for uh, remaining lectures and the valedictory. So thank you very much. Gino. Yes, sir. We are delighted to welcome the experts in the panel discussion on climate vulnerability 
risk assessment and, and adaptation strategies. Let me introduce our first expert, Dr. BMK Raju, who is the principal scientist in agricultural statistics section of design and analysis at ICAR CREDA. He obtained his PhD in agricultural statistics from IARA, MSc in statistics and BSc agriculture from Acharya NG Ranga Agriculture University, Hyderabad. He has 10 years of research experience in the area of agricultural statistics, dryland agriculture, agricultural resource characterization, statistical modeling, building composite indices, statistical analysis for policy and resource prioritization in agriculture, agricultural sustainability, design and analysis of socioeconomic studies. He has several publications, including 73 research papers, several books and book chapters, softwares, database, and technical articles to his credit. Our second expert is Dr. Shalender Kumar, who is a cluster leader, socio-economist, markets, institutions, and policies, ICRESAT. Dr. Kumar is an agricultural economist by training and leads the markets, institutions, and policies cluster. And he's also the Deputy Global Research Program Director of the Enabling Systems Transformation Program at ICRESAT. He's also the NAS Fellow. He is on the Executive Committee of the Global Climate and Food System Transformation Alliance. He has more than 28 years of experience working in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. The current focus of his work is on climate resilience and nutrition-sensitive value chains and food systems tools and frameworks for co-designing resilient farm and food systems and scaling climate smart agriculture. Also policies relevant studies around seed systems, agribusiness opportunities, climate adaptation and mainstreaming millets. Our last expert is Dr. Srinath Dikshit, who is the Interim Global Research Program Director, Resilient Farm and Food Systems at ICRESAT. Currently, he is leading a large multidisciplinary team of scientists, consultants, technicians, and field staff for developing solutions to build resilience in farm and food systems, providing technical lead and mentorship to the cluster leads working on climate adaptation and mitigation, landscapes, soil fertility, water management, geospatial and big data science, and digital agriculture, besides scaling impacts of science-based agricultural technologies. Dr. Deeshit had served as member secretary of subgroup on technology mapping, adoption, impact, and farm innovations and agricultural education of 12th five-year plan by the Planning Commission, Government of India. He has served as a member in various boards and academic councils and research advisory, advisory committees of various institutes. He has published over 35 papers in peer-reviewed high-impact international journals and over 50 journals of national repute, besides authoring several book chapters, books, and policy briefs. We thank all our experts for joining us today, and we are looking forward to listening to your thoughts and opinions. Yes, Rinath, uh, over to you uh, to coordinate this uh, panel discussion. So welcome, Shalandar and BMK Raju. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for the elaborate introductions that has made my job very easy. Without doing, uh, without much ado, uh, I would straight away ask uh, Dr. B. M. K. Raju to share his experiences in climate vulnerability, preparing climate vulnerability index. I remember Kumar, uh, Dr. Kumar, and myself used to be his colleagues uh, way back in uh, the two, early 2000, early 2000, and later part of uh, 2010 until 2014. That was the time when the entire group. Uh, uh, led by Dr. Shalender Kumar and assisted by several other economists and statisticians like uh, Dr. Raju, worked uh, very intensively on collecting data, uh, both from secondary sources and primary sources, and uh, developed an index uh, to, to classify 100 most vulnerable districts. That was the time when the National Initiative on Climate Resilient Agriculture um, uh, project, which is today called very, uh, you know, a nickname, very famous nickname when it comes to climate resilient agriculture, um, the flagship program of ICR, uh, launched in the year 2011-12. So is now uh, is is now a very famous uh, program. It's still continuing and uh, with a lot of uh, contributions to its credit. 
um, over to Raju uh, to, to share with the group, the elite group, the methodology that we adopted in um, categorizing various districts uh, as climate vulnerable. Thank you very much and over to you. And uh, uh, as for the request of the organizers, so if we can cut down about two to three minutes of our presentation, probably we will also have adequate time for the discussion by the participants uh, and audience. Thank you. Over to you, Raju. Sure, sir. Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dixit. And uh, uh, Director uh, IMR uh, and my uh, co-panelists and uh, other uh, dignitaries uh, from online and offline. So, uh, yeah, am I audible? Very much. Yes, sir. Very much. Please go ahead. So shall I share my presentation? Please, please. Okay. So now means uh, the uh, approach uh, adopted uh, by Krida in uh, assessing uh, the vulnerability or risk assessment uh, in uh, uh, previously just uh, I will be sharing some details and we will be discussing on these aspects. Climate vulnerability index, how to build uh, and uh, risk assessment. So you, you all know climate change is not uh, just a phenomenon that is going to happen in future or somewhere in future. So it already has started. And if you observe that historical trends also, you will be able to understand. And uh, just uh, as a uh, to attempt this, uh, we compared uh, uh, the climatic uh, classification at district level uh, made in uh, 1988 by Krishnan, and he used the data climate data for the period 1901 to 1950. And just uh, to update or to see what changes that happened at district level uh, at uh, with regard to climatic classification. Uh, we took that uh, climatic data for the period of 1971 to 2005. And we have made again, uh, classified the districts as arid, semi-arid, dry subhumid like these climates. So we observed, uh, means you can all see these uh, differences between uh, uh, these two uh, maps. And uh, you can notice that there are a lot of uh, moist subhumid back pockets in uh, districts in Chhattisgarh, uh, Madhya Pradesh, Jark and Orissa, now they have disappeared and they became dry subhumid. So a kind of uh, means uh, climate is becoming uh, harsh uh, in the eastern region. So that has uh, implications uh, towards uh, uh, agriculture and uh, now means if you see our earlier programs like uh, drought prone area program, desert development program, and based on that criteria of uh, this moisture index, now many of the districts in this eastern region, they become eligible for drought prone area program even. So that kind of implications for policy also, this will have this climate change. And coming to uh, historically, so now coming to future, we have uh, taken the uh, projected data sets uh, for future based on uh, semi 5 data uh, for uh, different RCPs are there. RCP 2.6, 4.5, 6, and 8.5. These are uh, different uh, uh, development pathways that can occur in any country. So, means as IMD says, uh, 4.5 is uh, more appropriate for Indian context as per our development pathway and all. So, it's nothing but 4.5, RCP 4.5 means uh, 4.5 watts per meter square, the radiative force. Based on that, uh, so if uh, the as per the development pathway the country has adopted, so we are expected to have the 4.5 watts per meter square radiative forcing. And if you consider, if, even if uh, 2020s, 2050s, and 2080s, uh, even with all RCPs, uh, average temperature, if you see, it is uh, projected to increase. Up to when say 8.5, if you consider it is more than uh, means up to 10, more than 10 degrees centigrade. And even for 4.5, also if you take uh, then uh, for our country, uh, which it is uh, more appropriate. So we can expect from 2022, if you compare uh, 2050s and 2080s, so around uh, 2 to 3 degrees centigrade uh, temperature is expected to rise. And if you rainfall, also if you see. Uh, interestingly, rainfall is also uh, means projected to increase uh, for uh, uh, globally as well as uh, for uh, this is mainly for our country. Uh, uh, all these maps or uh, all these uh, graphs were made for our country's 
data, uh, based on simplified data. And uh, rainfall, if you see as per 4.5, it is also means around, uh, it may increase uh, up to 10% uh, or something like that, uh, we can uh, expect to increase. So with this uh, scenario means uh, there are two kinds of things. Some uh, regions, uh, it can be an opportunity even this climate change, but uh, mostly temperature effects are uh, means, uh, seen and uh, uh, it, is a positive, uh, means, uh, it is emerging as a potential threat for sustainable development. So in this regard, uh, adaptation is a key uh, aspect in dealing with climate change. So in uh, while uh, by, in doing so, vulnerability or risk assessment is an important initial step uh, in, in uh, adaptation planning. So to that effect, uh, now uh, that uh, IPCC as, uh, assessment report file has given uh, this uh, risk assessment uh, framework in that uh, they have considered exposure, vulnerability, hazard. These are the three components of risk. And up to assessment report four, they considered vulnerability is the main thing. Now that focus has shifted. Now the, we, have, so we have to see the things from the perspective of uh, uh, extent risk. So in that context, they have changed this uh, framework, vulnerable risk, risk assessment framework. Now risk is the ultimate thing, and risk is a resultant of exposure, vulnerability. Interact means it is a resultant uh, that is uh, happening due to interactions between exposure, vulnerability, and hazard. Exposure is nothing but what we can say is the uh, uh, the presence of uh, people for agriculture context, if you take uh, the farmers, uh, the number of uh, small and marginal farmers or the area, agricultural area, to what extent uh, the damage can happen. It means the magnitude of uh, these uh, systems, agricultural area or farmers, all these things. So which can, uh, which, which could, which, uh, which can adversely be affected. So again, coming to vulnerability is a propensity or predisposition to be adversely affected based on the socioeconomic capabilities of the people or livelihoods uh, existing there and systems in place. And hazard is an external component and it is a potential occurrence of uh, uh, natural or human induced, a climate related event, we can say, which can cause the damage. So these interaction of these three aspects can uh, means result into the risk. It, risk is determined by these three components together. So this is the open hammer in 2014. Uh, they, have, they have given this kind of framework for assessment of risk. And uh, this uh, hazard exposure vulnerability, we have already discussed these things. So hazard is caused by either natural variability will be there and anthropogenic climate change. So uh, then uh, these uh, adaptation and mitigation actions taken by government or socioeconomic, socioeconomic pathways adopted, these can have direct influence or this can reduce or increase this vulnerability or exposure. And these actions can indirectly also influence the anthropogenic climate change through emissions. So again, uh, that may lead to hazards. So these three things together, they can cause the risk. So we are going to means, uh, uh, quantify the risk based on the, this, the based on this framework. So we have adopted this indicators uh, approach. So each exposure, vulnerability, and hazard to assess each of these component, we have selected the various indicators. Those indicators together represent that particular dimension or uh, component. And some indicators of exposure, some indicators of vulnerability like that. So these uh, once these indicators uh, means, uh, are uh, decided, we collect data on uh, whatever uh, these uh, attributes and make the uh, develop the indicators and because these each indicator will be in a different uh, men's scales and different units so normalization is required so whatever appropriate normalization techniques are there based on these uh, uh, indicators we have adopted uh, the normalization techniques and after that aggregation uh, will give this component indices so for aggregation again we have to decide upon weights so again for weighting also various methods are there data driven weights expert based weights or uh, equal weights many approaches are there so we have for our uh, study we have adopted uh, uh, expert based weights and we have tested with uh, some data driven uh, tools also it means they are coming uh, close to whatever experts weights uh, coming to close and then that's why we have uh, finalized on expert weights once these components indices are finalized again uh, they will be in different scales Again, a second uh, um, uh, uh, rescaling has to be done for components. And again, after aggregating these exposure, vulnerability, and uh, 
hazard, then we'll uh, compute the risk. So it's a, a additive model uh, adopted. So regarding climate projections, how we have arrived, uh, the when the hazard component, we made it into two uh, groups. One is historical hazard, that is uh, becoming the, whatever currently these uh, is for different uh, uh, spatial units are exposed. So that also I considered and what can happen uh, based on uh, uh, simified data in future model data projections that also have considered. So for future hazard, uh, we have considered uh, different uh, uh, models, around 30 models were considered for each RCP. And uh, these models, ensemble uh, of these models were considered, uh, taken. And we have uh, mentioned the downscaling was done at uh, grid level, off degree, off degree. And bias correction was also done. And for each grid point, uh, influential area was computed for, based on Thyssen polygon approach. And uh, for now, this state was taken as a unit for our uh, analysis. And these uh, Thyssen polygons were overlaid on uh, district shape files and then uh, derived these uh, data rainfall, temperature, minimum temperature, maximum temperature for each district. And we have computed the agriculturally relevant indicators for uh, to quantify the climate change phenomena. And we have seen uh, uh, means, uh, whatever all these indicators were computed for uh, baseline period, that is 1976 to 2005, and future also, 2030s. So then what are the changes that are happening that we have uh, uh, derived? So these are the models used uh, for uh, the different study, these studies. And is, these are the vulnerability means indicators. Uh, so higher the rainfall, lower the vulnerability, like that. So more degraded land, more, more vulnerability like more literacy, less vulnerability, uh, road connectivity, market density, and uh, social capital. We have come uh, considered this in terms of uh, villages with a uh, number of villages with the uh, self-help groups, SAGs, livestock density, irrigation, uh, all these aspects we have considered, inequity, per capita income, all these aspects. Similarly, exposure, as uh, we discussed, uh, these are the presence of people or systems uh, which, which can get harmed. So this is that zone area is uh, became the indicator of exposure, rural population density, like, and then uh, historical hazard, we have considered three, uh, three uh, parameters. One is cyclone proneness, flood proneness, and drought proneness. And coming to future hazard, uh, so if in future rainfall is going to decrease, means that becomes that makes the future hazard uh, uh, problem. So then risk will, will increase. Similarly, temperatures are increasing, means that it, it there is a hike, hike in temperature, high in temperature, mostly um, harmful to many of the agricultural uh, crops productivity and all. So that's why in that uh, fashion we have des uh, means, uh, designed a study that uh, once in indicator higher the score is more favorable or uh, harmful so that way it is considered so we have used uh, different extreme uh, climatic events also like uh, a 19 percentile rainfall and uh, highest rainfall in three consecutive days so this Dr. kind of Raju, uh, i would like to slightly interrupt you uh, can you please wind up in another three minutes please Okay, okay, sir. Fine, sir. Thank you. So these are different normalization techniques uh, followed, and uh, so this is the expert weights approach. Uh, what we have adopted, I already mentioned. So based on this uh, statistical tools, so based on uh, uh, categorization, uh, how to categorize high, very high, or medium, low, and very low risk. So I categorized based on this. Uh, 0.5 standard deviation units to minus 0.5 that we have taken as medium. So more than uh, 0.5 to up to 1.5 high risk, more than 1.5 standard deviation units, it is a very high risk. Like this, so we have classified the districts and these are the different sources of data. And coming to this, uh, so you can see these are the different exposure indicators, just for as glimpse, so I have given uh, four or five indicators, small and marginal farmers, you can see these are the exposure indicators. So rainfall and net irrigated area. So higher the percentage irrigated area, lower will be the vulnerability. These are the vulnerability indicators and groundwater availability and available water holding capacity, income inequity and per capita income. These are vulnerability indicators. And coming to historical hazard, this is the drought proneness and uh, cyclone proneness. These are coastal districts mainly this thing. And this is flood proneness. And this is a future hazard, how it is changing. This is the baseline and uh, how the rainfall will be changing in future. Jewelry rainfall and drought proneness, how drought proneness will be in future changes from the baseline. And incidence of dry spells and maximum temperature, minimum temperature. Like this is the extreme rainfall events. 99 percentile. So this is the exposure index, composite index, based on uh, these uh, five uh, indicators were chosen for this. 
and these are the weights assigned to different uh, parameters so this is the thing so if you see uh, mostly most exposure was more in uh, wherever agricultural area is more like uh, uttar pradesh or uh, haryana uh, uh, bihar or kerala where like this uh, our uh, livelihoods or rural population density is more and based on the weights this is the exposure index and coming to vulnerability these are uh, means uh, western india like rajasthan and uh, uttarakhand uh, this uh, our uh, this uh, uh, eastern region is uh, even even madhya pradesh maharashtra these parts also is becoming more uh, be, has become uh, become more vulnerable and coming to historical hazard you can see this coastal districts because of flood and uh, cyclone and here cyclone and drought and this is drought and uh, these are the main flood and all so these are making uh, historical hazard was assessed at district level and the coming to this is a future hazard future hazard you can see uh, especially in uh, uttarakhand himachal pradesh all these pockets in northeast also you can see historical hazard uh, so future hazard is uh, i mean it's projected that uh, there will be a problem and combining all these uh, four components and uh, this giving this kind of weightage uh, this is the final uh, risk index uh, developed so uh, this rajasthan many districts of rajasthan have become a very high uh, risk prone and uttar pradesh and similarly uttarakhand all you can see kerala northeast meghalaya many of these things like this so how also assessed uh, what is the major contributing uh, uh, factor uh, to that or component uh, to risk so that adaptation can be planned such a way that for example if you see uh, uttar pradesh and all future hazard is the main uh, culprit which is making uh, more risk prone and rajasthan if you see vulnerability is the main uh, culprit which is making them as a uh, more risk prone like this we have identified uh, for each uh, uh, like this this you see exposure uttar pradesh uh, many districts exposure is also high in bihar and uh, up so then food and ecology climate all these are uh, connected you understand that the food food and nutrition perspectives so this uh, index uh, directly or indirectly this climate change will have in, uh, bearing on uh, availability access and utilization and stability aspects of this food security and coming to crop wise impacts also we made uh, some uh, agronometric tools panel data regression approach so we have uh, classified so how this uh, for example sorghum uh, what is the yields now and uh, so with the technological trend is good uh, so our technology key technologies are uh, uh, I means enhancing the yields but if in the absence of technological trend uh, there is a chances that uh, climate change can uh, negatively influence the yield and uh, there is a, in end century you can clearly see sorghum yields are expected to be uh, expected to be down so at district level uh, also we have seen raju i think uh, this for two minutes i just i can i can so in this fashion uh, you can see how many uh, districts and all which category so yield uh, so negative impacts this minus means these are negative impacts many districts are uh, will be negatively influenced at end century and mid century uh, somewhat positive effects are there yield can in, uh, means increase in near future but in at, at the end of century sorghum yields can go down because of climate change so what are the districts how they will be influenced uh, this uh, at what is the yield impact at uh, kg in kg per hectare it is given so district names were also mentioned so that we can uh, uh, plan for uh, adaptation how to go about similarly this pearl millet also it is uh, given so all crops it was done for uh, mid century and end century how the which how many districts are get which districts are get, uh, going to be benefited which districts are going to be harmed in, in respect of yield of that particular crop so this coming up uh, in the absence of uh, technological trend uh, we may get negative effects of uh, climate change on yield so thanks so many that's and uh, even um, our mahapatra one, uh, one study is there where uh, climate change is uh, means vulnerability is more there uh, malnutrition is also uh, observed thank you thanks sir my my uh, th th thank you thank you very much uh, dr raju i think uh, 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 it was a very very el elaborate presentation uh, about the methodology that you have adopted uh, without now much uh, taking much time uh, we will move on to the next presentation we'll come back uh, with some questions from the moderator and a few more questions from the audience let's now go to the next presentation by dr shailendra kumar on so I... vulnerability assessment and economic modeling to support raju can you stop sharing policy, policy. okay just uh, yes raju you are saying something yeah i on share
unshare yeah you can unshare and then uh, yeah unshare over to you dr shalender yeah thank you dr sina can you see my slides yes yeah okay so first of all thanks uh, to the organizers especially dr tonapi so in this uh, short presentation i will be talking about uh, just a minute yeah i will be talking about uh, Uh, how uh, different uh, uh, the vulnerability assessment and economic or modeling tools can support uh, the policies and investment uh, to upscale climate smart agriculture so dr raju already presented uh, on the vulnerability assessment and the what is the next step how do we really use these uh, assessment uh, to design our strategies uh, just a minute is creating problem for me yeah okay yeah that's fine so uh, the india has really uh, put up a very good uh, robust uh, framework or trying to put so you have a national action plans you have a state action uh, plan for climate change uh, but uh, many of these state action plan uh, probably need to be revised to be more data driven and more action oriented but the one thing issue is the local adaptation plans which are at district level or the panchayat level or mandal level are missing so these uh, kind of analysis which i will be presenting can help the decision maker at different scales uh, how do you really um, make uh, investments and prioritize our uh, strategies to 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 achieve climate smart agriculture so the tools which i will talk about uh, the unified approach for scaling climate smart agriculture and the first step uh, in this comes the risk and vulnerability assessment at disaggregated level from district we need to go at the mandal level and the prioritization of csa practices the next ante impact assessment so what will happen if you really adopt these climate smart practices in terms of returns and income and how we can plan the investments at the state level for the government and i will also talk about the two another tools on sustainability assessment tool which can help stakeholders to design uh, sustainability innovations and also a decision support tool at farming systems level uh, where how farmers and actions and agencies can design the resilient uh farming systems so when we are going with the uh, for in the using this unified approach so first of all we need to have the agricultural assessment what kind of climate risk uh, that particular agricultural system faces in terms of crop or livestock or any other things but at the same time also as uh, in the last presentation that we need to look at the climate risk assessment so we will go to the next stage uh, from the district level which is a very good information and then go to the mandal level so you, because each mandal is different in the district also there is lot of variability then you have the inventory you make the inventory of climate smart practices and then we do the participatory prioritization with the stakeholders using multi criteria analysis and once you have those location specific practices prioritized and identify what barriers are there and what incentives are required to really promote those and then the ex ante impact assessment at uh, maybe district level or mandal level so how much returns these these um, uh, practices or innovations are going to give because unless you show the people that it is uh, profitable or economically viable then people will not make investment and then looking at the investment and infrastructure gaps because investment might be happening but maybe uh, there is might be a need to reprioritize or retarget those then working with the policy makers and the district level development people and converting them into the district level action plans uh, for the climate smart agriculture and that can contribute to the state action plan for climate change which is more action oriented and then working with the actions and agencies to promote those kind of uh, action plans and these tools can be very useful this is how we are promoting this uh, a unified approach for climate smart agriculture so this uh, this slide shows the how with the stakeholders using multi criteria analysis we do the prioritization of different uh, climate smart agricultural practices look at the what kind of financial and capital needs are when you want to promote those what kind of machinery needs or market linkages and infrastructure so that gives a overall understanding that if we uh, where which which practices to be prioritized to to be promoted and what is needed for those so we are also the same thing as dr raju mentioned so this is the ipcc uh, latest uh, method 
because the first step is to to design this climate smart strategy is the risk or vulnerability assessment so we have used the same thing uh, at the mandal level uh, going especially for example we have been working with telangana government and eptri so this shows uh, uh, the the historical and future hazards so you can see uh, how it is seen so i would not go into detail what kind of indicators we can discuss those who are interested in that and then finally the overall risk assessment uh, for the state so it shows looking at the future and um, historical hazards and vulnerability and adaptive capacity and all that and this is how it looks like so which mandals are really more vulnerable uh, to climate change for for history based on the historical and also based on the future and their uh, vulnerability or adaptive capacity of the people so the next step which i wanted to really share uh, it's going to be very useful that we assess uh when suppose we selected these six uh, six uh, climate smart practices based on the prioritization with the stakeholders so we did the more detailed analysis using the five years data for telangana at mandal level and how if we promote these uh, first of all we identified what is the potential area for these practices in the uh, in telangana at mandal level and if they are implemented uh, at the adopted at the at the mandal level uh, where you are going to get the more returns so this shows i think this uh, the title is i think covered i can't see it maybe you are able to see it so uh, you can see the this blue color where uh, you have the much more in terms of uh, million rupees uh, per annum how much additional investment returns will come to the investment of these technologies so this become a guide for the decision makers at different scale at district level or at the state level uh, to promote and similarly um, here we are showing in terms of farm pond so so we have also done the internal rate of return so once the practices are identified and prioritized based on the vulnerability and then we do this kind of analysis and which is a very much useful information for the decision maker to make investment and prioritize investment and similarly we go to the next stage when we are doing the per hectare uh, returns on investment because this will be very useful uh, to convince the farmers so once the if we are able to show that to the farmers that uh, if you adopt this you are going to get additional returns after considering the investment uh, how much and then uh, the farmer in those area where it, in, where these returns are significant the likely that farmers are going to adopt those kind of practices so we can choose and select more interventions depending on the because depending on the price market prices and also some other uh, interventions the priority of interventions may change methodology will remain same but this we can add more more technologies or more csa practices to be prioritized and to for the extent assessment but this tool really method helps uh, the decision maker at different scales to promote those practices which we want to do and it could be any any other practice as well so we also use this optimization model at the state level suppose when we want to at the government level if you want to promote or increase the farm income so for farm income you have to make additional investment when you are making additional investment you also have higher risk and so with the more production you have more risk but when you are using the blue line is the um, as usual scenario and with the the p, p the pink line or the orange line is saying that when you are adopting the climate smart practices at the state level and even when you are making more investment to increase more income your risk still remains much lower as compared to the Uh, as usual uh, scenario so this is another way of showing how the trade off between risk and returns at the state level so these kind of tools also can help so when also we have done for each district in telangana now this is an example of jagdial districts so how uh, how much area under these uh, technologies under what crops in which crops uh, would be um, would be useful to go uh, and where the returns on investment will be good and similarly you can see in the map so it is showing at mandal level uh, in jagatyal district uh, in which which mandal which technology is giving you more returns the same analysis also has been done at the hectare per hectare level also so these kind of analysis and tools uh, can really help uh, the decision makers at different scale right from the farm uh, to the policy makers uh, to make right decisions or of, of scaling Uh, are also making a real case uh, for promoting climate smart agriculture i want to share these two more slides so one this so besides uh, the 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 whatever i have shared with you in terms of uh, the climate smart agriculture per se uh, we are which we are doing for last many years 
So now we have also developed a framework and tool for designing uh, sustainability interventions, multidimensional sustainability. So sometimes we are really focusing only environmental, but uh, this particular tool take care of the environmental sustainability, economic sustainability, social sustainability, human well-being and productivity. And we have used around 130 indicators from the farmers level. And this helped us uh, in designing sustainability interventions, but also tracking the impact of sustainability in indicators. What happens sometimes you are achieving in terms of say economic sustainability or uh, environmental, but the social sustainability or human well-being is lacking, it might have a long-term impact in future. The overall system become unsustainable. So this resilience also is contributing to resilience. So this kind of tool is also very useful uh, for decision makers in very big projects or the, at a state level, governments can really use uh, taking certain districts and then you do this kind of assessment and uh, really know which kind of interventions need to be promoted to, to achieve the overall sustainability of the farm systems. The one more tool, this is my last slide, uh, which we are promoting again as a decision support. This is a farming systems uh, modeling tool where you have the crop model, livestock model, and economic model. So here uh, we are again using uh, five to 10 years data. So the crop model can suggest um, uh, based on the climatic variability, how you are getting the yields from the crops, uh, what you are getting from livestock, and then based on the market prices, labor availability, all the economic models um, gives it inputs and overall. So we can assess different strategy of climate smart agriculture or any other sustainable intensification strategies under different farms, farm types, uh, how, how much cash flows this is going to increase or not going to increase and whether it will be more stable or less stable. So this tool, again, we are working with the KVKs and uh, this can also help at, uh, especially at the farming systems level or a KVK level at uh, bundle level at the decision support uh, to guide the sustainable and resilient interventions at farm systems uh, scale. And so this is, this is all my presentations and we are very happy to, to, to work with researchers and the state governments uh, who, who want to really use those tools uh, for, um, for promoting climate smart agriculture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shailender, for saving some time. Uh, in fact, uh, when you said that this was your last slide, I, I just stopped myself from giving you a cue. So thanks a lot. And uh, if you can unshare, I will go ahead and then make my presentation. I request you to keep my time. <laughs> so yes. if you can keep my time. Just yes. give me, um, you know, I've, I've just, I was uh, clocking around 12 minutes. So uh, I was around 10 minutes, you can only. Give, yeah, you can, you can, uh, <laughs> You can give me a queue around 10 minutes. I'll wind up in the next one or two minutes. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, can you please unshare yours? Uh, okay. I'm still seeing your screen. Share it, sir, not at all. Okay, let me, I think I'm unable to do that. The window will be there at the bottom, just yeah, I have seen that. I have pressed it, but uh, share screen. Sir? To... There is entire screen, window screen, Chrome tab. Window, window. You go for yeah. window. Yeah, yeah. It's coming, sir. Mm. So maybe this is not the window. Maybe you can open your PPT and then once you say share, you can see that and instead of a click on that and share. Unshare it and do it again, sir. It has to be entire window.
the panel is krida farmer krida sir if any problem you can send me the slides sir i can do it from here yeah this other option sir my mail id is given in the chat box you can send to me i will do it from here sir Are you able to do it, Dr. Sinath? Sir, you have to unmute. He has disconnected now, joining back. What happened, Shilandar Ji? What are you doing, Dikshit Sir? Dikshit Sir? आपने उनका ये आपने अपना एक मिनट साइम बंद बचा लिया वो उनका पांच मिनट चला हाँ मैंने तो कोशिश किया था बचाने आर यू एबल टू हियर मी नाउ यस आई गोट लॉग्ड आउट सो आई एम सॉरी आई विल वंस अगेन हमें शेयर कर दो रसन और आप कोई प्रॉब्लम है आई एम अपलोडिंग इट Are you able to see now? No, sir, not yet. Not yet. That's the problem. Give me a minute. If it's uh, yeah. It's coming, yes. sir. Yeah, I'm really sorry about this. Uh, there's some confusion. Two tabs were open. Yeah, let me uh, not take much time. Let me go straight to the uh, my presentation. Sir, go to slides or words. Slide. Yeah, I, I'm doing that. Thank you, sir. Yeah, it's full screen now, I guess. Yes, sir. So um, this has slightly modified my title of my presentation. Adaptation to climate change, scaling and best management practices in drylands is what I have put it as a title. Um, we know most of the challenges in drylands, and we have been discussing it with uh, uh, you all. And a lot of experts have already uh, talked about it. I won't go more in detail into it. But the most important thing we are addressing here is water scarcity which many uh, of the ecologies, agroecosystems suffer from almost a quarter of a year to almost half of the year. This is due to the scattered rainfall as well as the variability in high degree of variability in rainfall and not being able to make use of the rainfall when there are high incidence rainfalls as well. And besides that, there is declining groundwater level. So leading to large amount of fallows due to migration of the people, especially those owning smaller patches of lands would uh, find it profitable to migrate elsewhere. And there are other uh, problems that, are, have, that have been already plaguing the agriculture sector and more so in dryland areas. And uh, the natural resource management, which is uh, 
thought to be one of the great, uh, one of the one of the time tested tools for uh, addressing these problems has uh, uh, not been really taken up in a in a science based and data driven way, but more or less it is always done on um, target oriented approach. So when we talk about the scaling up of this kind of approaches. So it's, it took quite a while for uh, uh, the, the group of group uh, working on the, the natural resource management, particularly in rainwater management. From uh, it, it has taken quite a while to uh, hone the skills and then standardize methodologies to address uh, areas as uh, large as 35,000 hectares and now to somewhere around 28,000 hectares. So currently we work uh, in Bundelkhand region where I will be presenting the, the, the case study of which I'll be presenting to you in the few slides, following slides. Um, we started off uh, almost a decade ago, over a decade and a half ago, uh, with just about 850 hectares. And today we are able to address these issues on much larger landscapes. So climate change, many of you have already confirmed, there is a very, very strong evidence that the climate change is happening, especially in terms of the reducing rainfall. If you look at this graph, the rainfall, which was about uh, 1,000 millimeters average rainfall has come down to 800 millimeters in a span of about uh, 60 to 70 years. Then uh, we started work uh, uh, way back in, in, in the year 2011-12 um, in a very small patch of area, about 1,250 hectares. There are some people uh, who are still keeping their mics on. Can you please advise them? Um, then, then of course, uh, here, uh, the, the barren lands, uh, once cultivated lands, was quite high. Almost a quarter of the lands that were once cultivated had been left fallow. On the one side, we, we see the pressure on cultivated, cultivated land. On the other side, we see the cultivable, cultivable land being left fallow, which is a large concern. Um, and here, um, when we started work on these landscape areas, we, we could bring in some palpable changes from very significant changes in crop intensification and crop yield. And uh, both in Karif and Ravi seasons, the fallow lands, uh, uh, the, 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 the lands that were left fallow uh, were uh, contained and uh, more and more uh, fallow lands were being brought into cultivation. Besides that, Crops, crop yields like wheat, barley, mustard, chickpea, all these things uh, saw a significant increase. The increase was between 10 and 70%. And uh, this was the system productivity could go up because we could very successfully bring in the fallow lands, both in Kharif and Ravi season. This is one picture, which is a telltale picture. When we started our work in 2011, all that you see in red uh, was all fallow. And that was the time when that year, 1150 millimeters of rainfall, way above the average rainfall, was received in this area, but still a large part of land was fallow. Just next, next year, a couple of years, that is three years later, we saw uh, just about 750 millimeters, nearly a little more than half of what we received in 2011. But because of the interventions that were done across major stream network, what you are seeing here as small blue triangles were all the interventions made in the, on the landscape to harvest the rainwater. And as a result, there was a significant reduction in the fallow land. And next, next season was in fact a drought year and this provided a much better picture than what 1150 millimeter rainfall situation provided. So uh, we can really uh, prove again later in the following slides, I'll explain to you how with data also this has been proved. Now, just let us have a look at uh, how uh, the area under cultivation in Karif increased uh, from 968 to 1057 hectares, but the, the net gain was also very significant, but uh, the major area that was increased was in Ravi, in Ravi season. That was because of the increased water levels and the net uh, area, net uh, generated income, which was not there at all, was almost uh, um, 35,000 US dollars. And uh, once the crop yield, uh, crop, uh, crop productivity increased, they also led to supply of uh, crop residue, which also helped increase milk production. 
and uh, now after emboldening ourselves by treating this kind of, by getting this kind of results we went ahead to follow this ridge to valley approach in a very very large scale by uh, dividing the undulated slopes what you are seeing here is uh, the where my cursor is so this is a place where uh, uh, from odisha where uh, slopes of 4 to 5% even slopes of 12% are seen so these lands were divided into smaller plots to contain soil erosion and uh, here this is again a typical bundelkhand area where ridge to valley approach has been there so uh, going back again to the same theory that i explained to you earlier there was a, a satellite image also proves what i just explained to you in 2019 there were about only 4 hectares of area cultivated during ravi season which went up to 35 uh, hectares and later in the last season over 100 hectares of barren land were brought into cultivation this is because people left it barren because for want of water and the net income from this system almost rose to 10 times and then to 30 times from the base value and the net income also follows more or less the same uh, trend and uh, the the investment was not really very high when it comes to a state government like uh, uh, uttar pradesh so we could create almost a 100,000 meter cube water facility, which led to a huge uh, uh, raise in the groundwater level, which, which came from 10 meters from ground level to four meters and now just two meters. And well recovery period, which is a very, very important one when it comes to irrigating wheat, which is the second crop there, from 120 hours to 20 hours to 10 hours. In fact, when we went in there, people used to wait for five hours for the five days for the well uh, after pumping out all the water they would wait for five days for the well to recover the same ah. water and now they are able to do mm. it just with uh, overnight waiting so this is how the landscape uh, approach uh, looked like and uh, large scale uh, rainwater harvesting structures traditional water rainwater harvesting structures were renovated and using better technology so these were all traditional technology known as haveli cultivation this the bunts that you see were used to be only earthen bunts then we went in for core wall construction with cement core wall in between and so that this amount of water could be harvested and all the drainage lines were cleared so that there was a proper um, conveyance of the rainwater into these uh, uh, places so again, I will not go uh, to explain the same kind of data here as well, but let me come here and spend a few uh, minutes here, maybe a minute or two here, to just to try to take your attention from the graph here, the first graph on the left-hand side top. So before we entered this season, this area, so to in order to achieve a groundwater recharge of about uh, 60 mm, uh, there was a requirement of almost 1200 millimeters of rainfall in the event of no intervention. So we could harvest the same 60 mm of groundwater, achieve the same amount of 60 mm groundwater recharge, even when six, 600 millimeters of rainfall was received. In other words- Richard, you have two minutes. Yeah, well. sure, I'm, I'm almost uh, uh, completing. So this is how uh, we were uh, able to uh, cut down the, the groundwater uh, recharge uh, time that was required by intervening and similarly we also saw what is called as the the uh, base flow uh, also improved tremendously base flow is one very important uh, aspect where uh, which gives us uh, the ecosystem benefits now let me summarize this one what are the strategies that we uh, use for scaling up best management practices for uh, in imparting resilience on large landscapes so the best management practices from 5,000 hectares to 20,000 hectares, we have now almost very, very confident that these can be, these can be uh, helpful in covering nearly 30 to 50 village clusters uh, where we can enhance ecosystem services and get system level impact. Integration of landscape approaches with farm level interventions for resilient uh, agrarian households. So if we take up uh, um, interventions on the landscape level, it ultimately translates the benefits at uh, bringing resilience at the household, household levels for those agricultural families. And this requires excellent planning, designing and execution and cost effective rainwater harvesting structures with appropriate hydraulic design, as well as considering the hydrology at the landscape level. So we need to integrate these approaches to connect livelihoods with the environmental benefits and ecosystems. That is when we get people's participation. 
and we need to go on generating data driven evidence for attributing the impact because this is what the policy makers require us to do so this is in brief about our work in um, bundelkhand and in general this is the approach we follow to build resilience on a landscape level to accrue benefits at the farm household level thank you very much so over to you again yeah thank you very much uh, i will first uh, unshare this one and uh, um, come back to uh, uh the the questions that i have noted for each of the uh, the panelists uh, thank you uh, for uh, all the panelists particularly dr raju uh, with a very short notice you chipped in and uh, uh, gave a very wonderful um, presentation on the methodology adopted just let me to begin the discussion let me have a a quick question uh, dr raju Uh, yes there is a, there is a uh, there is always uh, you know the a conflict between the revenue boundaries and the agroecological zones that we have um, what kind of challenges do you face can you can you repeat sir question yeah uh, we have a challenge of the revenue boundaries which is the district boundaries where we basically classify these districts as vulnerable not vulnerable or etc etc uh and these there are certain large districts even in small districts we see that there two agro ecological zones uh, overlap so part of the district is uh, to give a very very uh, 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 vivid example of the chikmagalur district in karnataka the part of the district which is abetting chitradurga district is highly drought prone whereas the elevated uh, portion of chikmagalur district elsewhere is a high zone rainfall zone so the vulnerabilities are different but when we uh, classify a district as a vulnerable district how are these accounted for sir uh, this is a uh, uh, when we are computing we are considering district as a unit so uh, it, it what uh, you are uh, uh, making this point is uh, is a really valid point that is the constraint in uh, district level analysis so if uh, one part of the district is uh, very resourceful and one part of the another part of the district is uh, somewhat uh, resource uh, crunch is there so you may be looking at net or average uh, as not a big problem but if you see uh, within the district uh, then the, that uh, really a problem so so that uh, wherever this will be more uh, and uh, useful or scope of this uh, analysis will be limited to the districts which are more or less homogeneous more or less i don't say so some do not even your chikbala or even if you see pune also there are uh, three def- three different uh, agroecological systems are there in pune district also so like this if you consider uh, around uh, some 20 25 districts will be there in the country as a whole so a m- lot of heterogeneity within a uh, uh, district uh, for them uh, there is a very uh, means the res- uh, uh, high uh, time uh, uh, requirement is that uh, sub district level analysis will give the true picture even uh, if people appreciate that uh, people farmers say that even within a village also there is heterogeneity some uh, some farmer of uh, this side some farmer on the other side uh, this uh, resource are different and they say soil depths are different many problems are there so at a district level uh, definitely whatever you are uh, telling that problem will be there so for those districts uh, sub district level analysis or block level like that shailendra has made even uh, uh, further also within a block also sometimes maybe some kind of analysis may be required thank you thank you very much dr raju so uh, i also understand that uh, the analysis the risk analysis that we have done at the moment is a dynamic exercise uh, because let us imagine that over a period of time in a in a vulnerable district we have an excellent development of uh, the the farmers institutions like uh, sgs fpos and uh, they uh, connect to the market in a much better way and uh, they they develop a very good value chain for the products that the produce that they uh, uh, you know grow there so in the event of that whether these vulnerability index changes and uh, uh, what kind of uh, uh, futuristic uh, Mm, methodology could be uh, could be thought of uh, in the event of this happening 
Sir, it's true. Whatever that is a dynamic, like you are mentioning in Bundel countries, Ian. You uh, means uh, laid down a big foundation uh, for uh, action research and uh, bringing, trying to bring out a lot of changes. So definitely, there will be some changes in uh, when uh, you have the, because of your watershed approach uh, or uh, some uh, water productivity will increase or uh, what uh, means water uh, resource. Uh, means has been uh, means resource has been created, potential irrigation potential has been enhanced. So because of this, uh, after four five years, uh, definitely the vulnerability of the those districts may definitely change. So that's why our CRIDA even has made uh, vulnerability assessment in 2013. So we revised this in 2019 in six years. So at least uh, once in 10 years uh, there will be some changes. Even uh, government also not only this from uh, government of India or state governments, many government state governments are also taking very good steps. For example, Prime Minister Christine Chai Yojana is there. So with that, a uh, lot of uh, changes are happening, uh, district irrigation plans, and uh, so some districts are making good progress. So once this uh, status or statistics uh, are changed, percentage irrigated area is changing from uh, uh, some 30% to 50%, something. some districts, it is a lot of changes were there. Even we published one paper in Economic and Political Weekly, there we mentioned, so means based on Anumantra committee, what uh, they consider two criteria. One is uh, ecology of the district and another irrigation in the district. So based on this, they consider uh, whether a district should be eligible for a certain program or not. So that also we made that, uh, that just I have shown in my presentation also. In Eastern India, the climate has become, uh, aridity has increased in Eastern India. A lot of districts uh, have changed from moist subhumid to dry subhumid. So as per the Anumantra criteria, now they are becoming eligible for drought-prone uh, relief programs and all. So like this, uh, if uh, irrigation has increased, then definitely uh, those things will go away again. So definitely this uh, dynam is a dynamical and it can uh, bring changes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Raju. But last one, uh, I did not see in the index criteria that you have uh, mentioned, maybe uh, I might have missed, but can you confirm uh, just like what you now talked about the PMKSY, which is a very important initiative, there uh, we have been having the so-called uh, watershed development programs uh, in almost all the dryland uh, uh, agricultural districts, dry districts. Uh, have we considered or given any weightage for the ongoing government programs which uh, address the watershed development or the natural resource management? So in this perspective means uh, we are not uh, looking this uh, from the uh, perspective of source. We are looking at uh, from the perspective of sink. So whatever programs uh, are been uh, have, are happening in those uh, field level programs are happening in those districts, th that there will be a uh, outcome based on this and manifestation of these programs will be there in the form of uh, enhancement in uh, irrigation potential or increased irrigated area or uh, yield developments progressive. So once we are capturing this development in those from those indicators, ir enhanced irrigation or percent irrig irrigated area increase and all. So uh, uh, that is the outcome indicator through which we are collecting that information, not directly, indirectly we are capturing that into the uh, this index. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I request the audience to uh, type their questions in the chat box in the meantime. Uh, this is only to warm up. I have been asking some questions. I expect, uh, uh, you know, really critical questions from the audience um, in the meantime. So let me now uh, drain my gun okay. towards uh, okay. uh, Dr. Shalender have, have the and uh, shoot a few questions to him. Uh, Dr. Shalender, it was a, it was a, it's a very very interesting presentation that you made. I I kind of forgot one uh, interesting thing because that's uh, based on the work that we have been doing. So you said that uh, um, farm pond presence of farm pond uh, in a particular region, whether to what extent these farm ponds can kind of uh, uh, help impart resilience and then you took that as one of the criteria but you i'm sure you also uh, are aware that uh, most of the programs that are aiming at farm ponds are mostly target driven um, well in my presentation i made one point where i i said that uh, uh, there is a need for uh, scientifically assessing the need as well as determine at the landscape level what kind of rainwater harvesting structure should be done. So taking farm pond alone as a, a means of uh, you know uh, one of the inputs to your uh, models would it not uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, vitiate your your output of the model? 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, um, uh, first, I come to before I come to the answer of this question, I just want to add to your previous one uh, because the same analysis which Raju has done for the whole country, we have done for uh, Telangana. So, some uh, addressing some of the questions which you raised. So, we have gone to the mandal level, and because data at the climate is coming at the grid level. So, when you are doing mandal level, so mostly sometimes these grids are matching, and only some cases. Also, in case of when you are doing specifically for a state, because for the country level, it is very difficult, only outcome you can consider. So, like we considered also the potential area of irrigation under Kaleshwaram project. So, even at the time when it is, was not there, but we discussed with the irrigation fields. So, we added some more area into those mandals where it is coming in next, uh, say, one year or two years, and based on which. Uh, and then also the third point that it needs to be really revised every five years or six years, and it is possible because already the whole framework is there. We have to just change some of the data of uh, the country once the data is there. Then I come to now the farm pond. Yes, very um, uh, relevant question. So what we did when we did the, um, uh, uh, the, the stakeholder consultations for three days, uh, involving all these district level officers from all the departments of Telangana and looking at what is happening, so then we came up with some criteria. In this case, we did not really uh, discuss, discuss at the landscape level interventions in terms of water set, uh, which is not really a very intensive program as of now. Uh, when you talk about Telangana in, in most of the districts, uh, in the past, a lot of work has been done in Telangana, uh, but now the focus is more on uh, enhancing or creating more irrigated area through uh, bigger tanks or uh, these projects and then farm ponds. So maybe it will create certain problem, but uh, we really did not have any check on that. So mostly the farmers who has more than two hectares of land. And what we found that our analysis, what we calculated is coming almost the same number of farm ponds which government wants to do, but, but the number which we identified in different bundles are different because the total numbers are same, but the allocation is different. Uh, but your question is right, uh, partly address and partly not. You are muted. Uh, uh, before before I, I go to another question, um, I think Dr. Desai has raised his hand. Yeah. Uh, over to you, Dr. Desai. Okay, thank you very much. It was a good discussion. Uh, I have two points, two concerns rather to raise. Thing is that initially we had all planned about farm ponds. And now with the increasing intensity of the rainfalls with the mini reduced uh, number of events, you're getting more water. So now what is that the optimum farm pond size you anticipate to have it in the field so that the farmer really gets benefit out of that technology. He can't sacrifice more land area, but he can't also wait for too long period for the next season. That's one thing. Quite a few of us talk about the groundwater recharge. Me and Dr. Kevira, quite often we discussed on this, does it really happen? Because we are drawing water somewhere 600 feet, 700 feet, does it percolate that down? That's a big question. Yeah, because right. We all know that water flows through aquifers, which are limited aquifers and then continuous aquifers. We don't know where their roots are and all those things. We are all claiming that groundwater is recharged. It's a big question. Thank you. So I, I think okay. I'll take this question. I'll take this question. Karo and then partly I will attempt later. Yeah. First. I'll take this question. Um, one is about the farm ponds. Farm pond is not the panacea. Quite unfortunate. Uh, it is quite unfortunate. I would like to go back to the one good joke that I had uh, heard some time back about uh, Vidarbha. It seems uh, uh, some uh, some person when there were a lot of uh, you know droughts in Vidarbha leading to a lot of farmer suicide, someone came and then gave a suggestion that the agricultural scientists in Akola have developed a wonderful technology called farm ponds. So why don't we go for it? So suddenly, you know, the government wanted to do something, I mean, to be seen as doing something very quickly. So they uh, draw, drew up a plan for uh, digging uh, maybe a few millions of farm ponds. And then this whole proposal went to the Matralaya in Mumbai and finally went to the finance department where the bean counter, the accounts department people looked at and then calculated the total area 
of the farm ponds that uh, so many farm ponds they wanted and then multiplied the simply by the, this thing and it not only exceeded the Vidarbha region, the entire Maharashtra geographic region, it went, I mean, it, it exceeded. So what the point that I'm trying to drive here is that the farm ponds have always been treated as um, uh, something like, uh, you know, a, a, um, a panacea, but uh, they are not really uh, designed in a scientific way, keeping in the hydrology in, in the mind. So, um, so therefore, uh, definitely, the point you said is that the the calibration of the farm pond size will have to be made based on the runoff uh, soil type and the rainfall relationships, and that needs to be done. It's not like you know our uh, software uh, done by the Tata Consultancy Services only allows ten by ten by ten in Emrega, Manrega, and we do only that. So I have partly answered your question. And second thing is, yes, it does happen depending on how long we are able to impound the water um, on the ground. It again varies. Even uh, in Bundelkhand region, which is known to be having an impervious layer just below uh, uh, the, the soil, about, about a one meter below the soil. So we have demonstrated, and that's the reason why I, I gave you that uh, uh, graph and it has been the data has been collected once in every 15 days and it is open to be checked. Uh, well, there are again, you know, as you said, different kinds of geographies. There cannot be one rule of thumb that some everywhere it happens and everywhere it doesn't happen. It again depends on the the uh, the kind of soil, the kind of impervious layer, and how long we are impounding it, and how big is the aquifer, and what is the zone of influence. There's so many things and hydrological parameters. Which hydrologists are good to answer. Vikshit, so I, groundwater board. No, I think please let us not have a discussion on this one because there is. There is a, I'm sorry, I have to. I have to. I have to moderate this. Can I? Can I add very briefly? Very briefly because we have to now stop I, this. Yeah, uh, I will not go in detail on on, please, let, on let just me, farm pond. Let me please complete. Let me please complete. Just uh, just me, thirty seconds. Let me. Please okay, please please go ahead. Uh, you know, we have only five minutes and I've been getting uh, cues from the organizers. Okay. And this is probably the last intervention by um, Shalinder and then we will go to the questions that are there in the chat box. And we have to uh, short hand it over back to the organizer at 245. Thank you. Over to you, Shalinder. So very briefly, I just wanted to add that we, uh, we have published a paper in Agriculture Water Management when I was in Theta. We did a systematic study of farm ponds in six states of India. It's a very location specific. It comes with the, you have to design for the farm pond for the particular region. Then you have to have a lifting, water lifting devices. What crops you will use for, the water you will use for. So the same Vidarva in my study was the best success story of the farm pond in a whole district where series of farm ponds were made and highest uh, in productivity enhancement and profitability because of the governance because of the community, because of the lifting devices and because of the kind of crops and because of the, the right place of the ponds. So it's, it's really possible, but uh, it is not done as a package. It is done, done just as a one, uh, one intervention by one department without knowing what others need and what other department need to come in. So those issues are there, which we have in detail addressed the, in that paper also. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. There is one question um, in the chat box. Uh, whether any prototype is created and it can be replicated uh, to all over India. Also, some difficulties on how uh, to solve them can help implement this model. Uh, about probably, okay, Sheshkiri's question is about the model that uh, we spoke. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, probably I presented, I, I presume this question is directed to me. So, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Sheshkari, this is not the, the case. It cannot be, there cannot be one model. That is why uh, it has to be a site specific uh, uh, solution. So, we can have a separate discussion again. I can only answer this uh, at this moment on this. Um, so, I don't see any, any questions here. Findings need to go or as advisories to farmers and state departments. Yes. Um, I think uh, we have uh, just two more uh, minutes to spare. Uh, I'm handing it over uh, uh, to the organizers with these two minutes uh, in reserve. Thank you very much. I thank my panelists. I thank Kappa for providing me this opportunity to, to um, moderate this discussion. I'm sorry that I couldn't take many of the questions and, uh, and there was a discussion that was happening 
I am sorry to have uh, uh, cut it down, but uh, in the interest of time. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Srinath, uh, Shalender, Raju, and uh, everyone. It was interesting. It is very, very important to note that it's all uh, region specific, site specific, and also the kind of uh, adavic factors what we have and the downpour that happens. Take the tragedy of Bundelkhand. You see, Bundelkhand is the driest region what we quote about, but it rains in certain areas 800 to 900 millimeters in 15 days. And after that, there is no rain. So the kind of strategies we need to implement in such areas differ from other areas. So we can't be drawing a, a generalized view of implementing certain uh, strategies commonly. And uh, each one of uh, you have put together how the indices, the vulnerability, and all other things could be addressed. So your rich experience probably uh, can be put together in the policy document to say that how strategic interventions in these areas could be made. So because of uh, lack of time, we can't be taking forward the uh, discussion. So thank you very much, each one of you. So thank we you. will connect back again on certain platforms. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very much. So now we move on to the next session. Uh, so part of the same session, the next uh, presentation by Mr. Rohan Parikh from Nurture Farm. Uh, he would be speaking on uh, the carbon credits, then incentivizing sustainable agriculture for the Indian farmer. This is the new concept uh, which we are all uh, dwelling with basically. So Nurture Farm uh, is really trying to put together how uh, these can be the trading commodities and the more credits could be garnered. So on this point, uh, uh, before we, we go to his lecture, uh, we will have the introduction of Rohan Parikh. Yes, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, sir. We are very much delighted to welcome Dr. Mr. Rohan Parikh, uh, who is heading the sustainability at Natcha Farm, Bengaluru, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of UPL. At Natcha Farms, Dr. Rohan is responsible for helping the farmers adopt sustainable agriculture practices so that they can produce more from less, that is, from more from less inputs and use of less emissions and uh, less chemicals. Prior to that, Dr. Rohan worked as a sustainable development consultant, helping several large educational institutions like IAM Trichy, National Law School, Nagpur, IHS Kengeri, uh, to design their net zero energy and net zero campuses. In his previous capacity as vice president at Infosys and head of infrastructure and sustainability, he led their initiatives of becoming a carbon neutral company, which they attained the carbon neutral status in 2020. We are happy to have you here today, sir. The platform is yours. Yeah, Rohan, welcome. Uh, so uh, five minutes we will have at the end for a discussion. Maybe you can cut together uh, to fit it in 25 minutes slot. That would be great. Yeah, sure. I, I think I'll make it shorter than that. So th uh, first, I'd like to thank you all for inviting me to share my experiences. I've been working in sustainable development for the last um, uh, 15, 16 years, uh, very focused, um, started the journey, uh, you know, at, at Infosys. And what, what I have seen over this last uh, 16 years is that unless uh, the shift in practice to a more sustainable practice can only happen when the user or the end user is incentivized. Um, my experience in the past at Infosys has been that, you know, when we started our journey, Infosys was really about consuming energy in buildings. And unless the uh, green buildings were either at a lower cost or was saving dramatic amount of energy, it would not have got the push, right? Even though um, it's, a, it's a very cash rich company uh, and with very high aspirations. So what we saw and what we uh, noticed is that when you try, uh, when you try a very deep focus on energy efficiency, it actually turns out to be um, cheaper in the first cost. And so there's no question of a payback. And that adoption really helped Infosys reduce their energy consumption by 50%. And then the balance 50% was funded, uh, was powered by renewable energy, right? The same strategy now we are trying to see how we can use, you know, incentives to drive change in agriculture. Now we all understand that 
agriculture per se has a has a very deep uh, uh, you know impact on our planet right 70% of the world's fresh water is consumed in agriculture 40% of the earth's land mass is in agriculture 20% of the world's emissions are in agriculture and and of those emissions right 45% of the world's methane comes from agriculture uh, from uh, farm boundaries not agriculture necessarily but and 80% of the nitrous oxide emissions uh, are also from farm boundaries so if agriculture has such a big impact first of, first of all how do we really first reduce the emissions and then in in our flight for, fight for climate change you know how can we make agriculture a net sink and a solution for climate change so that was the focus with which nurture was started uh, at least my division and nurture was started with that nurture in general is a wholly on subsidy of upl was started with a with a goal of saying how do we double the farmers income um i'm sorry i can't see my own presentation so is that presentation on or you have to share oh, that sir. you have to share it sir i have to share it okay i thought uh, you know i'd sent it earlier so okay okay did not tell me uh, that is the reason right no he will share it otherwise yeah elam okay sir i'll do that no i can share it no problem i mean if you want me to share it elam you are sharing you said it yeah i'm sharing it okay. Okay. can you okay. see it now Yes, sir. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, like I mentioned to you, you know, uh, the focus of nurture is really making agriculture simple, profitable, and sustainable through technology-led solutions. It's a it's a technology arm of uh, of UPL. It's really the last mile, taking ideas to the farmers and making them more resilient. and we are from pre sowing all the way to beyond the crop cycle um, and i'll take you to the next slide which talks a little more about it so we have four verticals um, and the reason why i'm talking about a little about nurture is because it shows you you know how we are focused on helping the farmer increase his income because any intervention is not possible unless a farmer sees something in it for himself right so uh, we are we are divided into four main verticals um, the first vertical is farm machinery uh this is a this is a vertical or a platform a peer to peer platform where we offer farm machinery services so anybody who owns a machine uh, just like a uber and a ola can register on our platform as a as a service provider and anybody who wants to avail the services can actually go on online and and avail this now in the past uh, couple of years that we've been providing the services we have been pro we have seen that the cost of farm machinery services is lower then the cost of doing these manual uh, job right and specifically if we talk about spraying we have seen that the cost of spraying is almost half the cost of manual spraying and so farmers therefore go and adopt and complete all the sprays that are uh, required uh, for them to do this uh, for them to ensure that the crops are properly protected and their yields are properly protected um, the retail platform that we have is a platform where um, you know agriculture uh, i mean fertilizer sorry um, retailers can actually buy products from oems this is a platform the advantage of this platform over anything uh, over others is that there is a guaranteed uh, 248 hour uh, response where the delivery of of the chemicals or the fertilizers is delivered to the retailers now we are able to you know run models which help uh, farmers uh, which help predict when a occurrence of pest or disease is going to likely to happen and if we are able to predict this accurately we are able to give a uh, you know a nudge to the retailer said this this is what you may want to store for the next few weeks because there's a likely outbreak of this particular pest or disease similarly a week before we are able to you know go and uh, nudge the farmer saying that through our digital platform saying that this is where you can actually you may want to start protecting yourself uh, prevention is better than cure so you may want to take uh, preventive action the trade vertical is really a vertical which takes the farmers produce and helps them get better pricing now we bring in a lot of efficiency through you know bulk uh, bulk transfer bulk transport all of that but also the there is an aspect of green labeling because we are working with farmers to shift their practices to sustainable practices um we are we are uh, trying to see how we can get them a better uh, pra pra sorry a better pricing globally and the last uh, uh, vertical which i had is the sustain vertical now this is a platform where we are trying to do more from less 
really looking at seeing how we can uh, you know generate more nutritious food with less land less water less uh, energy less emissions and less chemicals so um, i will uh, talk a lot more in detail so the sustainable practice has virtually you know typically three pillars the first is looking at farmers financial impact and fi financial resilience um, we are trying to help the farmer increase the yield now how we do it is through advisory uh, services we also have a concept called a pro nutiva package which is a package of practice it's a package of practice which consists of both protection and nutrition and therefore the pro nutiva and the last uh, which i mentioned recent uh, just now is about through green labeling and getting getting them a premium uh, the environment impact is really uh, focused on energy reduction um, emission reduction uh, water reduction and and using improving soil health and the farmers resilience comes from you know um, lesser exposure to you know dangerous chemical because of mechanical spraying we are also looking at farm insurance uh, where we offer farm insurance to all our farmers for either weather or for um, uh, or yield and some of these products are really to ensure that the if something goes wrong with the farmer you know their families are protected and lastly on a societal impact we are creating fair amount of uh, you know um, in, uh, uh, employment in the villages but specifically by recruiting women in in the in the villages to you know as a field force now coming really to the green the carbon part which is the you know crux of today's conversation uh, really we started a journey thinking about uh, what are the biggest problems in, in you know in agriculture especially related to the carbon side of it or the emission side of it and while we were talking to various players the one thing that stood out was the uh, the health uh, impact and the emissions or the pollution that is created from burning um, paddy in, in punjab and haryana so we partnered with uh, iari and looked at their pusa decomposer and what we've done is we licensed that uh, pusa decomposer and converted it into a powder just like you know how we how we have yeast as granules for which is also a fungus we looked at their cocktail of eight different funguses converted it into a powder and used our spraying machines we have about 3000 spraying machines and we did a pilot of about 4 lakh acres last year and that was a huge huge success because this pusa decomposer was able to decompose the the crop in situ and because it was done in situ of course the uh, the carbon particulate matter from the burning was eliminated but more so even the nutrients remained in the soil the carbon increased in the soil and we were able we are we are in a position to pay for the entire service free of charge through the carbon revenues now the we didn't expect the farmer to pay anything for the pusa decomposer nor for the, neither for the manufacturing transport or for the spraying of it it was all offered free to the farmers but it was at a huge cost to us and fortunately through the carbon revenues we were able to um, recover we will be able to recover some of the cost so this this was done at a 400000 acre uh, scale uh, we have spoken to various buyers globally Uh, on carbon credits they do appreciate the impact that this kind of programs do uh, do uh, create and so the impact that they evaluated was one from a health impact right because the burning the avoidance of burning created um, and you know, stopped a, a lot of the part, uh, carbon uh, pm 10 and pm 2.5 particulate matter now this is causing a huge amount of health impact especially you know for the elderly and for the very young and so the the buyers do recognize this and also uh, what it did do is it it added more carbon into the ground right so we are in some sense remove because we incorporated the the residue into the ground um, and that is also something that you know companies globally are recognizing especially companies who have taken uh, targets of voluntary uh, uh, you know emission reduction and becoming carbon neutral just like the infosys that i worked with earlier these companies are, are willing to give you a premium specifically for agriculture done uh, projects because they recognize that the effort required is humongous compared to the other projects now in the past carbon credits were very well known really for energy efficiency and renewable energy projects but today they are gaining a lot of momentum in agriculture which is which is the right incentive today for a farmer to change uh, you know because the farmer's first question is 
what is it in for me right i mean you know for me burning the crop is very easy it is the cost of a matchstick why would i want to do that they do recognize that it it the air pollution affects them the most but however you know because of the lack of labor and the cost of baling it or removing it from the field they find it easier to to burn it though they, they do recognize that non burning would be better for them so they they have seen benefits we've been able to translate those benefits to them up front by giving it free uh once that funnel opened up right i mean nurture is all about a digital platform right so we we did all of this activity through booking the spray services for the bioenzyme uh, for the uh, cocktail of funguses through our app we have a, a a large amount of farmers about 1.5 million farmers today on our platform and a large number of them are transacting so what we did is that we said that if you uh, book through the app it will be completely free of charge for you so one is that we were able to bring them on a, a digital platform and because they are on a digital platform we are also able to uh, from time to time give them uh, insights you know advisory through their smartphones right which is also very critical for the farmers now that the funnel had opened up to this 4 lakh acres um what we also did is we looked at those same set of farmers and said what else can we do them do with them right so we ran a pilot last kharif um in punjab and haryana across 20000 acres where we where we worked with the farmers on awd and dsr techniques um basically a water reducing technique but because of the drying events or the aeration events we have seen that uh, you know we are able to reduce methane emissions now what we did in our first year was we took the the standard ipcc defaults in terms of what is the methane emission reduction and based on that uh, we were able to generate about 0.83 credits carbon credits per acre okay. and, and across 20000 acres that was a fairly fairly good you know no. yeah so that was a that was a fairly large experiment uh, that we did in 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 uh, reducing paddy emissions but not only did it reduce emissions by around 48 to 50% i mean of course we followed the techniques developed by ed um and we followed it uh, but of course for making the carbon credits happen it's a fairly evolved uh, project right for somebody to for the buyer to have faith in you that you've carried out the prog- program as prescribed by the methodology and ensuring that every stage of the success you have some documentation we had to modify our our mobile app to document every stage of the thing so we the way we did this is we distributed the perforated pipes to every farmer and for every 3 acres or 2 acres or 3 acres we had one pipe installed in these fields where the farmer was then able to uh, monitor the level of the water in the paddy fields and up till they dropped it to 10 to 15 cm below they kept it dry and once it fell to between 10 to 15 cm they reflooded the paddy fields right and as a result we were able to uh, document all this with photographs uh, with satellite imagery and create these carbon credits now in this particular case what we've done is we have, we have gone back and we are rewarding the farmers so the way we are rewarding the farmers is we we have given them three options you can they can either buy insurance uh, through us of course because we have negotiated insurances at a very very large scale we've been able to get at a fairly good discount uh, for these same set of farmers or we have told them that you can get a cash price um, and the cash price could be up to 500 rupees a year or they can actually buy a product which is basically a biostimulant which will give them probably a 10x reward for for the same amount of cash price right and hence Uh, we have seen that uh, you know farmers did sign up to this technique they they did have a lot of doubts in the beginning but uh, you know uh, because we were fairly engaged with them all through the process we were hand holding them all through the process uh, they kind of not a, every farmer but a lot of farmers you know did go th- and complete the whole program and in the end they did see benefit i mean they saw saw a larger amount of tillering they saw a greater amount of root growth and hence you know in midway through the process they got the confidence that this is a the right technique for them uh, we were not able to quantify the increase in yield um, but uh, you know the farmers were definitely satisfied and all of the same farmers have come back to us this year signing up for the next year in punjab and haryana so that's a that's a good thing to happen this year of course we are expanding that program in punjab and haryana 
uh, dramatically, of course, because it is also supported by the government of Punjab now. They're giving a very handsome incentive of 1,500 rupees per acre to switch to DSR. Of course, DSR also has other benefits in terms of less labor and, and less expensive. But uh, having uh, seen the so having seen the success of AWD program in Punjab, we scaled scaled this up to one lakh twenty thousand acres in AP and Telangana, where we got a we got a really fantastic response from our farmers, and we were able to use uh, you know the anecdotes from the successful farmers in Punjab Haryana to convince these farmers. We were able to show them a lot of photographs of how the farmers uh, you know did the techniques, and and so we were able to now scale this now these two. You know, projects that we did last year were actually pre-sold. So we we have seen buyers who are willing to buy these credits upfront and pay you a fairly decent premium. And so it established a financial model. It established a success. Now, just like us, we we assume that you know, based on the success of this, and we've also published some of these st uh, stories in the media. We are hoping that based on success of this. There will be lots and lots of entrepreneurs just like us who will adopt these sustainable practices in agriculture and really first reduce the emissions. But over time, you know, just like the CRM program, which incorporates carbon into the soil, they will use many other techniques for conservation, conservation uh, agriculture, and they will uh, use many other techniques to ensure that the, the stock of carbon in the soil increases, right? And lastly, I want to you know, touch base upon the green labeling aspect of what we are doing. So we are working with some of the export firms and buyers. Now at COP26 recently, what we have seen is um, we've seen that more than 100 cor food corporations right, have taken a pledge that um, they want to buy sustainably grown food. Now, when we talk to some of the procurement guys, one thing that we hear from them clearly is that even though they have an intent, they don't see that there is enough supply in the market. Now, that's a good thing because if they start specifying that this is what they want as part of their buying process or their buying specs, then you will see a lot more farmers switching. So it's not just about carbon credits, but also through the green labeling program. Now, the green labeling program is, is right now not, not as popular, but as time progresses over the next few years, we do see that this is going to pick up a lot. We do see shelves in Europe now talking about you know, organically grown basmati, and they definitely want more and more attributes added. Conversations with various buyers have shown us that they want various different attributes added to the, to the organic part of it or the MRL part of it. Um, and and when, we spoke, when we speak to them about you know, stopping the burning as one of the attributes or reducing methane as another attribute, or decreasing water by 15 to 30% as a third attribute, they all do care for it. And they are all willing to uh, you know, uh, engage with us in terms of a conversation on how much premium they are they willing to pay. The initial conversations on premium on green labeling is fairly, fairly attractive. I mean, they're willing to give like a five rupee you know, increase in, uh, per, in price per kg. Now that would change the fortune of the farmer. And, and if that's something that you know, we can materialize in terms of a final output, um, it, will, it will really incentivize farmers to look at changing practices. And that's what really all of us really want is how do you make these things financially viable for a farmer? Because you know, in the beginning, when we had the conversations about switching to uh, the sustainable practices and we told them, and they were asking us, so what's, the, what's, what's it in for us? What are the advantages? And you tell them, yes, Listen, you're going to lose, use less water, right? And the res immediate response would be, yeah, but you know, water is free for us. And you say yes. And so you're going to, if you're going to use less water for, uh, you're also going to use less electricity for pumping, which is again free for them. Methane reducing by fifty percent really doesn't mean too much to them. And so they they would always come back to us saying, "What's in it for us, right?" So what they really want is if you can assure that we can pick up the produce that they deliver. Right, they don't. They, that's the assurances that they want. That if we can pick up the produce, sustainably grown produce, and give them even the market prices, or or meet the MSP prices or slight premium over that, that they are happy with that. Right. So there are two things that you know I'm going to leave you with, is that the carbon and green bro uh, labeling programs are are a big financial incentive to the farmers. This is something that I think we should offer to all the farmers in India. 
um, it helps them increase their profitability, but also helps them switch uh, practices. And once they switch practice, uh, they won't require a lot of persuasion, persuasion year after year after year, right? Many of our farmers who adopted the CRM practice, uh, the crop residue management for the paddy, which is the, you know, the PUSA decomposer practice, They've all come back and told us, uh, this is anecdotal, I want to you know, uh, uh, mention this, that we don't have uh, documented evidence in the first year. This year, of course, we want to plan to do that. They have come back and told us that they did use less fertilizers and they have seen uh, a fairly decent uh, you know, next crop, wheat crop. So we want to believe what they're saying. They, the, the proof is you know, how many of those same farmers sign up this year. Uh, we've just started the next year's uh, sign-up process, and we do see that most farmers whom we've reached out to have already expressed, um, uh, you know, willingness to sign up this year again. And and so, uh, a financial incentive is is a uh, is a really good incentive to switch practices. Is what I'm going to leave you as a thought process. So that's it from my side. I'd be happy to take questions from the audience, um, if any. Thank you, Rohan. Parikh, it was very nice and a new concept, uh, in fact. Uh, I, I, I was just trying to know, uh, for a smallholder farmer, is it the future of uh, uh, giving the machinery on the digital platform uh, like Uber? That is the way forward uh, for whole Pan India? Yeah, so uh, we have seen incredible success. I mean, you know, we have three thousand. We had three thousand machines of our, we have three thousand machines of our own for spraying. But when we opened that same platform, right, where farmers are booking these spray services from us to to everybody, right, who owned a machine, we've seen in the last three months we now have twenty thousand equipments or machinery on that same platform being offered. So I do see that because the only reason the spraying is profitable to us is because we are doing this on a continuous basis, right? The equipment is, is engaged on a continuous basis. And hence we are able to offer it at a price which is lower than the cost of spraying it manually, right? Similarly, anybody who you know, uh, uh, invests in a farm machinery, if they could uh, capitalize their, uh, the number of days that they can use the machinery using this platform, they would be able to also make better profits. You will see very soon over time, you will see that there are investors who are willing to invest uh, in, in machinery uh, because now the utilization is improving through, through uh, online apps. So, but uh, what about uh, uh, the costs involved in other operations? Basically harvesting takes a lot of this thing. Any other aggregation plan on this? Any, anything you have planned? Spraying yes, is so one, yeah. So this platform is open up for any implements, whether it's for cultivation, for a rotavita, for a harvester, equipment, or any implementation, including just lending a tractor. All of this is possible on the platform. So you just have to anybody who has the equipment registers as a service provider. Anybody who wants it books it and gets the access to it. They can book it. Say I want it on Tuesday at three p.m. I like this service. So that's possible. I mean, of course, then we. We also let them do an offline conversation just to be sure that, you know, uh, the transaction really goes through. Yeah. Uh, one question in the chat box is uh, basically for the green tagging, what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, the premium price, is it sustainable over time? Yeah. And uh, can you, can we really value tag it like that based on the green label or nutrition or anything like that? Uh, uh, so my personal opinion is, I think it's very, very sustainable. I mean, you know, we have seen uh, various categories if it's marketed well uh, and it's positioned well. Um, I think there is. Uh, I mean, let me give you an example. I mean, let's like let's talk about sustainable sugar. We are working right now with uh, reducing water con water consumption by fifty percent in sugar. And uh, uh, through uh, so, if if you are able to reduce that water by fifty percent, and say. Uh, we go to a company like Starbucks and tell them that your coffee that you're selling at 299, we are going to charge you 300 rupees. You will charge you one rupee more. So instead of 299, you sell it at 300. Uh, for that one sachet that of sugar that you give away, saying that this is sustainably grown sugar. Now, I don't think consumers are going to mind paying, when they're willing to pay 299, they won't mind paying a 300 rupees for it, right? And, and you know, another example I would like to leave with you is that 
let's say you're talking about sustainably grown uh, uh, rice paddy we know that everybody in delhi ncr region today has a uh, air purifier which cost maybe between 5000 to 20000 rupees depending on the size and the quality that you buy rupees per per air purifier many of them have multiple of those in their homes now if you tell them that per kg of rice you have to pay 2 rupees more or 3 rupees more and that will help you save the pollution in delhi by or uh, reduce the pollution in delhi by 50% uh i think buyers like you and me would not hesitate paying 2 rupees more for that sustainably grown rice so i do believe that uh, a premium of a, a small number like a 2 or 3 rupees on a, on a 60 rupees or a 100 rupee kg will not really move the needle for many people i mean it will not affect a lot of people it will they will indulge in you know paying the being able to pay the premium for a better quality of life so uh, one more question uh, maybe the last question is uh okay on the on your platform carbon credit can be aggregated and traded now there is a concept of fpos then uh, infusing good agricultural practices can carbon credit also be part of uh, this moment yes yeah, so right now last till last year what we did is um, you know the entire carbon program was just focused on uh, farmers who are dealing directly with nurture right we had feet on the ground uh it was very assisted program because you know we were supplying them pipes we were going to the fields assisting them with you know putting the pipes in the ground helping them monitor take pictures evidences all of that what we are now doing is we are making the platform uh very open uh we are making the platform um uh, we are productizing this whole platform in a manner that it becomes easy for, even unassisted right and the moment it becomes unassisted easy there will be a lot of farmers across the country but why limit yourself to across the country right now a farmer in vietnam who can use my app can also go online um, learn the pro- uh, is, get is follow the step by step process follow the process document the evidences and can register their projects with us right so uh, over time over time these programs will become global uh, over time this uh, the the platform will become more and more robust as of now it is really self it is assisted but maybe in the next couple of months uh, and definitely before rabi uh, we will have you know the productized version of it right so people across the world can start using this is there, is there any campaign uh, that is possible to educate the farmers farming groups about carbon credits so that would facilitate the better agricultural practices and green labeling yes and and we 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 plan to launch a series of this uh, over time uh, we are just waiting for our productized platform to be ready uh, i just want to tell you that you know the success of this program is so humongous that this year we are scaling from you know the 0.45 million acres that i spoke about or 5 million uh, sorry 0.5 million acres that i spoke about to more than a million acres um the response that we are seeing we might end up at 2 million in in one year right so that's a significant jump from where we were in just one year and a lot of this is because word of mouth is spreading to you know in the same village the uh, farmers who didn't participate last year with us are now keen on participating this year right so uh, amongst the uh, focus areas it is definitely going to expand but once the product is ready and we have a platform then we want to you know do a marketing campaign across the country to be able to you know have farmers come in now not every farmer is tech savvy Uh, or platform savvy or mobile uh, savvy but you know we know that somebody in the family uh, a son daughter or uh, uh, somebody in the family has a smartphone is tech savvy and so we do believe that you know the adoption will happen across the country yeah i think now uh, vegetable vendor can sell with rupee or what is the gp google pay i think it it's the day is not far that every farmer could be on the digital platforms So, absolutely yeah so thank you very much ron the, so this is the time we have today maybe some other time we can discuss again thanks sure. for joining and we really enjoyed your talk thank, thank you, you. Yeah. so going next to the we have our uh, uh, next speaker uh, suhas joshi from uh, bayer foundation uh, leveraging international carbon credits Uh, to support climate resilience in indian, agri- indian agriculture uh, so before we go to the go to his talk and his presentation we will have a brief introduction from sri vidya am i audible sir yeah 
We are delighted to welcome today Mr. Suhas Joshi, who is the head of sustainability and business stewardship, South Asia Bayer Group, including the development of Bayer Carbon Farming Venture in South Asia. He has held senior management positions in some of India's leading agribusiness companies with his experience ranging from marketing to strategic planning and has led various corporate social engagement initiatives to bring the spirit of innovation to the four which are achieving transformational change. With such an impressive background, uh, we are happy to have you today, sir. The platform is yours. Yeah, so us, uh, we are eager to hear from you on these aspects of uh, carbon credits, then the international trade, and how we can really sustain it for the resilience of uh, Indian or global agriculture. Mm -hmm. so, Thank you. Yeah, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Dr. Tomati. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. And uh, I have been listening to Rohan for the last few minutes. I couldn't see spend the entire, uh, couldn't hear his entire speech, but it was quite interesting. And we've been hearing a lot about nurture farms, so it was good to listen to him the last few uh, so I don't know whether I would be repeating uh, some of the points that he already mentioned because I don't know what he spoke, but let me anyway uh, make my presentation. Sir, your voice is breaking. Can I just... Can you be a bit louder? Yeah. Is it better now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so what I was saying that I could hear a few minutes of Rohan and that was interesting to hear and uh, let me see whether uh, the perspective I'm going to present here may be slightly different or not. So, uh, let's see. So gentlemen, uh, just to give you some context and background, so the carbon markets internationally are, are heating up. Uh, since uh, uh, 2020 when Joe Biden took over and when he ratified the Paris Climate Agreement. The, the cold, the... Sir, the still, voice is moving, not, the, Excuse me, sir. Still, voice is not clear. Okay, Just, give me a minute. Give me a minute, please. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you can increase the volume on that. You know, if the um, the quality of the internet is not good, then maybe the video, maybe he may want to switch off the video. Uh, audible now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's fine. <laughs> so I believe that was the issue with my earphone. I hope I'm quite uh, clearly audible now. <laughs> so the, the, the background that I was uh, giving when the my microphone was not properly working was the whole story the resurgence of the story of carbon market and carbon credit starts from 2020, 2021, when Mr. Joe Biden took over the office and ratified the Paris Agreement. Suddenly, the years of lull in this market suddenly vanished, and uh, it has it started showing a very good traction across the world. Now there are certain estimates about how the carbon markets uh, are expected to grow. I will show some charts here. <laughs> I hope you can see my screen. Yeah, got, got yes. yeah. Thank you. 
So as per the Macken Free and Company, the global demand for voluntary carbon credits is expected to increase by a factor of 15 by 2030 and a factor of 100 by 2050. This is a solid prediction of growth and already the markets are showing this trend. Last three years, <clears throat> Over between 2016 to 2020, the demand for voluntary carbon credits has surged by 30% year over year. And <clears throat> why this is happening? Uh, because a number of companies across the world are signing up for net zero targets. They are announcing their own net zero targets. More than 1,000 companies you can see on the screen. In by 2020, and now much more than these thousand companies have announced their net zero targets. And when you have to reach net zero, you cannot always reach there but by just doing your operation, improving your operation, or adopting better technology. And continue to do this, you will always be continuing to generate carbon emissions and to bring them to zero, you need something called carbon credits in order to achieve it, your uh, net zero target. And when thousands of companies are announcing their net zero targets, it's obvious that they would like to procure or plan long-term procurement of carbon credits. And again, companies' prediction is very, very credible, which we already see the trend in the market, the traction in the market. One uh, another important point, say, uh, or very interesting development that took place in Glasgow came together and they signed something called a methane pledge. Now in this methane pledge, they want to reduce the uh, methane emissions, one of the most important, most damaging greenhouse gases, 100% by 2030. And this reduction of all of us uh, are here experts and scientists and uh, uh, knowledgeable people, you know, there are very few sources of methane uh, which uh, uh, which can be managed where the methane, uh, where, the, where we can respond to the methane emission and reduce them. And one of the most important source of methane emissions, anthropogenic methane emissions, is agriculture, accounting for approximately 40% of total anthropogenic emissions of methane in the world. So now, if you want to make reduction in methane emissions by 30% by 2030, you don't have many other options. We have to work on agriculture. And also, what are the paddy rice cultivation? All for approximately 10% of and we know the rice cultivation in our country is paired by a number of factors. For example, uh, the water consumption in rice cultivation is almost half of the available water in our country. The available for agriculture is consumed by paddy, approximately 3,000 to 4,000 liters of water to produce 1 kg of rice. At the same time, since the electricity is free, farmers end up pumping the water systemically uh, uh, using free electricity, and therefore it puts pressure on our energy production as well. Uh, same time, with, uh, the methane emissions from paddy rice are, are significant, as I mentioned. So this is an opportunity when the carbon markets are growing and the demand for carbon credits is expected to grow. This is a great opportunity to fund our sustainable agricultural programs, particularly the abilities of converting paddy rice into either DSR or alternate wetting or drying or SRI or SRT at a very significant scale. 
these efforts have been around to convert the paddy rice into other production system however the scale was missing uh, there could be number of reasons uh, maybe dsr not being completely a perfect uh, practice for the farmers to adopt resulting into yield gray uh, yield lag and uh, many more complexities and another reason could be the limited availability of funds to handle such programs to promote such programs now this fund issue can be sorted out if we leverage the global carbon markets as the demand for carbon credits grow as the demand for methane reduction activities grow the companies looking to achieve their net zero target would be willing to buy out this credit and directly funding this entire program of converting the paddy rice into either dsr either dd sr or reduced tillage and this would help us achieve at least a significant part of our 44 million hectares of rice cultivation uh, in the country which is water dwelling and highly emitting uh, we can convert this uh, uh, this uh, uh, highly damaging cropping system into much more sustainable and uh, much more uh, environmentally efficient cultivation system uh, reducing say uh, per carbon emissions actually by 2 to 3 plus uh, reducing water consumption by 20% uh, also uh, cost of cultivation of the farmer can uh, can be reduced provided we are able to prevent the yield drag that usually witnessed in the dsr cultivation alternate wetting and drying and sri they are actually uh, 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 the techniques which Uh, uh which do not result in yield drag they also uh, 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 generate the same uh, productivity of the rice as uh, traditional transplanted rice uh, so there are two two three possibilities uh, we could promote we can uh, 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 we can uh, promote at a scale in future by uh, leveraging international carbon markets hmm. I I am Paul Sia of Tonapi and uh, would be happy if there are questions. Uh, yeah. So you uh, your slides are over, sir. Only uh, few more are there. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Yeah. I think you can unshare it. Uh, then we can have a discussion on that. yeah yeah uh, so uh, rohan parik is also there i think you, uh, rohan you can also come online so that it will be an interesting discussion how we can really uh, match together the plans in india and also the global credit trading yeah yeah so Uh, so as now uh, there are few questions and also maybe both of you can also interact because uh, this will be the great thing so to, to suhas basically uh, the question is sequestration in plantation crops for example so we are going from agriculture to forestry so all whole mapping if we can really look at so what are the kind of crops you think would be appropriate and how we can really have a better uh, what you call the carbon credits that could be made available that is one thing and uh, as you know from rice cultivation from drylands the total rice contribution from drylands is almost 44% so if you have a plan to augment more carbon credits what is the percentage of area you would like to target under dsr the the forestry part perhaps uh, i would need to go ahead because i'm not much conversant with uh, the, the tree plantations and their potential for carbon sequestration of course there is a huge potential and number of initiatives are already being implemented in order to uh, capture that potential 
However, I am not aware of the answer, so perhaps Rohan will need to enter. Yeah, I can answer that. So, um, you know, if you look at forestry projects over the last so many years, right, that have been going on, uh, typically uh, from a tea cool plantation perspective, because the question was really on plantation. If you look at tea cool plantation, uh, if you don't harvest the the wood, right, uh, the potential is about six hundred carbon credits, both in the above biomass and below gram biomass and the soil. It's about six hundred uh, carbon credits per uh, hectare. Now that's very very significant. Um, you know, however, the cost, the the revenue from the timber plantation uh, cutting would be far higher. And so, even if you assume that at the end of twenty five years you're going to cut the timber, the revenue we did a uh, we had a proposal from a particular customer who owned one one lakh acres, and in that one lakh or forty thousand hectares, in that forty thousand hectares, the revenue from the plantation itself was uh, nine billion billion dollars. And uh, from the carbon credit was about a hundred million dollars, so you know it's very very significant uh, revenue potential uh, from plantation. Now this could be um, uh, you know similar uh, models for let's say a rubber plantation, right? But the revenue would start much earlier. The, the carbon revenue would come in every year, but the, even the rubber revenue would come in the uh, sap revenue would come in every year. So plantations is a very very big opportunity. Um, especially in countries like uh, you know Africa or uh, sorry continents like Africa or South America, where there is very large land available at very low cost. And and I see on the chat there is a question on horticulture. Yes, horticulture uh, would also if you can switch a crop from agriculture to horticulture, any piece of acre that is shifting can be considered uh, in terms of carbon sequestration though the amount of carbon that would be sequestered in these crops would be much much lower because a lot of the carbon goes into the fruits in the fruiting and so the the biomass that is left behind or stored in the plant is in i mean it's much smaller than what goes into the fruits but definitely they do qualify so how much is going to be the international markets of carbon credits if you have estimated both for soas and uh, rohan See, this is going through the roof right now. I can tell you that uh, you know per carbon credit today it's already at twenty dollars, right? And considering the price of you know seventy five, that's one thousand five hundred rupees per acre per season. I mean per per carbon credit that you can uh, get, but that is today, which is you know twenty twenty two. Now, if you look at twenty thirty, where you know most corporates across the world have talked about reducing their emissions by fifty percent, most countries, in fact, why corporates? Have talk, talked about reducing their emissions by fifty percent. That craze for you know buying carbon credits, especially for your scope three emissions. Now, let me define scope three, scope one because I've given new terminology. Scope one is emissions which is within your factory. So if you use diesel or coal, uh, you know that's the emissions that is within your factory. Scope two is uh, uh, emissions because of electricity that you source. That could be you know in a far off coal plant. I mean. Uh, electricity plant where they uh, burning coal for uh, uh, running the steam turbines. That is scope two and scope three is all other emissions, which is employee commute, business commute, you know, uh, transportation, logistics, uh, upstream, downstream, all of that, right? And that is very difficult to offset. You know, offsetting scope one, scope two is definitely possible, but uh, offsetting scope three is very difficult unless you offset it by carbon credits. So the markets for carbon credits is going to go crazy. I personally anticipate this this twenty dollars will hit to fifty dollars per acre. In by 2030. Okay, so I think there is one more uh, rejoinder to this. Uh, small and marginal farmers have adopted uh, uh, rubber plantations. Uh, can we uh, sell these credits and generate uh, 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 revenue for farmers? Yeah, so the, there's a there's a rule on carbon credits that you know uh, basically the carbon credits uh, says that you have to prove that. The carbon revenue was required to switch a practice. So if somebody is already, you know, doing a rubber plantation, they don't qualify. But if you're switching from a certain, say, an agriculture crop to a rubber plantation, and to justify that, they say yes, you know, we need the money because there's a lot of upfront investment. Yeah, yes, they will qualify. But if even in this same rubber plantation, if the plantation is done within the last two years, 
they would qualify for carbon carbon credits and in a in a big way i mean they would be rewarded very handsomely over the next 25 years so in terms of emissions for both of you so they classify it as survival emissions and luxury emissions so uh, what what is the uh, chance or what is the uh, pro rata reduction you are thinking about in both the categories can also generate uh, carbon credits I'm, I'm not sure if I was familiar with these terms, so luxury emissions or... Uh, you, you see, the, the entire communities, if we can, uh, or the countries, if we can classify, the people with basic needs uh, of livelihood, they also emit certain emissions. So whether it is cooking or anything. Or, uh, and the luxury, basically the cars, the all other things put together, the luxury emissions. So okay. this is where they would like to really want to estimate how much we can really reduce and uh, uh, garner better credits. Yes. Yeah, so see uh, the uh, the survival emissions which you talked about, right? They are carbon neutral. I mean, they they are carbon neutral because they're taking the emissions from the uh, from the air into the crop, then burning the crop uh, residue, right? And and so the emissions go back. So you're not adding any net new emissions in the atmosphere. So they are carbon neutral. However, you know, luxury emissions, which is burning coal or any fuel, uh, you know, whether it is petrol, diesel, kerosene, whatever it is, that is, you know, coming from the ground, right? It, or or so it's just locked into the ground and you're putting it in a net new in the atmosphere. So definitely, uh, you know, the whole the whole game is around reducing net emissions from the atmosphere. And if you can use agriculture to become a sink, you know, either in the soil or or in the biomass. Right, uh, it will be a it will be a big uh, big win. I mean, the total capacity of the soils today is to, is twice the capacity of what is there in the biomass and in the uh, and in the atmosphere to get put together. Right, so if you can use soils for sinking that the emissions that are going out into the atmosphere, we can use that and create that into a sink. It will help mitigate the climate issues. It will help solve some of those issues. It becomes a solution. And people are willing to pay for it, right? Yeah. So uh, one more question is uh, carbon sequestration. We are talking about what is the scope for trading uh, carbon sequestered in the form of soil organic carbon? Um, so as you want to take that, I mean, I can otherwise do it. Yeah, yeah please feel free to take it. Let me just uh, start it off by saying that both the both the emission reductions are critical as long as we can prove that uh, authenticity and additionality, whether uh, you are removing the carbon from the atmosphere or whether you are reducing the carbon emissions, both can be converted. So if you are sequestering that in the soil or if you are reducing the emissions, both can be converted into carbon credits and those can be traded internationally provided you are meeting all the rules and requirements of the carbon credit generation. Uh, so yes, soil sequestration that can also be for, uh, the, the carbon credits would be tradable. So I, I just want to add that you know we're talking about a uh, lot about uh, you know sequestration. I think emissions is is easier. Uh, sequestration is a little more difficult. Sequestering in the biomass is easier, but in the soil is a little more difficult. If you look at emissions in terms of nitrous oxide, right? I mean, traditionally countries like India, China large, large agri company countries, right, where urea is subsidized, if we can uh, optimize the use of nitrogen fertilizers and reduce nitrous oxide emissions, that will go a big way. And I think that's, that's easily possible without investing too much money in it. The question is that, you know, who's going to tame that cat, right? I mean, because if you reduce emissions, uh, there's a you know, the, there's a fear of, uh, you know, God that uh, people, you know, uh, all the uh, retailers will put in the minds of, uh, uh, you know, farmers saying that if you put less, you know, your yield will dip. So if you can document the excess and then, or we can find alternatives, right, which are, which will reduce, let's say, neem coated or you, uh, some other coated urea or some other ways uh, to put the night, uh, to put the fertilizer at the right time at the right place. Um, instead of you know, uh, so so all of these strategies, or by you know adding leguminous crops, if you can uh, 
optimize that, first of all, it will get them carbon credits, it will reduce their cost. But more so, it will help India reduce its subsidy expenditure, right? So it's a very big focus where all of us in the community should come together and see how we can all work towards optimizing that. So uh, do you mean to say... Uh, just a point. Sorry. Yes, was you were telling something. Yeah, just adding to what Rohan said, there are a couple of points we need to be very conscious of while we talk about generating and trading carbon credits. One is... It has to be economically viable. Any activity you promote in order to generate the carbon credits, the cost you incur to do that, including not only the registration and the technical part of generating carbon credits, but training the farmers to achieve that, should you be able to offset that buying the carbon credit at a particular right price. Currently, while some credits are being traded at twenty dollars, the the majority of it on 12 to 14 months. So whether within that uh, availability of that income uh, or the potential income, are you able to train the farmers? Are, are you able to uh, promote the new practice? Are you able to meet all the technical requirements? That is a very important question that uh, one has to answer. The second regarding the sequestration, while, uh, of course, the technically... Uh, uh, well, the scientists are here in the audience, but as I understand, the sequestration in the soil in our tropical climate and keeping that sequestration intact for the 30 to 50 years, that is the requirement of carbon standard, is very difficult. That's my understanding, of course, I'm uh, happy to be proven wrong. Uh, so there are a number of challenges involved in soil sequestration of carbon for a country like ours. So yes, the emission reduction are much more uh, practical and cost efficient. Yeah. So, Ron, you would like to add anything on what Swas said? Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I already added my points. Right? Okay. So, uh, how do you foresee a, a total international regulated carbon credit market emerging? I think both markets are going to uh, regulate it and uh, voluntary both are going to go, uh, you know, increase dramatically. Uh, as Suhas pointed in one of his slides, right, that you know, year on year, the the commitments from companies is increasing. Uh, you know, it's gone from 500 to 1,000 companies talking about becoming carbon neutral, right? But um, uh, I see uh, that this number is just going to exponentially increase as we come closer to, uh, closer and closer to 2030. Uh, corporates do realize that you know they are responsible for some of this climate action, uh, climate uh, issues, and so they are becoming conscious that you know they it's, they have to solve the problem. It's not the government so to solve the problem. It's they have to act and they have to move ahead. And if 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 they don't, they may not even find buyers of the products, right? So because the world is becoming more conscious, the next generation is becoming even more conscious, and so before they get singled out as saying that let's not buy from them. Uh, you know, companies are waking up and and committing to the, committing to buying uh, and becoming carbon neutral. Now, to become carbon neutral, they they may initially have to buy carbon credits, and so I do see this exploding in the next uh, next ten years. So yesterday there, there was, was uh, yeah, fifty billion dollars by twenty thirty. That's what the number of uh, analysts are predicting. Uh, let's see how it goes. Sorry, how much did you say, Swash? I said $50 billion. Wow, $50 billion. Yesterday there was discussion. We are talking about only carbon neutrality. Why don't we talk about emission neutrality, methane neutrality, or total emissions being controlled totally? So can there be a kind of, uh, 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 what you call, Mm, neutrality talk in terms of all the emissions put together? Yeah, I mean, we're not talking about carbon. We're talking about carbon equivalent. So, you know, we're talking about methane becoming zero and nitrous oxide becoming zero or negative. We are, in fact, talking about storing it in the soils or in the biomass, right? So we're talking about agriculture sector first becoming zero from 20%, which is, is today, to, to becoming zero first and then becoming negative. Right. <clears throat> So there is one, one last question. Yeah, one more question is there. 
the somebody has written that uh, there is a criticism that carbon offset can create new environmental problems in communities. I'm not sure what that really means. Um, <laughs> but everything, I mean, see, everything is not always rosy, right? There may be some pluses and some minuses. If, if we are genuinely able to reduce methane, right, by using the right techniques, then that's permanently gone, right? It's not in the atmosphere. If you are genuinely able to reduce nitrous oxide emissions going into the atmosphere, that's a good thing, right? I mean, we are we are genuinely able to then stop the mitigation. Uh, I mean, we are genuinely able to mitigate the the effects of climate change, right? So that's the right thing. I mean, there they could be small criticism for uh, for things that are not done genuinely, right? I mean, that's that's definitely there. And one has to be really, really careful that uh, protocols are followed. The validation agency, verifying bodies, uh, you know, there are many great standards like gold standard and, and VERA standards, carbon registries. They, they have to do their job really well. So because that's how one question people are uh, uh, asking, uh, how do you really verify these bodies of uh, soil carbon sequestered are being audited properly? You see, one, 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 one differentiating factor here in the carbon markets is not all the carbon credits are equal. There are grades, there are different uh, pricing, uh, for, uh, also depending on the source of those carbon credits. So certain companies or certain product sponsors who are seen as credible people and who can ensure that integrity of the project remains in place, if the carbon credits generated by such projects or such sponsors fetch much higher price in the market. So there are uh, checks and balances in the system. Of course, there are there is an audit process, there is a review process, but at the same time, the pricing can also impact the integrity and quality of the carbon credit generation. Yeah. So any more questions from anybody? Uh, yeah. Good morning, sir. Good evening, sir. Dr. Sunil H. Shar, sir. Sir, in the north zone, there is a 20% decrease in yield yield due to the climate change. There is a lot of pressure. Hello? Yes, yes. Ah, yes, yes, go ahead, sir. So, in the north zone, this year, uh, in the wheat, uh, gene uh, wheat, uh, total outlay is very, very low due to the climatic change. At that time, now temperature is 47 Point four in uh, all over the Ariana in the uh, all the districts. This uh, condition prevails, then there is a big problem in the another season. In the yeah, yeah, it is discussed already. Heat inflicted yield losses are going yeah. to be very very common. So mm -hmm. that is where we need to be diversifying our crop, which can tolerate more heat, so that uh, we have a balance of uh, different uh, cropping systems. In the climate change scenario, yeah. Uh, yeah so, Mohan, yeah, uh, you, you did a very good uh, uh, technology refinement in in the form of making powder of this uh, decomposer, Pusa decomposer. We are all focusing on paddy systems because during winters they are being burnt, and that's why it is creating all that fog and all those things. But equally important is the wheat system followed, wherein also the same burning problem is there, and that is releasing a lot of particulate material into the atmosphere. But that decomposer system has to be slightly modified. What is your take on that? No, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. The burning per person has to stop because it has massive health impacts. Uh, uh, I'm not a scientist. Uh, you know, if, if the uh, community of scientists can come up with the right solution, we can help you create the formulation to powder. And we can potentially, you know, spray this e even for wheat. I think it's a need to the R. Uh, I mean, there are many other uh, uh, residue management techniques. PUSA is just one of them. Uh, we've heard of, you know, you can use a mulching machine just to mulch it into small pieces so that it decomposes in C2. Specifically after wheat burning, um, you know, should be avoided because typically you have the entire, you know, summer season for it to decompose. But if they are doing the Zahid crop in between, then they may be burning it. And, and we should look at alternatives to do it. There are multiple alternatives. You know, one of them is using... Uh, you know, drilling seeding machines, right? So, yeah. 
so mm -hmm. thank you very much sir uh, suhas and uh, rohan uh, in fact we, we are educated a lot today uh, than what we were yesterday on this particular this thing and That's maybe uh, maybe specifically we can discuss carbon credits the markets and all these things put together at some yes. point of so time. i just want to leave one thought is that you know uh, as nurture we are very willing to partner with all the the entire scientific community if you can bring ideas to us our our really job is to take it to scale right i mean the the awd and dsr practices were there for very many years we've been able to bring it to scale using a digital and tech platforms and if we can help you take some of your ideas to take it to scale we'd be more than happy to collaborate with you learn from you first and then help you scale using technology yeah so that will be very interesting so we'll be very happy to uh, put forth because uh, we will be reaching about 1000 people and we will have the ideas uh, then uh, try to synthesize them put it to, together sir then we can have institutions partnering maybe both bear uh, suhas and uh, rohan uh, we mm -hmm. can really uh, work on the issues which you are working uh, with newer foundation and also with nurture farm yes we we'll, we'd be very happy to take your ideas to scale specifically so if it's solving any of the climate problems right yeah. Actually, so thank you thank you so much thank you thanks for your time you one minute yeah sure so actually the purpose of this uh, seminar is also for the networking part of it maybe those who are offering something like that who could share their contact details that would be useful thank yeah, you yeah sure sure we will do that sir mm -hmm. so thank you very much and uh, we have half an hour to for valedictory we are going to hear from mr arun tiwari the author of uh, wings of fire abdul kalam's biography and the missile scientist basically he is uh, so we have about 25 to 30 minutes uh, in that i just wanted to see uh, prabhakar you are here prabhakar mutyam prabhakar Yeah, yeah, Prabhakar. Prabhakar is there. Yes. Dr. Prabhakar. We just, I just wanted, I thought uh, we will hear from him. Uh, uh, yes, sir. I'm here, sir. I'm hearing. I am online. Yeah. yeah you, you, can you just put together your experience in participation this year in the international negotiations? Uh, yes, climate I can change, do that. Yeah. Climate change negotiation, just like that, you talk extempore. We would like to hear how the uh, kind of uh, negotiations take place or uh, what kind of discussions took place and in what sessions you participated. Because this will be interesting because we have never talked on that. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Tanapi. Yesterday, I have uh, shown a couple of slides on this aspect. Uh, now, I would like to speak uh, as you uh, requested. Uh, in the COP26, uh, there were uh, spe special sessions on agriculture. Karunia joined work on agriculture. Uh, actually, agriculture is not part of uh, regular negotiations in IP, um, UNFCCC UNF 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 so far. Now, it seems uh, it will be a part uh, in the years to come because of the latest uh, developments. Uh, just now, we heard uh, Sohan and, uh, uh, Suhas, Rohan and Suhas. Uh, the issue there is uh, the uh, agriculture uh, is uh, we also we all know agriculture is both source and also a sink. Uh, now clearly uh, the neg negotiations are going towards reducing the emissions. Okay, uh, sink anyway uh, it's happening, but reducing the source. It could be methane or it could be nitrous oxide. Uh, now issued specific to uh, developing countries, including India, is methane emissions. Uh, because that is the one gas where uh, which can be which, which is a short-lived gas. Uh, that's why the uh, proposal was to uh, reduce methane emissions in the, in the next ten years. Uh, that's called uh, um, uh, a methane uh, pledge. Uh, there was a proposal, uh, but uh, keeping our uh, domestic circumstances uh, into taking into consideration, uh, we uh, did not go much uh, for it because of two reasons. One is. Uh, 60, around 56 percent of emissions of methane is from livestock. Number one, but livestock sector, uh, the technologies for reducing methane emissions are not much. There's a technological gap. We don't have any technologies. 
so we cannot commit in uh, livestock sector coming to paddy yes there is a scope but it needs investment it requires huge investments to convert the paddy into uh, it could be dsr or alternate wetting and drying uh, it requires a huge of a lot of capacity building also investment uh, that's why government of india has taken a decision uh, not to make any commitment uh, for the time being at least for a year or two then uh, there will be a lot of uh, discussions will happen uh, another one or two years uh, to bring uh, agriculture sector into our uh, uh, ndcs it, uh, as, as of now uh, agriculture sector is not part of ndc that means the commitment to the university agriculture is not a part now uh, uh, having heard about uh, these carbon credit and all probably uh, we may think we may government of india may take a decision uh, to include agriculture sector also into ndcs once it is accepted then uh, we are committed sir actually we are committed and we have to uh, set the targets and then uh, go for, for it the final uh, wording is the since uh, agriculture sector is very sensitive both at the political and economy level so any decisions uh, what uh, we take in unf triple c will have large imp uh, uh, implications so it could be uh, 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 fertilizer subsidy is a huge uh, you know 1.6 lakh crores now i was told is more than 2 lakh crore and uh, any decisions we take in uh, such fora will have a uh, huge implications on the ground so uh, that's why government of india is uh, uh, going bit slow in this regard thank you sir over to you hello hello yeah yeah whether uh, other negotiations that happened uh, anything you know on that and how it happened there sir one more session i attended is loss and damage hmm. uh, loss and damage uh, though agriculture is part of that uh, loss and damage is basically loss and damage is compensation to the uh, properties or uh, livelihoods in different sector including agriculture uh, when i say extreme means it's a drought flood cyclone heat wave or cold wave uh, including hail storms uh all all uh, negotiations in this sessions are boiling out to the finance technologically there there is a, a, a possibility to uh, a give and take from the developing nation developed nations to other part, other uh, parties but the question is the finance financing loss and damage uh, was uh, an issue which remained inconclusive uh, because of the uh, uh, amount uh, huge amount uh, and also the attribution of uh, extreme events to climate change uh, it is still uh, debates being debated by the uh, uh, developed nations so uh, that's uh, not yet uh, there's not much progress in loss and damage it's uh, still uh, discussions are going on okay so uh, thank you prabhakar i think uh, it was because we didn't uh, talk on this uh, earlier uh, i would like to hear from uh, ramesh kalgatgi uh because he has been talking on uh, the carbon sequestration in uh, forest ecosystems and all other things uh, ramesh uh, you are online sir ramesh kalgatgi i had a question if nobody else is asking yeah sure sir okay yeah so i my question was you know if uh, agriculture emissions uh, agriculture becomes part of our ndcs would that affect the voluntary markets in any way yes yes i think so i think so i am not expert in the carbon marketing but this was the point of discussion once it becomes uh, part of ndc uh, probably uh, the trading uh, will be an issue from agriculture sector either the government of india will uh, uh, buy the credits on its uh, show in the uh, uh, in their own uh, reports for agriculture uh, the credits from agriculture sector or it will be open uh, for the uh, market that is yet to be i mean uh, uh, decided and i think is going to affect uh, uh, the carbon trading uh, that's what i understand yeah so that will be detrimental for the private sector to promote you know sustainable agriculture right so yes that's the point of discussion i think probably there will be uh, a lot of deliberations on that and uh, before the next cop probably okay. we'd love to right. be part of, yeah. we'd love to be part of that deliberation if possible sure sure, sure.
No, I think Rohan, uh, uh, maybe these things probably should be at in-house discussion somewhere on some platform need to happen. Uh, probably people participating in those COP negotiations can carry forward the feelings, the uh, kind of uh, preparedness which is there in the private sector and what it really wants internationally, maybe put, put, put together there. Yeah. Now we understand from the regulated market if it is part of NDC, but if it is also, you know, uh, covering voluntary markets, that will kill the whole carbon markets. Yeah. India being such a big country, for you know, agriculture country, the opportunity for the farmers will go away. Uh, sir, can I come in for a moment? Yeah, please. Uh, uh, Mr. Rohan, the, uh, I understand uh, that uh, Niti Aayog uh, will be organizing a brainstorming session on this aspect. Okay. Uh, specifically to uh, whether to include agriculture sector into NDC or not. Uh, probably if it, uh, if I come to know anything about it, probably I'll pass the information to you. Uh, we you. can also participate to that and you can contribute to the discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, Prabhakar, you can make a kind of group so that people can go on adding their ideas, the feelings, and also the apprehensions, uh, so that these things can be put together uh, to the people who matter most. Sure, sir. It's a good idea. Yes, sir. Yeah, we have Ramesh on board. Yeah, uh, sorry, I had just gone to one or two. Yeah, Ramesh, uh, I think we no, they should. Yeah, the issue with forestry is basically on the question of additionality and to prove that not a business as usual. And how does one do it? And also the issue of uh, uh, leakages. And I believe to prevent and address all these things only, the red concept was uh, conceived. And uh, may I know from the speakers what is the state of the red concept now after the Paris uh, Convention? I mean, I think the red concept, I mean, there are lots of projects coming up, uh, getting more, more and more projects getting registered uh, on the red project, so uh, on the red concept. No, the red was basically an ecosystem approach where uh, you can you can anticipate the leakages and provide for leakages because certain amount of leakage is inevitable when we talk about luxury versus the survival uh, uh, pollution or yeah, emissions. So the, the red concept was basically to address the issue of the survival uh, emissions. Uh, you can anticipate the loss due to, uh, say, removal of firewood, removal of uh, 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 agriculture waste from the ecosystem, and then provide for that much of uh, leakage in the sequestration regime. And if that can be a marketable uh, uh, entity, it would be nice. And the other thing is all the agroforestry plantations. Yesterday also we talked about agroforestry uh, in a session. And they should be able to contribute and uh, be uh, eligible for uh, uh, carbon credits. So of course, it will be short rotation ones, but you can copy the eucalyptus over about four or five rotations and thereby have the plantation in place for about 25, 30 years minimum. So what are your thoughts on that? Is there a need to look into uh, a timeline whereby uh, uh, we can say that the carbon sequestered over 50 years or which is going to be intact for a period of say 40, 50 years should be eligible for trading? So uh, I have limited understanding of, of uh, uh, you know, this forestry projects, but from my limited understanding to what I understand is that the above biomass carbon is not considered, which is, you know, uh, cut and and repl uh, and so the below biomass or the soil biomass is still considered because you are sequestering a lot of that carbon permanently into the soil and hence the number of credits issued are lower like i gave you the example earlier in teak wood if you didn't cut it then the amount of carbon would be 600 uh, carbon credits per hectare but if you cut it then it's only uh, limited and and so the revenue from that comes down That is true. There's uh, any for any plant uh, uh, selling the plants wood as a wood or selling the carbon sequestered in that wood will definitely be uh, that be more valuable there. 
but it can be additionality you not know, to the uh, for a initial period of 5 to 6 years it, it can supplement the income of the farmers going in for agroforestry it, it may make sense that was the point yeah. yeah ramesh what are the issues basically now in the forest ecosystem uh, how how you want to position forestry oh. agriculture and aquaculture all put together in terms of uh, carbon yeah. credit aggregation yeah. or whatever it is forestry is a very vast subject as vast as agriculture and uh, uh, juxtaposing agriculture and forestry may not be appropriate because they are competing land users Uh, as a matter of fact, when the green revolution took off in uh, the states of Kerala and the part of Andhra Pradesh, some of the forests were destroyed, but they were disreserved for paving for agriculture. So that was in the 60s. Uh, but forestry, as a uh, uh, one can, I, I don't think I can really uh, uh, juxtapose and compare agriculture and forestry because forestry. In the Indian context, a state-owned uh, entity, state-owned state entity. So, whereas in agriculture, we are talking about the farmers, stakeholders. So, both are. Uh, but forestry does supplement the agriculture largely. Even if you talk about the uh, ecosystems in the estuarine forests, the mangrove ecosystem, they are the breeding grounds for the uh, brackish water fisheries, the, the prawns, the crabs, and a number of uh, marine fishes. and they also provide a bio shield for the coastal people living in that area and uh, that's a, a utility of the eco ecological point of uh, perspective of the mangroves so the, thereby they also add value to the agriculture in the inlands they prevent the erosion by wind and all that similarly in a uh, uh, hilly terrain or watershed areas uh, it is the ridge vegetation in the ridge areas in the hilly areas which will conserve the water and that will be available for the agriculture in the uh, down hills uh, uh, slope areas so agriculture uh, can benefit from forestry and forestry can be supplementary activity for agriculture but uh, from a farmer's perspective uh, quantifying the contribution of forestry to agriculture will be very difficult as difficult as it is to contribute to, con to quantify the carbon sequestered by the forest because of so so many other uh, variables like uh, estimate assessment of the leakages assessment of the additionality factor and uh, all those things even a definition of forest also is, is debatable what do we call a forest so india has defined forest as a that area which has about 0.5 hectares of ground cover etc that will that is not accepted by many people is indian definition of forest from the point of view of carbon sequestration carbon marketing so what what is that it was a very interesting discussion now what is that yeah. uh, you, in your in your forest services uh, the kind of discussions that are going on uh, can you just uh, highlight so that it is a individual view or it is the collective view it is uh, uh, well the forestry uh, in talking in terms of climate change you mean or in general climate change uh, carbon sequestration uh, so all this thing how how do you really want to position that actually when i i was serving in the uh, in service about 4 5 years back and a decade before that with the help of uh, scientists from terry we developed two projects want to quantify the carbon sequestration uh, that was possible by way of protected teak plantations teak forests of karimnagar jagtial area in telangana now present telangana and uh, thereby we put we want to market that through a private exchange and uh, another one was in the nellore district of uh, andhra pradesh we have taken up large scale plantations of eucalyptus very very successful plant eucalyptus clones of itc bagachalam and uh, we had developed a, a, a project for harvest for, for estimation of carbon and other marketing also the thing is in the market at that time carbon was costing about well, going about 4 to 5 dollars per ton whereas uh, the the cost of harvesting and the cost of estimation and the 
uh, transaction cost it was it was called it was quite more and then uh, uh, there was no proper market to i am talking about early 2000 subsequently we have gcf and we have so many other things uh, adaptation fund and big climate fund and so many things have come but at that time there was nothing in the market uh, early 2000 and uh, so to market that there was no regular market cdm was not buying cdm was uh, more of a chinese development mechanism than a clean development mechanism so we had to go for uh, chicago climate exchange which is a private market uh, done developed by certain businessmen in chicago as a response of the american uh, uh, bureau uh, american entrepreneurs because america was not ratifying cdm not ratifying the Kyoto protocol so we had gone in uh, for that type of an uh, for initiative but then we realized the transaction cost cost of registering that in the ccx uh, platform and then marketing was much more than what money one would have got from the sale of our marketing the carbon credits so we just shelled it it was more of an academic uh, activity so carbon marketing in forestry in state-owned forestry is very very uh, nascent and not developed at all some agroforestry initiatives in uh, south orissa and north coastal Andhra Pradesh, uh, funded by the raigada jk paper mills has really taken off recently i think some of the farmers were done planting of eucalyptus in that area have watson funded some money they received but on the whole uh, for sequestration of carbon in the plantation activity there is hardly any incentive and all the uh, talk uh, that has been going on is mostly about the reduction of emission not much about sequestration but a sequestration does have a lot of potential even the blue carbon the carbon sequestered in the oceanic uh, surfaces by the algal uh, uh, bodies there in the mangroves in the swamps it has a lot of potential because almost 70 percent of the earth's uh, surface is covered by water bodies so uh, estimating and uh, uh, promoting that type of a sequestration in the aquatic uh, ecosystems will be very very essential to really mitigate the climate change uh, uh, initiative in, in activities here because all said and done agriculture will definitely balance out ultimately because there is sequestration there is also uh, emission you can minimize the emission to an extent but not beyond a point so uh, sequestration uh, initiatives will definitely go very uh, handy and very are very essential in the future it's my view and i don't know how the market is going to react or take that but uh, the the authorities that we will have to take into account and uh, uh, and provide for uh, sequestration as a major chunk of carbon uh, uh, trading and then and then only we'll be able to really balance the uh, issue now how do how do you foresee the wastelands in india being cropped or being uh, yeah, have yeah. an initiation of uh, forest yeah, yeah we had a massive initiative by rajiv gandhi of uh, uh, planting 5 million hectares under tree cover being under tree cover uh, nab the national agroforestry requires agriculture ecosystem board was uh, uh, developed national waste and development board wdb was constituted but uh, the wasteland was a wasted land. This is an issue. When you go on a train, you will see a lot of vacant lands uh, lying vacant. But actually, when you go to a particular act, particular uh, chunk of land, when you want to take up any activity there, it is owned by somebody, owned for some purpose. So putting a plant there, raising a plant there is not that easy. It, it was not a very big success. Ultimately, what has succeeded is agroforestry. Uh, at one time, till about 1983-84, the entire paper industry was uh, uh, getting the raw material from the forest all over the country. And from 1984 onwards, there has been a policy shift uh, in Andhra Pradesh, in Karnataka, in Maharashtra, and also in many other uh, Central and North Indian states of shifting, uh, uh, of actually charging the paper industry more than what they were charging earlier. We are supplying at a very subsidized rate at that time, for subsidy to the extent of almost 30 tons per rupees per ton of bamboo. And when we worked out the market cost of that uh, uh, bamboo, 
uh, for supplying to the paper industry, it came to about thousand rupees per ton. So the paper industry simply backed out. They said we don't want any wood on the forest, and now they are promoting today whatever paper we get in the in the market is paper made out of eucalyptus, paper made out of casuarina, paper made out of soba boom from agroforestry, from farmers' plantations. The single district of Hongol itself in Andhra Pradesh can support three paper mills. It, it produces that much of wood to support three paper mills. ITC Badrachalam is getting a lot of raw material from there. Sipur paper mills are getting and Raigada paper mills also was getting from those industries, the, that district. So the shift uh, of uh, uh, involvement or production of wood has basically come from the farm forestry. Again, that type of farmland, which was a wasted farmland, under absentee landlordism, where uh, nobody was actually cultivating them or cultivating without much of profit. So that type of land has been converted into uh, plantation crops of eucalyptus, sohobul and kajurina. And now we have a scenario where the forests are free from exploitation by the paper mills. There is no supply of wood by the forest department to the paper mills and then paper mills are getting all the raw material from the industry. The latest example is uh, by Hunsur pay, by plywood board. They are promoting milliard rupee plantations and uh, there's a buyback arrangement. So farmers are cultivating milliard rupee, locally called Hebreu, and then there's a captive market there in the Hunsur paper mills for uh, converting that into plywoods. So to say the wood manufacturing activity, which was depending on the forest at one point of time, is no longer depending on the forest. So to that extent, the pressure on forests have come down. And to what extent uh, that will uh, uh, help the forestry to grow, forest to rejuvenate and grow? Well, the forests have grown. Forests are growing. The Forest Service of India also has shown in the latest report that there is an increase in the forest cover and tree cover in the country on the whole. Though there has been a lot of criticism of their report. But on the whole, uh, my own assessment is that the forests have been rejuvenating. There is also an increase in the number of wildlife sightings in the forest. And uh, the very fact that there are increased number of man-animal conflicts uh, indicate the wildlife is really on the increasing. So forestry in general is better. Uh, I would need a total session on forestry because it's a very, very broad subject. I can't concise, you know, to, in a question answer like this. Uh, maybe sometime I can speak for about an hour or so on forestry. I did speak in uh, uh, a forum in Canada where I had gone for um, uh, training there to British Columbia, University of British Columbia. There we had a, a session with the government of Canada officials there. And uh, there I presented the perspective of forestry, of Indian forestry to them. And uh, compared to uh, comparing with the British Columbian forest where the area, almost about 65, 70 percent of the land is under tree cover, the most of coniferous forest. So that's a... Uh, uh, I, I can I, I will need a, a session exclusively of forestry to talk about uh, issues in forestry. Yeah, so yeah, there is a there is a mention here about the bamboo mission by government of India is coming in a big way. Well, bamboo forest, bamboo cultivation is coming in a big way. Whether it is be triggered by bamboo mission or otherwise, I am doubtful. But uh, definitely, bamboo as a as an alternative crop to a number of issues is coming out in a very big way. Bamboo can be used for making furniture. Uh, as nice furniture as the teak furniture, it can be used to make uh, floorboards. It can also be made to use, uh, convert into textiles. And yesterday we heard about ethanol conversion of bamboo into ethanol. And uh, paper making was anyway known. Biomass based power generation can be known. There is a gentleman in Hosur in, in uh, Tamil Nadu who has promoted a Bambusa Balkova species, he calls it Bhima Bambu. And uh, his claim is that uh, a hectare of Bambu, of Bhima Bambu, can produce more biomass than sugarcane. So if that is true, then this Bambu will not flower at least for 40 to 50 years. So once planted, that Bambu will be available for 40 to 50 years. So uh, an area of around 200 hectares, according to his calculations, can support 2 megawatt, pe uh, megawatt power plant. So that is a scenario that is the future for uh, bamboo industry. And uh, of course, it is it is growing. It's uh, definitely growing than what it was in the past. And then all the farmers' lands. Most of it is in farmers' lands and the private lands. Yeah. So now, 
on on the whole entire Yeah, uh, sorry for, for this one. Uh, so, Dr. Patak has joined. Welcome, uh, Dr. Imanshu. So, uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Tanabi. Thank you very much. So, we are all very eager to listen to your uh, valedictory address, sir. Uh, you, before you, that, you. we have uh, one lecture by Dr. Arun Tiwari. Sure, uh, sure. He, he has not joined. Probably, he would join in the. Another two minutes. Uh, in the meantime, we will carry on with the discussion. Uh, we were just discussing on carbon credits, the international trading, and uh, we were joined by Suhas Joshi from Bayer Foundation and uh, Rohan Parikh from uh, Nurture Farm. Mm -hmm. And also we were looking at uh, carbon sequestration and also the agroforestry and the forestry, basically. Mm -hmm. So, sir, Tiwari has joined. Uh, sorry? Tiwari, sir, has joined. Okay, okay. So, this is what we were discussing, sir. Maybe in your lecture, you can really uh, uh, means, uh, give a perspective on that uh, so that uh, we will have the entire uh, validity session completing with your lecture. So, thank you. Thank you very uh, much. So, welcome again on behalf of uh, Indian Institute of Military Research and Karnataka Agri Professional Association. Uh, this association, welcome, Arun Tiwari, sir. You are muted, sir. Yeah. Sir, you are muted. Uh, now, sir, is it okay now? Yeah, it is okay, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So, sir, with your permission, we shall start the validity session, sir. Yes, sir, please. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, we are coming to the last phase of uh, today's uh, webinar come seminar on climate change concerns, challenges for agriculture sector and food and nutrition security. In fact, uh, uh, we had about 22 lectures till now and almost about 15 hours of sitting in the last two days. And uh, I think... Uh, uh, Ramesh, uh, you would like to wrap up, sir, before the valedictory session and introduction? No, I will. Okay, at the end. Okay. I think I'll do it at the end. Yeah, right, right, right. So uh, now straight away we'll go to the valedictory session and uh, Dr. Ilangawan. So at the outset, uh, uh, we have the lecture by Dr. Arun Tiwari, sir. Uh, philosophical and Vedic concepts and approaches to mitigate the climate change. Uh, though I have introduced him many a, many a times, but I take this opportunity again to introduce this uh, to this August gathering. Uh, Arun Tiwari, sir, born in 1955 at Mirat in Uttar Pradesh. In fact, he is a missile scientist and uh, uh, very good author, excellent author, internationally uh, renowned author, a professor, has written more than 13 books to his credit and the best of things everyone has read is The Wings of Fire, then Abdul Kalam's autobiography, then Transcendence, then uh, India India 3.0, sir, 3.0, sir? Yeah. So okay. many of these uh, things and now uh, uh, the latest one was on the post-pandemic uh, scenario, how uh, the countries across the world uh, really reacted and how uh, we as Indian, con in the Indian context, how the uh, uh, pandemic has changed the entire scenario of the world. So the entire concept of his writing is based on understanding the humanity, and humans as they exist today need to contribute to the benefit of the mankind. So going into the uh, other aspects of his personality, uh, he completed his master's in mechanical engineering from J.B. Pant Agricultural uh, University, uh, Agriculture, University of Agriculture and Technology. 
then he joined drdo in 1982 as missile scientist he spent next 15 years uh, in developing missile development efforts and he developed india's first titanium air bottle used in trishul and akash missiles and designed airframes for both the missiles in 1992 Dr. Kalam appointed uh, Dr. Tiwari as program director to develop civilian spin-offs of defense technologies. Then came the uh, very uh, uh, invention, uh, coronary stent with cardiologist Dr. Somaraju. Uh, so in the CARE Foundation and with the CARE hospitals, the civilian spin-offs really helped this particular aspect and that's how the defense technology spin-up award was given in 1998 for his role in developing this tent. He is also credited for structuring and setting up the Pan-African uh, e-network project. And also he established the telecommunications uh, e-network with the Telecommunication Consultants India Limited. From 2002 to 2007, he was the member of the advisory team to the president, Dr. Kalam. And currently, uh, he is associated with CARE Foundation, his writings, and uh, uh, lecturing around in the management institutes and advising us and mentoring us who are all associated with him. Sir, uh, we welcome you uh, to this uh, very webinar, and we would like to request you to deliver the lecture. So basically, I, we selected this to look at how the Indian civilization, the Vedic concepts, the philosophical approaches really dealt the climate change since the civilizations. And what do we really find in our scriptures, how the, uh, how the generations manage the climate change? So probably you would be uh, really enlightening us with this uh, particular idea, sir. So floor is yours, sir, for your presentation. Elangon, you can share here. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great uh, honor and privilege uh, to be a part of the uh, uh, seminar. Uh, I'm not keeping well and I'm confined to home for quite some time now. So this, uh, <clears throat> when the invitation came, first, Tonapi uh, uh, Saab uh, spoke to me on telephone and I gladly agreed because uh, this is perhaps the best uh, I can do at this point of time uh, to um, go through the uh, scriptures, to go through the great books and uh, decipher it. And uh, like a buffalo, uh, eat the food and then uh, rumigate it and uh, present it to the younger generation. Uh, in a palatable and uh, simple manner. So <clears throat> it's a great feeling and I'm very thankful and I'm very happy. And uh, as you can see that uh, I took it uh, sincerely and spent some time in really uh, giving this uh, message of what uh, our Vedic civilization uh, looks about the whole thing. Now, as you see the first slide, uh, it's very subtle. Uh, there is earth and uh, there is a black space and then a beautiful moon shining there. But the point I'm trying to make here is that there is a blue strip. Now, this blue strip is what makes life possible on earth. If this blue strip is not there, there's no life. As simple as that. 20 kilometer thick uh, layer immediately above the surface is called troposphere and it contains 80% of the atmosphere mass and weather is formed in this uh, 20 kilometers uh, thick layer. Then above it 20 to 50, we call it stratosphere, uh, which is uh, which shield ultraviolet radiation uh, uh, coming from the outer space. And once again, if this layer is not there, there is no life possible on Earth. Finally, 50 to 85 
kilometer is uh, mesosphere, uh, which is uh, a shield. Anything, these meteors and all this garbage, anything falls on Earth, this uh, layer, it burns it off. So it is basically, it is a shield, physical shield. And uh, 100 kilometer uh, and further is the space. And you can see beautiful uh, moon is uh, rising in that space. And uh, you must be all familiar with a famous NASA photograph uh, where Earth is rising on that space. The space is very vast, very huge. And uh, uh, billions of uh, things are moving around that. So I conclude this particular slide by once again uh, re-emphasizing this uh, 20 kilometer thick uh, layer, uh, which is uh, called atmosphere. And uh, this is the subject matter of uh, uh, today's lecture. Next slide, please. Now, Lokmanya Valgangadar Tilak, the greatest teacher, uh, he wrote a book. Uh, he was very upset uh, reading this. Aryans came from Central Asia or Germany and then they uprooted the Dravidians living in this country and all that uh, nonsense. He was very much against that. And uh, he wrote a, a book, uh, published it in 1903, uh, The Arctic Home in the Vedas. And uh, Mahatma Gandhi very truly called Balangada Tilak as the maker of the modern India. And uh, in this particular book, he gave hundreds of Vedic sutras explaining that the meaning of those hundred sutras are that the person who is writing those sutras is living on the North Pole because he is seeing the sky as a head revolves around the head, as a head revolve on the head. That is how the sky is moving. It is not east to west, it is moving. It is moving in a rotation. So that is only possible if you are standing on the North Pole. Then there are long uh, nights, uh, six to nine, 10 months. And morning is not one, morning is multiple. And from anywhere in Vedas, you see, there's no word like Usha. The word is Ushas, Ushas, the goddesses of morning, because they are multiple. So many, I mean, uh, whole, you will be seeing so many mornings, beautiful light comes, and then it goes, and then again it comes, and then again it goes. For six months, sun is not seen, only Ushas are seen. So. Balgangadhar Tilak gave, uh, I have the entire book, uh, uh, it is available and anybody can read that. So he very scientifically, meticulously proved, going by shloka to shloka, that the early people who have written Vedas, it was in the very, very ancient time what we call it uh, the Paleolithic, Paleolithic, that is 2.5 million years to 10,000 uh, years BC. During that time, the Vedas were composed, not uh, after Homer and Iliad and uh, Socrates and all that, no. It's, it's a different magnitude of time, number one. Second thing he says that uh, Aryans, uh, were not the auto, autochthonous of Europe or Central Asia, but they came from the North Pole. And as everybody knows that uh, Ice Age, uh, after that climatic condition changed and uh, there was no North Pole anymore. And the people who were living there, they had to move around in different directions. That is how the human civilization has come to exist. So how it happened, what was at the root? The unwelcome change in the climatic condition. 
Uh, this is the word which Bal Gangadhar Tilak is using. I am not using, I am repeating. Unwelcome changes in the climatic conditions. Next slide, please. Now, what is happening is that uh, uh, in the 15th century, these Europeans, they invented gun and then they went uh, all around the world and uh, killed people mercilessly and uh, imposed their religion on everybody and plundered them. And with that money, they created Paris and London and uh, all these great cities and invested into all this technology. But the point we are making is that a change in global or regional climate patterns, in particular a change apparent from the mid to late 20th century is a very stupid way of understanding the problem. It's a, it's a very small thing actually. In Corona pandemic time, as Dr. Tonapi says, I could write a small book with Professor Sayyad Hasnan, former vice chancellor of the University of Hyderabad. Together we wrote this book. And uh, the moment you take away the uh, pollution, polluting industry, not pollution, polluting industry, polluting car and all that, Earth was beautiful. And uh, Yamuna was uh, blue in Delhi. So it is not a problem. It is your own. It is your own bad behavior. It's not a problem. You cannot. You can't call it as a, as a problem. It's not a problem. It is a. It is a fault. Which we are. So like, it's not correct to uh, understand the climate change in this terminology. Uh, we have to have a very uh, different uh, and holistic uh, view, uh, which I am going to present. But before we go to the new slide, uh, I just want to mention here that uh, Juan Pablo Perez Alfonso, the Venezuelan oil minister in the early 1960s, said in 1975, we are drawing in the devil's excrement. We are drowning in the devil's excrement. This is the word he has used. David is urinating and we are drowning into that. This is the situation right now this uh, world is having. And it is not, it, it is scary actually. It's not even dangerous, it is scary. Because there is no going back from that. Uh, there is no way you can come out of that. It's, it's a very, very serious situation. Next slide, please. Now, the basic of uh, Vedic uh, concept is that uh, there is only one whole reality and uh, there are billions and billions of fragments of that, but it's one reality actually, it's one reality. Through this webinar, a hundred of us are on one page uh, and uh, we are pondering upon the one problem and then on the national level and on the international level. So, if you look at the Vedic perspective of one reality, then you can see that there is nothing independent. Because of this, this happened. Because of this, this that happened. Because of this, that happened. Everything is interrelated. And then the feedback goes. And then change automatically takes place. So if you see in this beautiful picture, you can see that uh, sun is uh, reflected through the surface of the ocean. And on the bottom of the ocean, there are beautiful patterns. Now, what are these patterns? Is nothing, nothing. If you remove the sun, uh, there is nothing. It is all black, all mass of matter. But because of this light, you can see different patterns and all that. So, this is the Vedic view. Kamsoma Jyotir Kamya, lead me to light. Because of light only, we can understand all these things. So, next few slides, I am going to focus on that light. Next slide, please. There is a, uh, in Atharva Ved, uh, 12th uh, Kanto, Kand, what we call it, there is a Bhumi Sukta, Bhumi Sukta, and there are 62 slokas there in that. 
Atharu read again. I repeat. Twelfth Kando, that is Barva Gai, Barva Kand, and in that there is a Bhumi Sukta, which we call twelve point one, and in that there are sixty two shlokas. Basically, these sixty two shlokas are uh, to pray Goddess Earth, Mother Earth, and I very sincerely suggest before I. Mentioned the first sloka. I want to use the good offices of Dr. Vilas Tornapi and this, uh, particularly the uh, Karnataka Agro Science uh, Association. Uh, they are the blessed souls. That I will provide the uh, simple English translation and Hindi translation, and then we can go through Canada, Telugu, and other translation also. Of this, these sixty-two slokas, Bhumi Sutra, and this should be mandatory for anybody who is taking a profession in agriculture sciences. कोई भी रहने दो, वो B.Sc करना है, M.Sc करना है, Ph.D करना है, वो आपको डिग्री तब तक नहीं मिलेगी, तब तक ये बासठ स्लोक जो है आप अच्छी तरह से नहीं पढ़ पाओगे। I mean, it's very simple. It's not that something. is very very thoughtful by reciting these 62 shlokas i'm not telling that they should learn sanskrit and all that people are very sensitive about language these days we we'll translate these shlokas in hindi we we'll translate these uh, shlokas in uh, kannada marathi hindi in legal form simple to recite so 62 shlokas will not take uh, more than uh, 15 20 minutes to go through 62 into 2 124 lines that's all And very precise one. They are not some big uh, algorithms and all that, but that will give a very good perspective. So what I'm going to do is that today I'm taking uh, some four shlokas only. I will mention, and that will give you a taste. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, that we are the children of. Dwava Prithvi, we are the children of earth and sky. First of all, beautiful expression. Who is who is a human being? Human being is the son of a child of earth and sky. There is no other definition because nowhere else in the universe uh, human beings exist. Humanity exists only on earth and under the sky. Under the sky means air, sunlight, all these things. Because of that, we exist. Dehi dhapa prati. Then he is further defining that where different uh, 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 sun moves and uh, all other planets are moving around us, and because of that, uh, this life is existing. And from this idea. Dwaha Prithi, uh, the word has come as uh, Dwaha Pitru, and it has later become Jupiter. Uh, as you know, in entire Europe, Greek civilization, uh, Jupiter is considered Jews. They call it Z D U S Jews. Uh, Britishers or Latin people they call it uh, uh, Jove, J O V E, Jove, Jupiter, Jove. So Jupiter is considered as the God, which control the entire affairs on this uh, in this universe, visible universe. So, <clears throat> first shloka, they are declaring children and uh, humanity as a child of earth and sky. And there is a beautiful novel by Gu Gavril K, uh, published by the same name. It's a wonderful. I mean, I I, I am a book person, and uh, I spend my time. Uh, mostly in reading good books, and uh, there are so many good books in this world that uh, if uh, uh, thousand people like me live thousand years also, <laughs> they will never never be able to finish those books. So many books are there. Next slide, please. The one uh, other another shloka is Mother Earth. Sustain and maintain the truth, order, 
spiritual passion witness of the past and future expand my consciousness so you know why we are born we are not born to uh, have a job and have a house and a car and a wife and two children and all that that is not the purpose of life that is that also happens we are born to expand our consciousness how much more you can learn how much more you can learn how much more you can understand how much more you can capture that is the purpose of the human life otherwise all animals also they have their children and uh, uh, there is nothing special to be a human being and to have a family everybody is having that and as far as this uh, cars and houses are i mean uh, senior people know that uh, it's as much difficult to buy a car it is uh, even more difficult to sell the car <laughs> because when it comes to uh, getting rid of things uh, the pain is even more so in this prayer the task of the life has been declared as the expansion of the consciousness and uh, whom the prayer is made prayer is made to mother earth and uh, to maintain the truth order spiritual passion because you are witnessing past and future human life is 70 80 90 100 years but earth sees so many people earth has seen alexander earth has seen akbar earth has seen indira gandhi earth is watching narendra modi ji and usko koi farak nahi padta bahut log aaye bahut log chale gaye so to that earth which is the witness of past and future this prayer is made the next slide please ilangon next slide got stuck up for one minute uh, no problem sir Yes, sir. It has come. So, in this shloka, six seasons are defined. Now, this is called the sophistication of uh, a civilization. Twelve months, six seasons, and uh, Grishm, Varsha, Sharad, Yaman, Shiv, Basant. the first symptom that something is wrong with your climate is when these six seasons are jumbled you don't know what is going on right now suddenly in the month of may um, hail storm is coming and uh, it's lashing so there is something wrong it should not be actually and then uh, in the winter what we call is Uh, severe winter that is shishir sharad yaman shishir winter is divided into three uh, pre winter and then autumn uh, it starts with autumn and then pre winter and then winter and then spring like that it goes so if the six seasons are not felt distinctly that means the climate is not in order this is a first sign and you can see that it is in terrible mess up no they have no idea what is going on so this is the first symptom and this has been given uh, in uh, atharvaveda bhumi sukta shlok number 3 so this is the depth of the wisdom which people are having who went together ocean and earth waters food which he manifest again because of this woven together of ocean and river water we get food because if this river waters are not there if uh, respiration does not take place respiration does not take place cloud formation does not take place monsoon does not come rain is not dispersed all over the body there is no question of agriculture production of food so it is a very very interconnected thing actually so this is very nicely explained in this shloka next slide please 
now this uh, six seasons uh, beautifully shown in this uh, particular slide uh, there is a joy of every season and uh, unfortunate are those who for whatever reason they run away from the rain uh, it is very important that at least one rain you get drenched totally and uh, it gives it, 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 it uh, open up the entire body actually so it's very important to enjoy all these uh, six seasons uh, to the fullest uh, not i mean please don't cover yourself with the so many woolens and all that just feel that uh, chill and it, it gives you so much satisfaction and so much joy and so many hidden latent forces in the body they get activated because of that and keep you healthy for the rest of the year uh, next slide please now uh, it's a matter of uh, very uh, it's a matter of joy and satisfaction that uh, indian space research organization uh, they called the visualization of earth observation data and archival system the project is called as vedas the first uh, letter of visualization of earth observation data and archival system it is done by space application center uh, in ahmedabad is already in place and uh, it is uh, really observing uh, the climate and uh, we have we are in a position actually we are world class uh, as far as the monitoring of the weather and climate is concerned this is a great achievement uh, not many countries can do that and uh, we have done it uh, we have done it because it was denied to us and uh, the plan was that we forever dependent on all these things to foreigners but the visionary leaders uh, in the past they could appreciate and they could understand that it has to be done indigenously and by our own people and it is the efforts of these people and a lot of funding there was no money at that time but still they could manage money for the research that we are self reliant and cutting edge technology as far as the monitoring of climate is concerned from space next slide please you log on i can stuck up sir one minute so uh, now i come to the crux of the problem and as i mentioned that uh, six seasons uh, are interwoven with each other so similarly there is a system for is also which is defined and at the core of that system and center of that system or the axis of that system is satya and surrounding that is rit rit is the cycle uh, ritu word has come from that cycle only that six six season cycle so that cycle is there and based on this satya and ritu we should have our dharma dharma means the law so satya is the basis rit is the order and dharma is the law so people always uh, call about uh, law and order problem there is a very serious law and order problem in personal lives social lives community lives the big mess so unless this mess is addressed unless this system is corrected there is no hope that uh, we can get rid of the uh, problem which is going to Uh, fall upon us uh, because of the climate, because of the economics, because of so many things uh, which are there, which are not in our control. Some war has happened somewhere in Europe, and your petrol prices increase, and then uh, the uh, sunflower seed uh, mostly it comes from Ukraine and Russia. So next season you are going to have five hundred rupees per liter for the sunflower oil. 
to kare koi bare koi something is happening somewhere and we are suffering in this process so everything is interrelated and everything uh, depend upon everything else the point i am making here is that this dharma the uh, around this dharma is the achar that is conduct of human being and is very nicely explained here uh, the uh, uh, dam uh, maryada kulachar shauch ran now we have to be very clear that dam means we have to have some restraint on ourselves some yam some niyam some 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 restriction should be there you can't sleep whenever you feel like you can't eat whenever you feel like you can't drink because you are feeling happy or feeling sad so there are certain rules and regulations which have to be followed so that is very important that restrain on yourself then there is a maryada uh, how to talk to superiors how to talk to seniors how to talk to those who are elder to you and who are working in your field and who spend more number of years than you reversely how to take care of the youngsters as as if they are their children and see to it that uh, through their hands all that happened which could, you could not do for some reasons maybe your seniors were not good so compensate uh, that flaws and that those inadequacies by your behavior with your youngsters then kulachar kulachar means in to what kul so kul doesn't mean that uh, your gotra and your jati and all that it is your specialty which you have selected in science i'll talk about science so suppose somebody is a plant pathologist somebody is a agronomist somebody is a whatever field you have selected for yourself please find out excellence is that don't be jack of all trade don't uh, get into discussing everything including ipl mein kaun jeetega koi bhi jeetega hai kya farak padta hai you decide about what is happening in your field and go deep into that so 30 40 years of your career if you devote only to one problem which you decide which field you want to work in science it is very clear in medical specialty it is very clear somebody is a cardiologist is a cardiologist so he is supposed to spend 30 40 years in looking at some one or two lakhs heart of the people and take the science of cardiology to a next level but instead of that they are making uh, villas in uh, jubilee hills and buying uh, audi and mercedes benz and all that this is a different issue again it is uh, durachar it is not kulachar but kulachar is whatever field you take go deeper into that and uh, explore more and god will bless you and then comes shauch shauch means whatever is bad inside you anger aata hai greed hai irritation hai wo sab ko nikal dene ka hai okay you have to clear yourself from all that muck which you are carrying because uh, you have no control on your ancestors so theek uh, hai whatever it is it is so from this dna through this lifetime if i can remove uh, the predisposition or inclinations to a sanger greed lust all these things if i can do that uh, that would be a wonderful thing to happen and finally the concept of run that every everything is uh, i mean uh, we have been given everything actually in this world so we are under debt and this debt has to be repaid by giving back giving back the knowledge giving back the love and affection giving back service that is the purpose of life and uh, if everybody start to understand this whole fundamental is a cycle people were there before us people will be there after us and it is our good conduct uh, which is going to make this world better then this whole problem of climate change this is the only way that it can be mitigated otherwise as in the past there will be a big problem and everything will be destroyed and nature will not blink a eye because uh, god is omnipotent and uh, he will create some other world i mean nobody is lost uh, other set of humanity will be created uh, some noahs are some people will be saved other people will be destroyed 
but if proper corrections are made in the right spirit perhaps uh, uh, your children and your future generation will be those who will be saved and will not be those who will be destroyed next slide now i come to the uh, conclusion and uh, in conclusion there is a uh, very famous uh, sanskrit shloka which uh, i would like to quote ati sarvatra vajrayet so wherever there is ati wherever there is access it is forbidden now if you can see in this uh, picture uh, there is plastic everywhere and uh, unwittingly unknowingly uh, cattle uh, get choked themselves uh, by plastic because if this whole plastic can uh, really suffocate the animal and uh, then in this particular picture uh, is self explanatory but you can see one crow is sitting uh, above this uh, kettle uh, and uh, i saw it as uh, the immortal crow that is kagushandi uh, who watches uh, one generation of i mean one generation goes another generation come and uh, if you remember if you have read uh, ramcharit manas so when this uh, garuda is uh, having that uh, pang of uh, uh, pride that he saved uh, vishnu from uh, nagpash in uh, fighting with meghna uh, then uh, vishnu sent him to lord shiva and lord shiva sent him to kagushandi and he tell him the story so kagushandi is considered as the eternal uh, eternal he never dies and uh, so in uh, pitrupaksh we always feed uh, crows so crow is sitting over the uh, cattle and watching the whole situation so with these words i uh, conclude this uh, uh, lecture and uh, i'll be very happy to take up questions uh, thank you very much dr tonapri thank you very much dr bhat and uh, i'm very pleased that uh, through this i could able to connect all of you god bless all of you thank you very much thank you sir thank you so much and uh, it was really enlightening and uh, to look into the scriptures how uh, they corrected uh, the entire cosmos and the nature with the human existence and the human existence is nothing but is the life in balance that we need to really create uh, sir we have one more lecture maybe uh, at the end we can take sir if you have time or we would like to No, sir. I will. I will be there. No problem, sir. Please. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, now, sir, we will go to Doctor Himamshu Patak. Uh, it is the valedictory address uh, by him. I requested, so he has readily agreed. Uh, Patak sir, uh, we are very happy to have you here for your uh, presentation on emerging technologies and innovations for addressing climate change in agriculture. so this topic uh, is one of the important things after having discussed uh, all the issues in climate change for the last two days so before we go to his presentation uh, uh, let me have an opportunity to introduce him to everybody and uh, dr humash patak is now the director of uh, indian institute of abiotic stress management at baramati in maharashtra he obtained his masters and phd in soil science and agricultural chemistry from indian agricultural research institute new delhi and uh, before this he has served as the director of uh, national rice research institute katak odisha and uh, i had an opportunity to uh, work with him at iri when i was there as the head of the division in seed science and technology in fact he is the brilliant scientist who worked in the climate change and uh, uh, the network climate net network uh, nationally and also with the international consortiums uh, he also uh, uh, worked as co-facilitator for rice wheat consortium and uh, 
uh, also as a visiting scientist at Institute of Meteorology and Climate Research, Germany, and University of Essex, United Kingdom. His research includes soil science, climate change, and abiotic stress management. He has published over more than 200 research papers with H index of 67 and I10 index of 199 and more than 18,000 citations. Uh, he's the lead of, uh, he was the lead author of IPCC Fifth Assessment Report and refinement to the IPCC guidelines for national greenhouse gas interventions and reviewer of IPCC Sixth Assessment Report 2022. He's the fellow of uh, Indian National Science Academy, National Academy of Science, National Academy of Agricultural Sciences, and Humboldt Foundation and Rafi Ahmad Kidwai Awardee of ICR. So it gives me a great pleasure to welcome Himam Patak, and uh, we are very eager to hear to your address, sir. So Dr. Patak, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tonapi, Dr. Tiwari, and all other very distinguished uh, participants and also panelists. I was really happy, Dr. Tonapi, to know that for the last two days, uh, you have been discussing exclusively on climate change. And I was, uh, again, fortunate to be present in the lecture, which was just delivered by uh, Dr. Tiwari. So uh, Dr. Tiwari, of course, I uh, was talking about uh, the past or Vedic civilization and the contributions of uh, Indian science to understand climate and climate change and so on. What I will be doing is uh, to tell you some of the technologies which we are using currently and also the ones which are emerging which will be very useful in terms of managing climate change, may it be adaptation, may it be mitigation, and so on. So uh, let me share my presentation. Uh, Dr. Tonapi, whether the presentation is visible? It is, it is visible, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Am I clearly audible? Yeah, it's audible. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, I'll be talking on this emerging technologies and innovations for managing climate change in agriculture. And of course, uh, no need to repeat what Dr. Tiwari already said. These are all interlinked. Uh, but let me tell you, climate is the major determinant uh, of agriculture. And when I say agriculture, it includes crop, forestry, fisheries, animal, and of course, ultimately, human beings. So sun along with air, water, soil, these are the major drivers for all the activities, including agriculture, what we have been doing. But unfortunately, this climate is changing. This climate is changing. And some of the latest report, and I shall take a few minutes to discuss about that. Latest report of IPCC, that is Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and also the reports of government of India, particularly from Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, I'll be summarizing the findings of uh, those reports to give you an idea what uh, the current climate is and what kind of climate we are going to have in times to come. So the IPCC sixth assessment report, uh, part one says that uh, climatic parameters are changing in an unprecedented way. So carbon dioxide concentration is highest in at least 2 million years. Sea level rise is fastest in at least 3,000 years. Arctic sea ice area is lowest in around 1,000 years. Glaciers <coughs> retreat again unprecedented in at least 2,000 years or so. So these are the changes. And you know that uh, current concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is more than 115 ppm. During summer uh, uh, last year, it was 419, 420 ppm or so. So this is really, really unprecedented. What kind of temperature we are going to see in times to come? If you see near-term, mid-term, as well as long-term climatic change, of course, it will depend upon what kind of development the world is going to take, what the different countries of the world are going to do in times to come, whether they are going to take a green road, giving lots of importance to climate change, reducing emission of greenhouse gases, or whether they are going to take, take the highway without considering anything for climate change environment. They simply go on as they have done in last few decades, fossil fuel development. And of course, in between, there could be several scenarios, middle of the road, rocky road, a road divided. 
So depending upon what kind of uh, development pathways the countries are going to take, temperature will be different. But then the near term one, which is between 2021 and 2040, so in another 18, 20 years, the best estimate shows that the temperature is going to rise by around 1.5 degrees centigrade. Already around 1.1 to 1.2 degrees centigrade rise has taken place. It is going to increase by around 1.5 degrees. Friends, probably all of you know that 1.5 degrees centigrade temperature was a buzzword a few years back and the whole world community was trying to restrict global temperature rise by 1.5 degree by the end of the century. But then now we did not wait up to the end of the century, it is going to come in another 18, 20 years or even much earlier. So this is the near term scenario. In the mid term scenario, the temperature could be anywhere between 1.6 to 2.4 degrees centigrade temperature. And of course, at the long term, say by the end of this century, temperature could be anywhere between 1.4 to 4.4. 1.4 if the world takes the green path, taking the green road. And of course, 4.4 if you are going to take the highway. So it will be anywhere in between, but certainly it is going to be more than 1.5 more than 2.0 degrees centigrade as well. So this is the temperature scenarios in years to come. What will be the impacts of all of these changes? Impacts will be local as well as global. It is not restricted to any continent, to any, any, any region or any country. Locally as well as globally, the impacts will be observed. And more importantly, simultaneous multiple extreme events will compound the risk. So you are not going to face one risk at a time. Multiple risk will be happening, will be affecting simultaneously, and that will compound the whole risk. And those will be increasing heat as well as drought, reducing crop field, increased food prices, heat stress among farm workers, reduced productivity, reduced household incomes, and locally and globally, all the effects will be observed, will be felt. What does this temperature increase means in terms of in terms of impact? For example, when you are saying increase in temperature, so if I can see that when the temperature already increased by around one degree centigrade, we are observing extreme temperature event only three times in 10 years. So currently with one degree centigrade increase, it is three times in 10 years. When the temperature is increased by 1.5 degree centigrade, then it is four times in 10 years. With two degree centigrade increase, it is going to be six times in 10 years. And with four degree centigrade temperature increase, it is going to be nine to 10 times in 10 years. So the frequency number of events will certainly go on increasing. But more importantly, the intensity also will increase. So if it is only 1.2 degrees hotter, it is going to be say 5.1 degree hotter with four degrees centigrade increase. So intensity as well as frequency, both are going to increase. Similarly for heavy precipitation, again, frequency as well as intensity will increase. And when heavy precipitation, extreme temperature events, this change, then certainly agricultural drought, agricultural drought is also going to be more in number, more in frequency, as well as more in intensity. And as all, you, all of you know that all this increase in temperature is basically because of emission of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And unfortunately, these are continuously increasing, continuously increasing. But one or two good points among here is uh, if you see since 1990 to 2000, the rate of increase in GHGs in the atmosphere was only 0.7% per year. But then during 2000 to 2010, it was increasing at a rate of 2.1%. So three times increase, 2.1% increase per year. But in the last decade, 2010 onwards, it is increasing, but at a decreased rate, it is now 1.3% per year. So this is maybe one good point. Now, how much is the emission of all these greenhouse gases? Globally, all this uh, effect will see that carbon dioxide contributes 75%, followed by methane 18%, nitrous oxide 4%. India more or less similar, but numbers are little different. In India, carbon dioxide contributes 79%, say 80%, followed by methane 14%, nitrous oxide 5%, and others are around 2%. 
just few numbers probably for my younger friends uh, who would like to remember some of these that in 2020 the world emitted around 60 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent carbon dioxide equivalent means when you also consider methane which is 21 times more potential as a greenhouse gas compared to one molecule of carbon dioxide and also nitrous oxide which is 310 times more potential as a greenhouse gas compared to carbon dioxide so 60 billion tons and agriculture globally contributes around 10 to 12 percent but if you include agriculture, forestry, and other land use, we call it FLU, then the contribution is 25%. That means one fourth of the GHGs come directly or indirectly from agriculture. India emits around 6% of global GHGs, and Indian agriculture contributes only 0.8% of global GHG and 14% of Indian GHGs. So this is the numbers in relation to Indian agriculture, global GHG emission, and so on. Now, those uh, numbers I was showing about global, what kind of climate change scenarios are projected for India? So some of our own studies show the temperature, uh, particularly minimum temperature is rising more than maximum temperature. More rise and more variable during Ravi season than Kharif season, and more rise in North India than in South India. In terms of rainfall, intensity as well as variability increasing in India as well. Duration of total rainfall is reducing and increasing extreme events, unseasonal rain, drought, flood, all these are going to increase in number. As a result, crop yield is going to be very significantly affected. Yields of wheat and rice would decline by around 9 to 12% in 2040. And similarly, you can see some of the other crops as well. Suitability of rainfall rice area will be declining by around 15 to 40% by 2015. And not only total yield, but the quality in terms of say grain, protein, or micronutrient like zinc and iron content in many crops will also be reduced. So these are going to be the impacts of changing climate on crop yield as well as quality. You know, this year because of terminal heat, not everywhere, but in some places, in Northwest India, the yield of wheat has gone down by around 20%. And as a result, around five to 6% of total wheat productivity has gone down. So this is just in our very recent experience of what climate change in terms of terminal heat, one event, terminal heat can do. As I told that drought is going to be more in terms of frequency as well as intensity. Let me show you what kinds of impacts of drought Indian agriculture can have. As you know that out of 140 million hectare net sown area, 75 million hectare is unirrigated in our country, which is very prone to drought. And because of severe drought, India's GDP is reduced by around 2 to 5% per annum. And around 5 crore people are affected by drought annually. And if the drought becomes severe, then 33 crore people will be affected. And there are some examples of that one. And unfortunately, uh, you know, drought is many people project is going to be the next pandemic. And certainly we need a vaccine for this. And again, frequency as well as intensity of drought is increasing all over the India. So you can see these four figures. This is during 80 to 89, 90 to 99, 2000 to 2009, and then the last decade. And you can see just by the colors of these maps that the frequency of drought is increasing in various parts of India. Not only climate change and extreme heat waves and changing pattern of rainfall, but India has got its own problem of depletion of groundwater. And most of you work in agriculture, so you know that in terms of depletion of groundwater, how, how severe it is in some parts of the country, all these red areas. This one shows number of arms for extracting groundwater and you can see all all over all all over the places pollution of water bodies is another problem which is also not only going to impact the quality of water but also the amount of water which is going to be available for domestic as well as for agriculture use our preference for food which are more water demanding is also shifting and that is also in a way increasing the demand of water and as a result of all of these, 
already the per capita availability of water in this country has fallen down but then the projection is that in the next few years probably india will become a water scarce country which is already in but is also going to become a water oh, sorry water stress country and it is going to become water scarce country where availability of water will be less than 1000 meter cube per person per year so these are the problems problems related to climate change in the water front only so the projection is that some parts of our country might be having very less water drought some parts will be having flood more excess amount of water and both are going to create problem not only for humans but also for agriculture so just to sum up all of this before i go to the technologies to manage these problems so summing up you know that climate change is widespread and intensifying our own report of government of india and also ipcc reports simply simply confirm that it will cross 1.5 degree centigrade line by 2040 in another 18 20 years the march and april months just last one was the hottest in last 122 years rainfall variability and intensity are increasing sea level rising cyclones are becoming fiercer and frequent and just few days back we had another kind of cyclone called osoni so these these are the realities and all the extreme events of climate be it cyclone heavy rain heat wave flood drought all are going to increase in number and also in intensity to see all of these things it is not that people are not aware of that globally lots of efforts are being done and uh, this is one of the latest development just last year our honorable prime minister in the cop 26 cop is conference of parties meeting which deals with climate change issues formulating policy identifying technologies and so on so india has made five commitments we call them panchamrit to control climate change what are those that by 2030 in another 8 years we shall reduce emissions intensity by 45% we shall drop 50% of energy from renewable sources solar wind and so on we shall raise non fossil fuel based energy capacity to 500 gigawatt we shall cut carbon emission by 1 billion ton and by 2070 the final and most important uh, important commitment is that we shall attain net zero emission and carbon neutrality so these are the commitments of india to the global communities now the question is how indian agriculture can contribute to fulfill these commitments and how indian agriculture can become climate resilient and carbon neutral current climate resilient and carbon neutral in say in another 15 20 years or so so what i will be discussing now what kind of technologies we have or which are emerging which will be helping us to make indian agriculture climate neutral make indian agriculture climate resilient before i proceed let me very uh, briefly talk about we talk of climate smart agriculture now when you talk of climate smart agriculture and that's what uh, we need to do is the agriculture that sustainably sustainably increases resilience which is adaptation reduces ghg emission greenhouse gas emissions mitigation and enhances food productivity so it is not only one or two it includes all three adaptation mitigation as well as food security so the technologies which we will be looking for for future agriculture is the technologies which will be having all these three components directly or maybe in a way co benefiting each other so that climate resilient agriculture can be achieved so let's see what kind of technologies we have got over here i shall give examples very briefly few examples in terms of what are the emerging technologies and innovations uh, uh, for climate smart agriculture in terms of climate smart crops and varieties next generation climate services precision water management efficient nutrient management climate smart carbon and energy management your carbon farming dr tonapi told me and that it was discussed in detail protected cultivation and vertical farming climate smart livestock production climate smart fisheries as well as aquaculture so just one and of course i can see many of the audience over here are plant breeders so they know it very well one of the emerging technologies 
uh, is going to be genome editing to accelerate development of varieties. You know how this tool can be very useful for developing varieties which are tolerant to several stresses, biotic as well as abiotic, salinity, drought, flood, and so on, in much less time compared to our earlier conventional method, which takes longer time. And you also will be happy to know that already some of the gene edited crops are being grown elsewhere, not in our country, but in other countries. So these are some of the examples of soybean, tomato in different places. And the good news is that government of India has exempted genome edited plants, SGN1 and 2, from biosafety assessment very recently, March 30 of this year, 2020. So probably this is going to be one technology which will be tremendously useful in developing climate smart varieties tolerant to different stresses. Second one is of course CRISPR diagnostics uh, for climate smart agriculture. And again, my breeders or my biotechnologists, they know it very well that this is a very rapid, reliable, inexpensive, highly sensitive, portable and on-field nucleic acid detection method. And it can be again applied in several domains for drought tolerance, salinity tolerance, herbicide tolerance, flood tolerance, and so on. And already some of the CRISPR-based platforms for rapid diagnosis with a level of say 10 to the power minus 18 moles per liter are available. And of course, it is going to be further uh, being progressed for base editing, prime editing, and so on. So this is, this is another one for developing climate smart crops. Besides developing climate smart crops, we should also try for some of the new, as well as earlier crops, which we call them climate smart crops, like millet. And of course, IIM at ISDA Institute, which is working, working so efficiently on this aspect. Of course, this year is again international year of millet, very rightly. And from climate change mitigation, as well as in my adaptation point of view, millets have got a very special role to play. But besides this, some of the new crops like dragon fruit, and this is the photograph of the orchard, which is there in our, our own institute in Niazam Baramati. Similarly, there are crops like quinoa, chia, and so on. So these hardy crops, climate smart crops, again, we should explore for the areas which are having more stresses. Second group of technologies, the next generation climate services, very, very important. Whatever you do, climatic variabilities are going to increase. So not our traditional or conventional agro-advisory services. We need to develop next generation agro-advisory services. We have to use artificial intelligence as well as machine learning for delivery of those advisories. And of course, good developments that happen in satellite-based crop health monitoring and its integration with agro-advisories delivering smart agro-advisories for disaster as well as extreme weather events. And at the same time, we also need to strengthen our crop insurance system. As I said, already some of the products are there in the market, but then we need to upscale this product so that it can reach to even a small as well as marginal farmer. Third one is of course, precision water management. Uh, no need to discuss. Again, most of you are working in agriculture and you know the role of using water precisely. Water is always a very, very important but scarce commodity. And there we need to use sensors and artificial intelligence in automated irrigation, solar energy-based micro-irrigation, deficit irrigation for optimizing water use, some of the hydrogels and biomaterials for enhancing water use efficiency. And more importantly, one is agroecological crop planning, which I shall discuss a little bit later, that we need to follow some of these technologies for managing water, managing water, which is going to be more and more scarce in the climate change scenarios. Again, lots of good developments have happened and so several ISHA institutes are also working in this direction. Efficient Newton management is the fourth area of technologies where we should focus on using nanotechnology for Newton management already a nano urea is there in the market. Novel customized fertilizer and leaf color chart, bio fertilizers and microbial technologies, very large area, very large avenue is opening up. Variable rate fertilizer application with, again, tools like drone and using urea as inhibitor. Our institute and some other institutes are working. See, neem coated urea has got nitrification inhibitor, which has which can increase nitrogen use efficiency by around say five to 10%. But 
if we can use urea inhibitor along with nitrification inhibitor, then the efficiency of nitrogen can be further increased by around say 20-30%. Currently, this is around 35%. It can be taken to 55 to 60% or so on. And again, some of the products are there in testing phase, and hopefully in near future, these kinds of products will be available in the market. Then of course, climate smart carbon and the energy management, carbon farming, I shall not talk about it. Already you discussed about it. Precision land leveling and conservation agriculture. Again, a very familiar topic to all of you. Use of renewable sources of energy, afforestation and reforestation in degraded lands, promoting agroforestry. And of course, some of these tools could be very useful for managing carbon and also energy. Protected cultivation and vertical farming, is very uh, well performing. Of course, it made some of the uh, cost, but then this has got very high potential in some areas. So protected cultivation, vertical farming, hydrophonics, aerophonics, processing and value chain. So all of these, whatever suitable economically as well as climatically, we should be trying them out for more climate resilience. Of course, not only crop sector, but uh, certainly in livestock as well as uh, fishery sectors, a lot of new technologies are emerging. One is use of sensors for detection of heat stress in livestock as well as poultry, microclimate control, supplementation of uh, red algae for reducing methane emission, supplementation of probiotics, micronutrients, antioxidants for GHG mitigation, feeding bypass protein. There are several uh, which are available. And currently we are working on a publication for, for TIFAC of DST where we are, we are collecting all these emerging technologies and innovations uh, for climate resilient agriculture, which will be submitted to government of India for taking further necessary action. And then of course, as I said, for fisheries as well as aquaculture also, lots of good developments have already happened and are emerging in terms of automated digital technology for improving catching, carbon sequestration through seaweed farming, bioflux technology and functional feeds for elevating stresses, blockchain technology for traceability of marine catch and GIS-based identification of vulnerable regions and efficient engineering, farm design, and so on. So these things are already happening. But you know, we are all scientists uh, and our role is to gather more and more useful information, generate a lot of data, compile them and scientifically come out with the solution in terms of science and technology. And for all of this, we need to generate data. This is one, uh, one initiative we have taken in our institute where we are in the process of developing and collecting all the data uh, from various sources to prepare maps for soil, water, climate, their impacts and management options, not only at state level, not only at district level, but also at block and sometimes at a village level. You know, our ordinary soil maps uh, for nitrogen, organic carbon, those are based on only maybe one or two lakhs data points, but our soil map is made up of more than 16 crores data points. So these kinds of information we need to generate for all other parameters so that we'll be able to provide precious information there. And the finally one, in macro scale, we need to develop which you call as eco-regional crop planning. What is eco-regional crop planning? That we should not grow any crop anywhere by simply exploiting natural resources. This is an example of rice eco-regions. Eco-regions of rice means what are the areas of the country which are suitable for growing rice in terms of more rainfall, in terms of soil, in terms of congenial temperature. And of course, you can see the areas which are very suitable, suitable, moderately suitable, or unsuitable. If you grow a crop in very suitable or suitable areas, then your external use of water, fertilizer are going to be very, very minimum. So you will be able to grow crop, which you can call as nature friendly. But then if you are going to grow crop in unsuitable areas, then of course, you have to use more and more of the natural resources. So this is what we need to do at the macro scale at the country level. But then friends, before I conclude, I shall take maybe a few more minutes uh, uh, that having technology is one thing, but then upscaling those technologies is going to be uh, altogether different ball games because they are not only what technology we have developed, but also stakeholders need what farmers want, what irrigation manager want, what policy makers want. So all of these, so technology, 
plus several other socio-economic and policy related questions we need to address to upscale these technologies. Sometimes even the problems of male adoption of the technologies, wrong adoption. For example, here is an example of direct shedding of rice. If you manage water in direct shedded rice, similar way you do in puddled rice, then instead of saving water, you will be using more and more water. Instead of reducing emission of GHGs, you will be emitting more and more amount of GHGs. So wrong adoption is also a problem. So we need to understand what the technology and what are the implications. Similarly, if you go for incomplete adoption of conservation agriculture, incomplete means, say for example, in rice wheat system, you follow conservation agriculture only for wheat, but for the rice, you go for the conventional one. For example, here in zero till wheat, all the residues are there, but in rice, instead of going for aerobic rice or direct seeded rice, you go for puddled, transplanted, submerged rice. Then instead of reducing emission of GHGs, this is going to increase the emission of GHGs. So these things we need to keep in mind. Finally, for climate smart agriculture, I say that we need to take into consideration five aims. What are those five aims? Market, monsoon, mechanization, automation, customering, and so on, management and man manpower, capacity building, skill, training, and so on. So market, monsoon, mechanization, management, and manpower, all these five need to be integrated, need to be developed simultaneously. So a unified framework for upscaling climate smart agriculture we need to develop. And of course, this is a kind of framework of how to unify, how to integrate all of these all of these technologies as well as policies together so that climate smart agriculture can be upscaled. So friends, uh, final words are, though climate change is a problem, it is going to intensify in terms of frequency and, 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 and all of this. But then the technology which we already have or which are emerging, if we can adopt those technologies, then not only we will be able to compensate the loss, we also will be able to increase the production. For example, in business as usual scenario, that means if you do not do anything, if you do not adopt new technology, new policy, then of course climate change will reduce crop yield by around say 20% in next 15, 20 years. This year already it has started happening. Last few years we are losing also around five to 6%. But if you adopt some of these technologies, so you can see in this graph that not only will be able to compensate this loss, but also will be able to enhance the productivity. This is one, one, one good thing to see, to look at it. And again, in terms of mitigation and achieving net zero. So I was doing one simple analysis that can Indian agriculture attain net zero emission? And my assessment shows, yes, we can. The technologies which we have got even today, if we can upscale, not to entire area, but at least say 25, to, uh, in some cases it is 50% area, then certainly our current emission which is only around 147, 150 million tons, we will be able to mitigate around 163, 65 million tons. So there is potential, there is opportunities to mitigate the emission also. So therefore friends, uh, uh, let me conclude saying that agriculture is the source as well as sufferer of climate change. And that is unfortunately aggravating, but it can be a solution as well. And I gave a few examples to that. Climate smart agriculture technologies are available and emerging. They need to be reoriented and also upscaling. We certainly need research and development and institutional support and reshaping uh, for upscaling the proven solutions. R&D is very, very important. And when you talk of Atma Nirvar Bharat, Atma Nirvar Bharat cannot be achieved without its own research and development. With borrowed technology, we cannot sustain luck. We have to develop our own research, own science, own technology. We need strong interministerial and institutional coordination for resource use and implementation. And of course, for that, we need a mission mode approach to promote climate smart agriculture technologies to make significant impacts. So this is what I wanted to share with all of you in terms of what are the emerging as well as emerging technologies as well as innovations which are available to address the problems of climate change. So with this, uh, I stop with the presentation and I thank uh, Dr. Tonabi and the whole team very, very profusely for giving me this uh, opportunity.
And I really feel this is an extremely useful opportunity for me to share some of the thoughts because these are the technologies, these are the innovations uh, which all our scientists are now need to work upon. So this was a platform, Dr. Tonapi, which you have given uh, to me to share some of these th thoughts. And then of course, our scientists can think about it and also can do whatever we can do for managing climate change and also make Indian agriculture climate smart and also Indian agriculture carbon neutral. Thank you very much, all of you, once again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Himanshu. Uh, it was a wonderful to have you here <coughs> and also it's icing on the cake. In fact, uh, two days uh, deliberations, we had uh, uh, individual components being di discussed, the action plans, and also the uh, policies that could come up. So we are trying to put together the entire deliberations into a policy document. Probably we will share it with you, probably for you to advise us and uh, uh, fine-tune it so that before it goes to the uh, uh, higher-ups for this particular purpose. So that's how uh, we try to put it together. And uh, before we conclude and wrap up the things, we have uh, time for a few questions. Uh, first to Arun Tiwari, sir. Sir, do you think uh, we did not follow the uh, innate principles of existence? We went on abusing the things, and that's how we are the, in this situation today? No, sir. We did not. It, the situation was not bad. The situation is becoming bad in the last 20, 25 years. Before that, we were following. Everything was good, sir. The crises are coming now. And uh, if I uh, take into consideration what Dr. Patak was just telling, that uh, this groundwater depletion, everywhere we are sucking water out of, uh, and then the no, 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 this uh, not not water sense. Water is going to be a big problem. And then this uh, temperature thing is all because of concrete jungles we are living. And it's, it's a big mess we are, I mean, and, and unless there is a pause, unless there is a thinking, uh, if you see the, if, where I am staying in uh, Gachibaudi area, uh, it is a concrete jungle now. And uh, very smartly people are uh, encroaching upon the lakes and uh, in 10 years the lake has gone and one uh, nice housing complex come and uh, every flat is sold for crores of rupees, what was a lake. Uh, at some point of time, and uh, nobody is intervening because, as if everything is okay, all our Gandhari is now. So, all this thing is not going to be unpunished. So, there is a serious problem, and uh, unless these problems are solved, uh, we are in for a bad time. Sir, actually, this is what I think. Maybe we forgot because Rigveda it says, You give me, I will give back to you. Maybe we did not replenish this earth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, anybody has uh, uh, one last two quick questions? Maybe, uh, sir, we can discuss further in some other uh, de deliberations uh, yes, uh, on this one. So, uh, Ramesh, you have anything uh, for Dr. Tiwari, sir? No, no, not for Tiwari. In general, I would like to speak a little, complete the question answer session, then I will take it. Right. So, uh, Dr. Himanshu, uh, can you just uh, uh, enlighten on, because things are going to shift cropping system-wise, the dry areas becoming wet, wet areas becoming dry. Uh, the, can we really look at the changing map of India in terms of cropping systems and the crop-based planning or crop colonies we need to develop? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Tonapi. You know, that's what I said in point number 10, agroecological planning. So that we really need to do. And probably you are aware that ICR has already uh, formed a committee uh, to make crop planning. Uh, we did it for rice, but then for more other, several other crops are also we are going to do. This is really uh, a very important area of research. Though I can understand that implementation is a problem. See, for for last many years, we have been talking that uh, Punjab or Haryana is not very suitable for growing rice, but then uh, farmers are still growing because uh, 
we could not provide them a very attractive alternative. But then the way things are happening, probably there will be no other way. Earlier, of course, the opportunity was not there because uh, we certainly need our more price, more wheat. But then as we are producing sufficient amount, there is some opportunity now that we will be able to grow rice more climate friendly way, more uh, soil friendly way, more uh, nature friendly way. And uh, that's what is the objective of this ICRs exercise of developing crop planning for all crops, for major crops at least in the country, identifying the zones and cost benefit and, and those kinds of things. That is one of the areas which countries would invest in next say 10, 15 years. It is not going to happen next year in one, one year or two years or so. It is mid term as well as a long-term kind of program which we, we need to do. And that will be very, very useful. And if you do not do it, probably the nature will force you to do that. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Yeah, yeah. Sir, uh, uh, Arun Tiwari, sir, uh, I think uh, final words on what we uh, heard from uh, Imam Shu and what you can really uh, tell us finally, uh, so that this climate change, agriculture, sustainability, and the secure future for food and nutrition. So your thoughts on this? Um, sir, uh, uh, my, I, I am very clear on that. Unless we have a holistic thinking, all is interconnected, all is one. And uh, what is good for me cannot be what is bad for others. So what is happening in uh, Punjab and what is happening in Haryana for just now Dr. Patak has said, uh, similar examples are what is happening in Andhra Pradesh and what is happening in some of the other parts. I mean, people have become, you know, what uh, they have made their own uh, forts and guard of agriculture also. Colonization of agriculture has already taken place. So we have to look into that and uh, what happened in the farmer uh, during that, Annadatta and I am the boss and you have to, whole parliament has to sit down and listen to me and all that. These kind of tendencies are not good and they are not going to lead us to anywhere. And uh, it's very important that this uh, map of what Dr. Patak is showing, these uh, 10 technologies and all that, upscaling is a big issue. So I see that uh, there is a serious problem uh, of upscaling. It was always there actually. But uh, we have to learn something from China. We have to learn something from West. Uh, this whole uh, fixation, this uh, narcissism that uh, we are the great people, we know everything and we are going to give solution to the world and all is a uh, little egoistic and it is not good. And there are so many things we have to learn from China and we have to learn from the West and which is the upscaling of a technology. It's very difficult in India. The problem has never been about ideas. The problem has never been about I made a coronary stent, as you remember, in uh, uh, mid-90s. Uh, we could not upscale it. And there are so many uh, excellent solutions which are being failed in upscaling. So somehow we have to see that uh, upscaling is done. And if upscaling is not done, uh, as uh, very subtly said, uh, nature will force upon us. And uh, that forcing naturally will be cruel and it will not be very pleasant thing to do. So I think uh, the roadmap is very clear. And uh, this last slide which I use that uh, access of everything is bad. And uh, it also comes to access of talking. So we are talking a little too much and uh, we should moderate our talking and uh, go back to uh, doing more. And uh, uh, at that note, I would like to conclude uh, my points. Just, just in a uh, rejoinder, Stephen Hawking, before he died, two weeks before he submitted a paper, the world is not going to be there uh, anymore. And uh, some other uh, uh, universe or some other uh, uh, what, cosmo, uh, uh, what you call entity of cosmos is going to engulf this world or is it going to be a pralaya basically? Sir, uh, pralaya, I don't know. We will not be there to watch that. In our lifetime, no pralaya is going to happen. 
But the point is that uh, the way we, I mean, unless we wake up, the point is it is no more uh, some superstition or some prophecies and all that. The scientists are able to see through everything actually. The problem is that what scientists are seeing, uh, it has to be adopted by the industry and the politicians and the economic forces and make sure that it roll out. So science has to be given the due respect it needs. And uh, that is a uh, cultural problem, and I, I hope that uh, something good happens out of it, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So, uh, Himanshu ji and uh, Arun Tiwari, sir, uh, with your permission, uh, it's the time we would like to uh, wrap up the things uh, uh, by Ramesh Kalgatgi, what happened uh, today and uh, the total deliberations. And before that, uh, let me take this opportunity to thank all the uh, office bearers and uh, of uh, Karnataka Agri Professional Association and my colleagues at IMR who uh, created this platform to bring everyone on board to discuss uh, uh, individual aspect. In fact, we made effort to have who is who uh, who is working in this particular area to be part of this. So we have really gained, sir, in terms of the knowledge and also the actionable points that are going to come. And uh, let me take the names of uh, Dr. Ilangovan, uh, Masiddha, Ganpati, Dr. Bhatt, uh, Sugarna, and uh, Ramana, and our electrician. They all made things uh, quite smooth to have uh, hitch-free uh, a live web uh, webinar of the, this kind of uh, almost sir 1000 people registered and uh, so, 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 uh, some sessions had 3 to 400 people so on an average 150 to 200 each, each session we had uh, the people jo joining this particular uh, uh, webinar so if i have left any name uh, it's uh, unintentional so i thank each one of uh, you for joining and also my colleagues helping to put this show together. So uh, before that, uh, Ramesh sir, uh, over to you to wrap up. If people are comfortable, they yeah, can have a video on so that we can have some photos. Yeah, everybody can put, put your video on so that we can have a photo. Yeah, please have the video on. And it is what? Some... Okay. Yeah. Uh, so now, uh, Ramesh Kalgatki, what is that? Okay, okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tonopi, and uh, thanks to everybody. Uh, it has been over 21 hours now. Yesterday, 10 o'clock we began, now it is 6 o'clock. About 21 and a half hours of extravaganza, of intellectual extravaganza, I must say. And we had a very wide uh, uh, topics, diverse topics, and about 26 speakers uh, since yesterday. And the woman, only common uh, uh, point was climate change. A common concern by everybody was climate change and uh, where we are going to head in the coming days and coming years. Well, I believe uh, uh, in my own experiences, I have seen a number of times when even in a given district, there is a flood relief team visiting, there is a drought relief team visiting almost simultaneously. I have seen it in East Kothari, I have seen it in West Kothari, Krishna and other districts in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, most of the problems are human induced, particularly the floods that we get are human induced, the bad irrigation system that we have are uh, to be blamed. And uh, earlier uh, in my childhood, we were seeing only torrential rains and Deccan plateau. Now we are seeing cyclones. And we never heard of cyclones in the month of May and June. And uh, uh, cyclones are becoming a regular feature after the cyclone 1977, now almost every year we are having two, three cyclones uh, in the course of Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Odisha, and West Bengal. And uh, uh, so the entire life system, life forms are totally getting affected. Uh, 
vulnerability and a consequence of vulnerability on the human uh, existence activity increase in pollution increase in exploitation of resources resulting in climate change this is what we have been hearing since last uh, two days and reduced crop uh, diversity genetic diversity and shrinkage of the uh, genetic resources is a matter of concern that has been flagged in this workshop well some of the takeaways of the workshop are uh, we have heard about breeding for disease resistance drought resistance pest resistance but now a challenge is for climate change adaptation it's a very challenging uh, uh, subject for all the breeders to so breeding for climate change adaptation and uh, we heard from dr sananda and dr rajesh washne uh, about use of modern technology even dr patak also mentioned in the last session use of modern technology breeding techniques genome breeding gene gene editing and number of other initiatives that can really be an answer to the uh, initiative of climate change adaptation we had a session on climate carbon uh, marketing it was very interesting for me Uh, for a person who has worked in forestry and was always uh, thought about sequestration to talk about sequestration versus uh, emission reduction was very interesting topic very interesting topic and uh, uh, development of where vulnerable indices and the matrix for uh, Uh, climate change adaptation activities was interesting uh, in the panel discussion well the next step would be we will document all the presentations we will get a compilation of all the presentations already things are on the youtube but we will make a compendium of presentations and bring out a souvenir and uh, the way we have been dis discussing the topics there was an interesting discussion on farm ponds so all these uh, discussions in fact need an exclusive work workshop and uh, that will be a, an action plan or other way forward for future and in in all the stakeholders in these webinars we have had uh, participation by the academicians by industry people etc but the real stakeholders the farming community the farmers are what we should are whom we should involve and with that note Uh, I I I am of the opinion that in the in the coming webinars we should provide a platform for the participation of farmers also representatives of farmers at least the farm uh, various organizations and uh, that's the way forward and I thank uh, Dr. Tony and his entire team for really taking the initiative in uh, uh, structuring the seminar. I think uh, since December we have been working on this concept of the seminar. and now finally in the month of may we could actually have it and uh, with this few words now i'll request uh, narayan bhat to have a vote of thanks to put a vote of thanks thank you narayan bhat thank you yeah yeah thank you sir narayan uh -huh. before you do that i have forgot few names uh, our, i'll cover uh, i will cover my, sir. my colleagues who introduced the uh, Uh, Jinu Jacob, uh, I, Sri Vidya, Swarna, and all other people. I I will cover, sir. Okay. I took a name. I took a name. Okay. Uh, so uh, as uh, Ramesh Kalagatki sir told mentioned it, so a big uh, workshop which is around twenty one hours. We are all enjoyed. It is a, a feast for all the people who seek the knowledge. so my our cap on behalf of kapa and iamr and the entire symposium organizing team we would like to say thanks to uh, all eminent speakers who have taken time and efforts to present and all presentations uh, are exemplary and highly relevant to the, the topic mentioned and uh, big thanks to gubba group he is our uh, co sponsors for this program and uh, thanks to uh, iamr director and our uh, you know mentor and uh, tapa founder uh, founder president vilas tonpi uh, who thought over it and uh, designed this program and uh, you know a uh, very big thanks to vilas tonpi sir and ramesh uh, kalagatki sir who took the lead 
in uh, giving uh, such a good shape to the uh, seminar. And if I don't mention Sada and uh, our uh, Dr. C. L. L. Gouda, uh, it will be an uh, injustice. You know, they have taken uh, so much time, and uh, you know, uh, including Srinath Dixit, they have done a wonderful. Uh, they have given a you know a lot of time for shaping up, identifying the speakers, and uh, you know, uh, time slot everything. My big thanks to uh, uh, the team, uh, including. Uh, <coughs> Venkatesh Bhatt, Elangovan, who is the, you know, uh, sir, grateful to you, sir. Entire uh, two days, you are on the camera. And uh, then Venkatesh Bhatt, and I did a lot of correspondence. And, uh, you know, he he's the one who worked uh, more than 15 days uh, along with Elangovan. And then uh, uh, Amasiddhila, Ganapati, Sri Vidya, Jenu Jacob, Swarna, Malati, and all the reporters of IAMR. My uh, big thanks to our Kappa friends and Kappa members. Uh, through them, we could able to reach uh, through IAMR and Kappa friends. We could able to reach a, a big, uh, you know, audience. And uh, Dr. Kini and uh, Sushilendra Desai also contributed a lot for shaping the system. And my, uh, I, if I don't mention my, our uh, colleagues, and uh, colleagues in the sense, uh, Kappa friends and Kappa active people like in, who worked for the seminar, the Tippe Swami and uh, our uh, president, uh, Ramesh Kalagatki sir, our vice president, N.G. Ramachandra, our uh, uh, secretary Shashikant Kulkarni and uh, our treasurer, uh, you know, Sheshigiri, who is always active and uh, coordinated for all the meetings. And uh, more than a month or two months, he worked uh, tirelessly to give the shape, to, to organize a lot of meetings in, in between the meetings. And Santosh Joint Secretary and Mutali Kulisai. My big thanks to all the participants and once again, we look forward for uh, our, uh, the continued session uh, in the next year. Uh, Vilas ji and uh, Ramesh ji, we, we uh, request you people to take a lead and uh, you know continue the, the such seminars every year. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, Imashu, everybody. So all the speakers. Arun, Arun, thank, you, thank, Arun, you, thank you, thank you, Arun, thank you, Arun, thank you, thank you, Arun, thank you, yeah, thank you, thank so you, so thank, thank you, 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 thank you,